All right, all right, all right. Let's go, guys. Here's Petro, community manager at Geeko. Today I'm going to be a moderator for React.js Junior Track. And we already have a speaker at our lobby right now. This is fantastic, spectacular. Erin Doyle. She is full stack developer at Theory and Principle. Full stack developer with the focus on front end. She loves JavaScript, doing a lot of re React and Redux, and trying to write beautiful code. So, what I'm going to do right now is to invite her to the stream. And we're ready to roll. Erin, how do you feel? I'm feeling great, ready to do this. Yes, 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 yes. I have no words to describe my reaction right now because that's what. The only thing that I want to do is share your presentation and you rock, right? Alrighty, I should be sharing. Let's go. There it is. Yep. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and get started then. Sure. So I am Erin Doyle, and I'm going to be sharing some tips and tricks with you today about auditing React apps for accessibility. So real quick, who am I? I am a full stack senior developer at Ethereum Principle, and we do uh, custom design and development for the legal and justice space. I'm also an egghead instructor. So I've got a course that is on developing accessible web apps with React that I highly recommend you check out. I am also an open source contributor, so you can check out my profile on GitHub. And you can follow me on Twitter at Sunshiny Doyle. So real quick, just so we can all be on the same page, why is accessibility important? First and foremost, inclusion. So this infographic comes from the 2018 US Census. So it's a little old and it's only a small slice of our global population. But it gives us an example that there are millions of people using our websites that have a disability or difficulty of some sort. And many of these difficulties listed here make it especially hard for these people to use the web. And additionally, many people may not have a disability to begin with, but as we age, we develop these difficulties. In addition to that, we all at some point of time in our lives have temporary limitations or situational or environmental limitations. So for instance, say you've had an injury or a surgery, you've broken your arm, your hand, your wrist, um, or you've got a cat in the way and you can't get to your mouse and you're gonna be restricted to a keyboard. Perhaps you're sick or you're on medication that causes brain fogginess, making it really difficult um, to see the screen or to comprehend what you're looking at or to use fine motor movements using a mouse. Or perhaps you're in an environment, so uh, you're on a mobile device outside where screen glare makes it hard to see, or you're trying to watch a video someplace that's really loud and you can't hear the sound, or you need to be really quiet and you can't turn the volume on. So these are cases where any of us at any point in time in our lives may have some sort of difficulty that makes it hard for us to use the web. In addition to that, it's the law. At least in the United States, we have two major laws that require all websites to be accessible to those with disabilities. There are many other similar laws in other countries around the world. As a result of these laws, there are thousands of lawsuits in the US alone each year against companies whose websites have been found to be inaccessible. So it's serious, we need to pay attention to it. And uh, both of these laws in particular encourage using the WCAG or Web Content Accessibility Guidelines version 2.0 level AA as a guide on how to meet the regulations. So now that we know that accessibility is vitally important to everyone, uh, how do we get there? So auditing tools and automation. Now, you don't have to be an expert in accessibility in order to get started in making your apps more accessible. There are a number of things that you can add to your projects and your workflow today to start improving the accessibilities of your apps immediately. These tools will do a lot of the heavy lifting for you, making it very easy to identify issues before they go to production. Additionally, taking a test-driven approach to accessibility can really help you incrementally learn more about potential issues and how to resolve them. Most of these tools that I'm going to talk about provide information and educational resources along with any of the findings or error findings that can help you learn more about the issue, what groups are impacted by it, 
how severely they're impacted, and how you can possibly go about fixing the issue. So keep in mind, automated tools can only catch a percentage of potential accessibility issues. Manual testing using the assistive technology devices and strategies used by our users is still crucial in identifying all accessibility issues or usability problems in your app. But using tools and automating what we can will give us a big boost. So if we all used these tools and fixed just what they identified alone, the web would be massively more accessible to our users. So there's no reason not to do it. So let's jump in. Starting with linting, there is a plugin for ESLint that will run a static analysis check for any potential accessibility issues in your code. If you're already running ESLint on your code, and you probably should be, this is a really easy way to start checking your code for accessibility issues. So to install, um, if you haven't installed ESLint already, you'll, you'll include that and you'll include the plugin and save those to your development dependencies. You'll configure the plugin in your either ESLint RC, ESLint RC.json, or the ESLint config property in your package.json, wherever it is that you have ESLint configured. So to enable it, you'll add the plugin um, by adding JSX-A11Y to the plugins array. You can then either set specific rules from the supported rule set in the rules object, or you can enable all of the recommended rules at once by adding it to the extends array. And then if you wanna use the strict rule set instead, you would just replace recommended there with strict. So to run a slip for the command line, you can just add a script to your package.json file. And then from your terminal, you would run that command. So looking at the results, it lists all the files in which potential accessibility issues were detected. Under each file, it lists the specific errors in that file. And next to each error is the name of the rule that was violated. Another really cool benefit of using linting to check for accessibility issues is that most IDEs today have integrations with ESLint and can automatically show you any findings right in line with your code. This allows you to catch any potential errors immediately as you're writing the code. And then if you hover over the errant code, it'll show you exactly what the finding is. So if you take one of the errors that have been reported and look up the rule that was violated, you can get more information about it. The GitHub repo for the plugin has documentation on all of the rules it supports. So in the example I just showed you, I had files that were violating the label has associated control rule. If we look up that rule, we can see that for each rule in the, in the documentation, the, it details what the passive fail criteria is, so you can understand how the rule works, suggestions on how to resolve the issue, and links to the WCAG guidelines that are specifically violated by this issue. From there, you can learn more about how this specific issue impacts the accessibility for users. So now moving on to runtime tools. React Acts is an analysis tool for auditing your app for accessibility issues at runtime. And then any findings are output to the Chrome DevTools console. React Acts layers really nicely with the ESLint plugin in that the plugin for ESLint can only audit the static code, but React Acts looks at the rendered DOM. It can analyze the resulting DOM constantly as components are mounted, unmounted, and state changes. It can test for things like color contrast by being able to analyze the current foreground and background colors during all states of an element. You install it as a development dependency, just like the ESLint plugin. And to enable the tool, you'll need to initialize it early on in the code that starts up your app before the call to render the root of the app. You want to conditionally require React Acts so that it's only running in non-production environments as there is a bit of a performance impact when it runs. To initialize it, you'll just pass the imported acts function, the React and React DOM objects. And the third argument is the timing delay in milliseconds that React acts will wait to start analysis after detecting a component change. So once installed and enabled, React acts will run just as your app runs and outputs any findings to the DevTools console. This is the same page component that I showed the ESLint plugin had reported findings on. But you can see here that React Acts is able to report even more findings of that same code now that it has the context of the entire DOM and its current state. Looking at what React Acts outputs, 
It lists all found issues in order of severity of the impact to accessibility that the problem represents. And if you expand one of the findings, it shows you the errant source code. If you hover over the element listing here, it will highlight the element on the page, show you where it's at. And it will list more details about the problem. Finally, if you click on the link listed with the finding, just like the ESLint plugin repo, here you can go get more information about the issue. Listed here are examples of how to resolve the issue and make the element in question accessible. There is a section showing how severely accessibility is impacted for users, which specific disabilities are impacted, and which WCAG and Section 508 guidelines are violated. And then there's further detail explaining in what ways accessibility is impacted by this issue, which is really helpful in further understanding exactly how our code can impact people's ability to use our applications. Finally, there is a list of resources to learn even more through DQ University if desired. So let's talk about component libraries. Building a component library is a great way to gain efficiencies in creating accessible React apps. You can consolidate all of your UI widget components in one place. And by UI widget, I mean our basic building block UI elements, things such as form elements, uh, text inputs, radio buttons, checkboxes, text areas, selects, um, interactive elements like buttons, links, tabs, nav bars, and then finally, maybe more complex things such as dialogues, modals, menus, number steppers, accordions, carousels, and the list goes on. While of course there are still accessibility considerations once these building blocks are composed on a page, but the large bulk of potential accessibility problems lie in how these widgets are individually coded. So if you can write each of these widgets with accessibility in mind, then you now have a library of reusable components with accessibility baked in. You don't need to solve the same problems over and over again for each app you build. So the amount of issues you'll run into will be massively reduced. Storybook is a super useful tool for building a React component library. It provides a UI where you can browse the components in your library. And while doing so, you can view each component in isolation and interactively test the component by being able to change the props that are passed into it and see how it behaves well before having to integrate it into an app. By being able to develop components in isolation outside the context of an app allows you to focus on building a component that can be reusable in various apps and testing various use cases ahead of time without having to worry about application specific dependencies. So that when it's time to drop the component into your app, it's already been tested on its own. So Storybook has a CLI making installation really simple. You'll run the init command of the Storybook CLI using MPX inside an existing project's root directory. So a project you've already started and you're just gonna add this in. The command when you run it will install any required dependencies, set up the necessary scripts to run and build Storybook, add a default configuration, and add some boilerplate stories to get you started. Once that's done, you simply run npm run Storybook with um, and then uh, that'll start up a development server hosting your Storybook UI. So as I stated before, Storybook gives you the ability to test changing the props that get passed into a component, and then you can see how the state changes based on those values. And you can do that here in the controls panel for the component. Storybook also provides the ability to test your component using different viewport sizes. and against different background colors. So here's where Storybook gets even more powerful. It supports a plugin system it calls add-ons. Most notably, there is an add-on for auditing the accessibility of components. So once it's installed and configured, it can audit a component for accessibility issues and display them in a panel. The add-on uses the same rules engine that React Axe uses called Axe Core. Here it shows you any violations, what rules were violated, a link to more information, and what WCAG and Section 508 guidelines were violated. So now let's talk about unit testing. We can also add accessibility testing to our unit tests. And that gives us an easy way to automate accessibility auditing. And we've got the flexibility to audit at any level of our code. We can go as low as an element or as high as a component representing an entire page of our app. 
this gives us a really great safety net for any regressions. So for all the reasons we normally write unit tests, we can apply that to accessibility as well. Just Ax is a plugin to Jest that also uses the Ax Core rules engine. That's the same rules engine we've already talked about used by React Ax in the Storybook Accessibility plugin. If you're noticing a theme, in my opinion, the Ax Core rules engine is the most trusted source for accessibility auditing at this time. So these tools that are built on top of it share a really thorough, dependable, and consistent foundation for accessibility auditing. Uh, if you're already using Jest for unit testing in your project, then all you'll need to do is install Jest Ax to your development dependencies. Otherwise, you'll need to install Jest, and uh, you'll want to see the Jest docs for more detail on getting that configured. But assuming you're already running Jest, let's talk about how to add in Jest Ax. So you can use Jest Ax with whatever rendering library you wish, as long as you pass the Ax function, the HTML you wish to test. So here's an example using React DOM to render the component. Here in this test, we are rendering a component representing a login page. Now this is the same login page we've already seen in some examples from uh, the ESLint plugin and React Ax earlier. We are creating a div and then calling React DOM to render the component we want to test into that div. Then we pass the div element, which now contains our login page component as rendered HTML to the Axe function. Finally, we call expect on the results with the matcher that Just Axe provides us to have no violations. If a violation is found, then the test will fail and the violation will be output to the console. You can also use Enzyme for rendering the component you wish to test. Here we use Enzyme's mount function to render our component. Then we pass the result of Enzyme's get DOM node function to ax, because remember we need to pass ax HTML. Then the last step is the same no matter what rendering framework we use. We just test that the result from ax has no violations. And finally, you can use React Testing Library. Here we're using React Testing Library's render function to render the component and destructuring the returned object to get the container. Then we can pass the container to the axe function and once again expect that there are no violations. So here's what that output would look like for the test that we just saw the examples of. If a component being tested has a violation, just will output that the test failed. Just axe adds to the output for the failed test the HTML element where the violation occurred, what the violation was, a list of suggestions for fixing the issue, and finally, a link to more information about the rule that was violated. So now let's talk about end-to-end -end testing. While a tool like React Ax can audit a page for accessibility at runtime, you have to be there manually testing your app to trigger the auditing and watching the DevTools console for findings as you go. This is great while you're developing, but it gets tedious as a method for repeatedly testing entire pages of your app at a time. Using end-to-end -end testing gives us the ability to automate the auditing of our rendered pages. With end-to-end -end testing, you can program interactions with the UI to fully exercise all possible states of your page's UI widgets and uncover any accessibility issues on the page. Just like with unit testing, this provides a great way to build a safety net to catch any regressions as you continue to develop. For end-to-end -end testing, we have some options. Most notably, we can use the AxCore rules engine with both Selenium WebDriver and Cypress. So starting with Selenium WebDriver, there's a library available, Ax WebDriver.js, that provides WebDriver the ability to analyze the current page for accessibility issues. So you'll start by installing Selenium WebDriver, if you haven't already, and uh, see the link listed here for further details on setting up WebDriver and links to download any browser drivers you may need. Then install the library Ax WebDriver.js to your development dependencies. So Selenium WebDriver is run via script, and here is a really simple example test script. We only need to require Selenium WebDriver and the Ax WebDriver.js library. We build a WebDriver instance for Chrome in this example. Then we navigate to the page we want to test. In this case, it's that same old login page that we've used for a number of the other tools we've looked at so far. Once the page is loaded, 
we call the Axe Builder we imported from the Axe WebDriver JS library. It requires we pass it the WebDriver instance, which we created initially. Then we can finally call the Analyze function, which will audit the current page against the Axe Core rule set and pass the results as the second argument to a provided callback function. All we're doing in this callback function is logging the results object so we can see what it looks like. So to run the test script, we need to run it with Node. And if you noticed in the previous slide, for this example, my script was named e2e-test.js. So that's the file we're running here with Node. Once the script starts, it will automatically open a window of the browser that we had specified in the test script. So, and then it'll navigate to the URL the script specified. After Axe WebDriver JS's analyze function is finished and returns its results, it passes them to the callback. And so the results object will be logged to the console as we specify in the test script. The first property we see in the results object is inapplicable items. These are all the rules that were found not to apply to the current page. There will likely be a lot of these. So keep scrolling and eventually you get to the incomplete items, which presumably would include any rules whose checks weren't able to be completed. And then there is a passes property listing all the rules that did apply to the page and passed. Then further down, you'll get to the details of the test engine, test environment, test runner, timestamp, tool options, and the URL being tested. And then finally is the violations property containing any rules that the page violated. Each violation lists the description and detail about the rule, a URL where more information is available, the ID of the rule, how severe the violation impacts accessibility, references to the nodes and tags that violate the rule. But uh, since these results are just being output using console.log, we only see array rather than a more useful representation of the value. But one can certainly customize how the results are reported using this results object to be more tailored to whatever your needs are. So now let's talk about Cypress. Cypress Axe is a package that adds commands to Cypress for testing the pages of your application for accessibility issues, once again, using the Axe Core Rules Engine. So you'll start by installing Cypress if you haven't already, and then the Cypress Axe package, both to your development dependencies. If this is your first time setting up Cypress, you'll wanna add a command to open the Cypress app to your NPM scripts. Once you run that command, the Cypress app will automatically open in a browser window. And upon running the first time, it will install some directory scaffolding with some example files into your project. To continue setting up Cypress Axe, you'll need to open up the index.js file located in the Cypress support directory. You're gonna to wanna to add to it an import of Cypress Axe. Now this makes the additional commands provided by Cypress Axe available to Cypress. So now we can look at an example test. First, we'll call the command to visit the page we wanna test. Once again, my login page. That should be followed immediately by the command to inject Axe. This injects the Axe Core runtime into the page so it will be available to use for the auditing. Then we proceed to check the page for accessibility issues by calling the check A11Y command. To run the tests, you will go to the Cypress app and find the link for the test you wish to run. Here's the test we just looked at in the previous slide, login.spec.js. If you click on the link for the test, it will open a new window in the selected browser. Shown on the right will be the page under test and shown on the left are the test results. Here you can see there were five accessibility violations detected and uh, each of them is listed. By clicking on one of the accessibility errors, it will highlight the elements on the page that contain that specific error. And additionally, it will log to the dev console more details about the error. So if we open up the DevTools console, we do indeed see more details logged about the error. Because Cypress Axe is using Axe Core, just like the Axe WebDriver JS library, um, you'll notice that all the data points listed here are the same. So really this gives us the flexibility to choose which end-to-end -end testing framework we prefer to work with without being restricted by our ability to test for accessibility because both of them will give us the same results, which is pretty great. So now let's talk about continuous integration. This is really where a lot of these tools become the most powerful in helping us efficiently achieve and maintain the accessibility of our applications. 
We want to employ these tools I've covered so far all along the way as we're developing so that our code is accessible from the start. But continuous integration is where we can really implement that safety net to ensure that our application remains accessible. With every code change we make, we introduce the potential to break accessibility. The bigger our team is, or the more rapidly we develop, the easier for a code change to slip through that net. So employing some form of, of accessibility auditing in our continuous integration system can go a long way with helping that. Additionally, it can be used as a gate to prevent code changes that break accessibility from being able to be merged. Let me be clear again, as I stated at the very beginning, automated auditing tools will only catch a percentage of potential accessibility issues. It's no replacement for manual testing, which we do need to do fairly regularly. But being able to automate the auditing will still give us an immense benefit and provide an early warning system that can be run much more frequently than it's practical to perform manual testing. So out of the box with a continuous integration system of your choice, you have the ability to add any or all of the following to your pipeline. Linting using the ASLint plugin, unit testing using just Axe, or running end-to-end -end tests either using Selenium WebDriver or Cypress. So I'm gonna show a quick example of how to run these tools with one of the CI systems. To keep things brief, I'm not gonna show all of them, but the concepts are the same, so you should be able to recreate in whatever your CI system of choice is. So this example I'm gonna show in a GitHub action. This is a YAML file stored at .github slash workflows at the root of my project. This workflow will be triggered when any pushes or PRs are made to the master branch. And I've separated the workflow out into two jobs, which will run in parallel. There's the lint job, which will run the lint npm script I defined in my package.json file. This runs eslint, which will include the eslint um, JSX A11Y plugin, since I have that installed and configured in my eslint config. And the second job is the unit test job. This will run the test only npm script I've defined in my package.json file. This runs jest which will auto-detect my just test files and run the tests I've written using just ax. The reason I have these broken up into two separate jobs is that I wanna see any failures separately for each. If these tasks were run linearly, then if one fails, the job will exit before executing the following job. But I wanna know if I have failures in both tasks rather than having to fix all failures in one and push changes before I can learn about whether I have failures in the next task. So here's what the results look like when this workflow runs on um, the project that we've been testing all throughout this presentation. So it shows that both the lint and unit test running jobs failed as I expected them to. If we click on the failed running a slint job, we see the output from the npm run lint script, which matches what we saw when I demonstrated using the eslint plugin earlier. If we click on the failed run a unit test job, we see the output from the npm run test only script, which matches what we saw when I demonstrated using just ax earlier. So the point is, we can see how we're able to produce the same exact results we would get if we were running these tools locally, but we can offload that to our CI system to automate them for us. In addition to what you can do out of the box with your CI system of choice, there are plugins available for each of the major CI systems that we can leverage. So far, just about all of the tools we've talked about have been built upon the Axe Core Rules Engine. But in the CI space, there are some other players. Most notably at this time are Lighthouse and Pally. Pretty much any of the CI tool systems can be set up to run either of these tools. You've probably heard of Lighthouse before, as it comes bundled with Chrome Dev tools for performing a number of audits, such as performance, SEO, best practices, as well as accessibility. Well, it's also available here to use as either a CLI or CI tool. And once again, Axe shows up as Lighthouse uses Axe Core under the covers. Now, Pally is also a set of CLI and CI tools that can perform accessibility audits on a provided URL or file. It allows you to specify the test runner to use, and at this time comes with the options to use either HTML code sniffer or Axe Core. I'll show you some examples from each of the top CI systems, but this list is not exhaustive and there are more plugins coming out all the time. So I urge you to do some research about what's out there for your system of choice. 
So the first thing we need to set up the Lighthouse CI uh, in the package.json for your project, you'll want to add a script to serve the production build of your app. I chose to use the serve package, but you can use whatever you want. Just make sure you've npm or yarn installed it as well. And then you're going to need to add a script named serve colon LHCI. It needs to be named that specifically. This is used by the Lighthouse CI to detect what it should run to start your server. And um, there are also options for letting Lighthouse serve static files in its own development server. Um, so you can do whatever works best to um, fit your needs. Next, you'll need to create a file in the root of your project named lighthouserc.json. There are extensive options for configuring Lighthouse CI, but this was just the minimum needed to get up and running. So I encourage you to check their docs for more options. So the URL property takes an array of URLs I want Lighthouse to audit. Here, I've just specified my login page, which we've been testing all along. Note it's at localhost, and the port is specifically 5000, because that's what my server is going to host it at. Make sure you set the port to whatever your server will be using. The next property here I've got is single page application set to true, because it is. And we've got a settings property here where I've specified that I only want Lighthouse to audit for accessibility issues. Because Lighthouse performs many categories of audits, I've added this just to restrict the results to the accessibility issues. So if you want to run Lighthouse with GitHub Actions, for instance, it's going to be very similar to the, um, to the workflow I just showed you. You'll need to create, again, a YAML file in that GitHub workflow directory at the root of your project. Again, this workflow is triggered on push and PRs of the master branch. The workflow will do a checkout of the repo, set up node, and then install the Lighthouse Continuous Integration CLI. Then it will build the project. And finally, it runs Lighthouse. And it's going to use the configuration we defined in that lighthousercjson file in our project. We could also pass flags into the LHCI auto run command in place of using the JSON config file, or you can do both. See, you can see here where I'm passing in the upload.target flag. If we want to use Lighthouse with Travis, it's pretty similar to the GitHub action. You'll create a YAML file named .travis.yaml at the root of your project. There is a before install step to install the Lighthouse continuous integration CLI. And then just let the GitHub action will run the build of our app and then run Lighthouse. Then for Circle CI, again, the setup is not terribly different. You'll place a YAML file named config.yaml in a .circleci directory at the root of your project. And the necessarily necessary steps are exactly the same. We're gonna check out the repo, install NPM dependencies, build the app, install Lighthouse, and run Lighthouse. So it's really cool if you're using GitHub and you integrate your CI system with your repos there, there is a nice way to see the Lighthouse results um, in a much more readable and um, visual format than what you'd see just looking at the CI build log. So there's an official Lighthouse CI GitHub app that you'll need to install. Once you've got it installed and wired up with your CI system, you should start to see status checks for Lighthouse on your PRs and or commits, whichever you have your CI tool triggered by. A status check will show up for each URL you specified for Lighthouse to audit, as well as the overall rating for that URL. Since I only specified for Lighthouse to audit my login page, we only have one status check here. And um, then if you click on that details link by the status check, it will open up the Lighthouse report for that URL. It's pretty nice. If you are using Jenkins as your CI tool choice, don't feel left out. It also has the ability to use Lighthouse. Sorry, guys. Let me jump real quick. Uh, Aaron, that's fantastic. We got two minutes left before our next speaker. So I propose to finish this speech, and then we we'll meet once again on Q&A session. So we have respect for everyone. And sure. I can do a real quick wrap it up if you if you give me a couple more minutes. Sure, just go with the flow. Okay, thanks. Thanks. All right, so moving through Jenkins setup. 
Um, you'll definitely want to check this out. There's a really cool option to set up a Lighthouse CI server that gives you the ability to have historical Lighthouse reports. You can check diffs, you can do charts and graphs. Very cool. Um, there's also the Pally CI. Um, you know, there's some steps to configure it, but they're pretty straightforward. And then we've got, you know, examples in all those same CI tools. It's all very similar, what you need to do. Travis Circle CI, I'll point out, has a Pally CI orb you can use right here. And this is what the results look like if you're using Pally. Um, you know, very similar. You're going to see a list of the errors found, details about what was wrong with each, and the specific element found with the error. Uh, also want to point out that Netlify has its own plugin for using Pally. And uh, you'll just need to check the docs on how to get that installed specifically for Netlify build. There's some configuration involved. And here's an example of the results there. So if, um, if you're using Pally with Netlify and you've got it set to error, it will fail your build or you can set it to warn and it'll just um, post warnings. And same thing here, you're gonna see the list of accessibility issues found, description of each error and the element that contains the error. So that wraps up all of the really cool tools I wanted to share with you today. Um, I'll end here with a list of resource links to all the tools I talked about so you can go check them out and add them to your dev workflow. You can get to these links where I posted the slides at erindoyle.dev slash talks, and there will be a link to the React Global Summit 2020. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you, too. I mean, guys, it's blown my mind. I don't get how you uh, get that information and you still code and you apply that information in real life. That's crazy. I'm super, super pumped about this con conference because I'm learning so many new things and I hope you guys in chat, all the viewers all around the world feeling the same. Thank you very much, Erin. Thank that you. That was impressive, very confident, very convincing and uh, hope to see you on Q&A session. And I will see, definitely. All right, looking forward to it. Nice. Okay. And now we're going to have our next speaker. Are you ready, guys, for our next speaker? Siddharth Shetrapal, Design Systems. When is it too early? Design System for Small Teams. I'm ending up my man's seat. How do you feel, sir? I feel good. How about you? How's it going? It's going pretty well. Uh, super pumped. Because, guys, we have, a, okay, let me be honest with you. We have a private chat with our speakers. And we just exchange some messages back and forth because we need to make sure everything runs smooth. And pump up is the word of the, of the night. See, so you're going to share the presentation and as usual, go with the flow. Cool. I'm adding it to stream. All right. All right, then. Go ahead, sir. I'm start a quick timer over here. Although I don't think I'll go over sure. time. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Sid. Uh, thanks for introducing me. And for this talk, I, it, it's kind of a story. So I need you to take, I need to take you back to 2017. Uh, in 2017, I just joined the, like we started the design system team at Auth0 with me and one designer, Fernando. And we built a bunch of things. We built like design tokens and design assets, component libraries, there, there's a bunch we did. Um, and then the company was big at the time. Uh, it was, I mean, it's even bigger now, but it was like roughly 400 people back then. And since it started, uh, we kind of like figured out where to put the design system team. And in Auth0, the design system team was in like the design org of it. And that's really interesting because <laughs> we were kind of sitting next to the visual designers, product designers, illustrators, instead of sitting with like the front end folks. And it's interesting because, uh, we did a bunch of like being in the design team, 
we did a bunch of like post-it notes. Sometimes we wore hats while doing post-it notes. Uh, I, I'm not a designer, I'm a developer, but I spent a lot of time in the design team. And you know, I had a lot of fun, I learned a lot. Uh, but we kind of have to talk about what does it mean to build a design system? And it depends on like each company. Uh, I love this definition from Kari Saranen, who said, a design system is a set of multidisciplinary, shared, integrated principles and patterns that define the overall design of the product. Let's, that's a long one, so let's break it down. Uh, what is a design system? It's a set of principles and patterns. So by principles, we write rules and guidelines about colors, what's the tone of the brand, and even down to things like what's the spacing strategy. And patterns are things like your repeatable, reusable blocks. So this could be your CSS library, this could be your Figma asset folder, this could be like a sketch library, it could be React components, all of that are like repeatable patterns. And it only becomes like, you can only like qualify it to be a design system if these are shared and integrated. So shared between designers, developers, product managers, like everyone in the company has the same principles and patterns that they consume. And it's integrated into their workflow. So, you know, the processes and the tools people use every day. So if your designers use Sketch or Framer, Figma, whatever, it's it's available there, but also your can use sorry, marketing. What's the tone? What's the voice of the brand? What colors to use? So it's in everybody's flow. And the goal of this, of course, is to define and improve the overall design of the product. That's kind of the uh, overarching goal of building a design system. So what did it mean for us to build a design system? Like just to remind you, we're sitting in the uh, design org. So we built a lot of design assets and uh, like we use Sketch at the time to sketch libraries, but we were also shipping code for the front end developers to use. So imagine this, like should designers code and then like that whole debate around that. And this was like, should the design team build our React components for us and then give it? So there was a lot to, lot to, you know, lot of confidence building that we had to do. Uh, this is an example. This is one of the more interesting uh, components that we build. So it's a page header, and it, if you look at it, it has a very mechanical React API. So you declare the page header with JSX, you give it the title description, and then it takes two actions. This is the interesting part. So when you're writing this API, you don't really know what would it do visually. All you know is like, this is what I want to tell the user. This is the information. And these are the two actions related to it. And this is what it renders. And if you look at it carefully, there are like a few obvious decisions that have already been made for you. So for example, there's like the uh, clients, like the title appears on the left, the buttons on the right, and the description is below it. You can't really tell that when you look at the mechanical API, but then there are more things. It's like, is the, the clients that you see, is that an H1 tag or an H2 tag, right? So that's important semantics. And then the buttons, which one comes first? Does the primary come first, secondary come first? What's the gap between the two buttons? What's the gap between the first row and description? When a screen reader tries to read this, you know, for accessibility, should it read the buttons first? I, I imagine it would read the title first, but then second, should it go to the buttons or should it go to the description? Uh, all of these decisions are kind of baked into this. So, which kind of means like we encourage the developers of the application to think about their users. And then we offloaded a lot of the design and uh, quality decisions. Like, is this like how to make this responsive? How to make this accessible? What are the uh, actions here? All of that was baked in into the component. And uh, this, all of this like was kind of inspired from this uh, post that Brad Frost wrote. He, he wrote up, I, I have a link in the end of the slides to all of the articles I mentioned. But he kind of mentioned the concept of the front of the front end and back of the front end. So in this part of the article, he hinted that the, the front end ecosystem itself is too big for any one person to kind of understand all of it, or at least like be an expert of all of it. So you have folks that need to do the styling and accessibility piece, the right semantics. And then on the other spectrum, on the other spectrum, you have folks that are looking at what's the best way to load you know, fetch 
just the right amount of data with something like GraphQL, and then thinking about what, how do we make this type safe? So there's a big spectrum, and then he kind of said that it it makes sense to think of our front end as front of the front end and back of the front end, and it, it really helped us because I spent a lot of time on the front of the front end, and which meant that we really nailed down some of the details, like pixel perfect, responsive, accessible. A good API, but we were able to just completely ignore parts like how does state get handled or how do you even fetch the description for the page header I showed. All of that was the application developer's responsibility. So <clears throat> that's like part one of the story. And then in 2019, you know, when the world was shining and you know, before 2020, uh, I moved to this different company called Code Sandbox. And Code Sandbox is now 11 employees. Uh, and that's a very different company. So from 400 something to 11. And what I saw is that even with 11 people, we kind of had the same problems where uh, the two pages of the application look like they're built by two different people. There's no strong brand. And uh, there's inconsistency. You know, you fix a bug in one part of the code base, it doesn't communicate to the second part. <clears throat> so, so we realized that a lot of the problems that we were seeing were the exact problems that I was trying to solve with design systems at a bigger company. So we had the same problems. And I'm very aware, like, you know, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So because I worked on design systems, I thought all, all of these problems should then be solved design systems. And in an eleven-member company, I you like obviously can't justify creating a design system team, let alone me being able to justify spending all my time working on design system. Like I contribute to the uh, product part of it quite a bit. So then I then I started thinking about okay, let's go back to the definition. It's like what I said earlier was that it's a set of tools that can be shared by the team and it's integrated in the process. So what if I, what if instead of looking like a hammer? I start looking at it like a uh, like Swiss army knife. And uh, so then I noted down, what are all the tiny parts in the Swiss army knife? And there's like a bunch of things, like uh, just to mention a few, we had design tokens, we had some CSS classes, React components, a lot of documentations, usage guidelines. But then there were also things like release scripts and code mods and theming support and you know the icon workflow. So there's a bunch of fairy things across the board. Uh, by the way, I thought like uh, it'd be really cool if in this talk, like I flipped the real Swiss Army knife. So I went on Amazon. It's like seventy four dollars. So I was like, yeah, that's the. <laughs> I'm not doing that for a gimmick, uh, but it does come in dark mode. So if you're, you know, that's kind of cool. Uh, but this, this is what I found in that hunt. It's like they're also like tinier Swiss Army knives, right? Like just, just two things in the same format, and it's like a lot cheaper. And it's like that's a great analogy for what it might look like to have one of those Swiss Army knives in a small team. Like you just have a few tools, you don't have the whole thing because you probably don't need the whole thing yet and you can keep adding them later. So that's that's kind of the rest of this talk, which is tiny design systems for tiny teams. And what does that tiny Swiss Army knife look like? So um, I stole five things. Basically I stole five things from the big company design system world. And these are the five things. The first one is constraint-based design. So the concept of constraint-based design is that instead of choosing from like all the infinite possibilities, when you're designing something, you pick from a predefined set of things, uh, which, which is the constraint that you add. So you can do this with typography. For example, these are our scales. So you have, you see there's like 10 pixel, 12 pixel, 13, 16, 19, 23, 28. There's like skip. and just these seven or eight that we have uh, give us a good enough set that we can depict our entire UI. And then, you know, when you're at 16 pixel and you think this is, I want something smaller, you go to 13. There's no hit and try, there's not much thinking. And all of these are on like a mathematical scale. So they all, they're supposed to aesthetically look good. All of that is taken care of. And uh, the good thing is like all of our tools understand this. So in Figma, you can actually add these as uh, variables. They call them variables or they call them tokens, I forgot, but you can add them and then you see them on the right hand side. Uh, similarly, you can do the same with colors. So you can have, these are our, all our grays and some of our blues. And then on the right, you'll see these are all of our colors laid out in our uh, color styles. <coughs> 
now this is this is where it gets interesting where after you define all your like variables like these are all the hex codes like you see these are all like we just call them gray 100 200 300 uh, as long as there is there is a scale the numbers are not that interesting but the second layer of these tokens is where it's interesting like you have variables and then you have decisions sitting on top of them sitting on top so for example this first token i call text body and because we're like a dark app uh, we use white text for enough contrast and uh, so that style is called text body and this is a new variable which is just an alias to i think like gray 100 and then we have a text subtle which is another decision token uh, and that is an alias to the the grayest we could get while still keeping it accessible and then you have link and destructive which are map which are aliases for some blue or some red i don't even know but like once you configure them you don't really need to remember what it is so now like when you get into designing like features and stuff so this is one of the screens from code sandbox and you can see like even in figma uh, when you're designing something you can say give it the color of this one has text body and i can try to change it and then you know you see all of the font sizes that we have so we name them as body 1 2 3 4 um, and then you know when you go from 3 to you want a little bigger you go to 4 and it's already configured same thing for color. So you see the two color things are different color. The second one is called text subtle. And this is what like our designer is working with, right? So he's not working with hex codes. He's working with, I say he, because like Danny is our one designer in the team. Uh, Danny is working with this code. So when he wants that, he goes with text body, text subtle, text link. Uh, and the same stretches out for spacing. So we use the four point grid, which means all of our margins and paddings are on the four scale. So there's like, it's a multiple of four. So you have zero, four, eight, six, 12, 16, blah, blah. And what's interesting is that Figma doesn't have uh, tokens for space like it does for font and color. So it's I find it really funny that Danny actually has these tiny squares that he keeps on the left of his uh, prototype so that he can put things and map them out. So. I showed you, you can do this with typography, colors, and space, but it, you can really do it with anything. So for example, border radius, this is what a border radius looks like. So we call them small, medium, large. Uh, it doesn't really matter what you call them as long as you call it the same thing in your design assets and in the code. Uh, and this is this is kind of the goal. This is a conversation you're trying to avoid. Like this never happens in the team where it's like, hey, I ask like this, Daniel, like what's the color of the error state? And then he's like, oh yeah, let me check it up. And he's like, okay, this is the hex code. And I'm like, cool, I'm going to copy paste it in my CSS. By the way, interesting to note that Slack actually renders the hex code with like a little square because that's how far we are with this. It's like our chat app understands hex code. Like that's that has to sound a little weird to you, right? Um, now, how do you represent these colors in code? So there are multiple ways of doing it. You can do it with CSS variables or SAS or less, or you can do it with JavaScript if you're using React, if you're using CSS and JS with React. Really up to you. There's no there's no real uh, pro and con on the surface of it for tokens. Uh, we choose the left approach with JavaScript objects because that's just like a bunch of our code is in JavaScript. And uh, these are what our colors look like. So what's interesting to note is that we have a bunch of grays. Like you almost have the full spectrum. We have a few blues and there are gaps in between. Like there's 300, 500, there's no 400 because we're not sure we might need one more. So we're just keeping that gap for us. Uh, there's red and then green, purple, yellow, orange is just one because those aren't very prominent in our app. So this is still the variable layer. And you do the same thing with all of this. So we have font sizes, space, even transition speeds, like animations, we speed them, uh, we put them in these tokens. We have our radius, our shadows, our breakpoints. And this uh, JavaScript object spec is based on system UI. So if you want to look at the spec, if you want just like a common thing to follow instead of reinventing it, uh, systemui.com is a good resource. And so after you've defined the variables, this is where the decision layer comes in. And because we're using JavaScript objects, our uh, alias is just like referencing the thing. So we can extend this. I can say tokens.colors.text and add another object and say, this is my body color. So remember text body color is just alias to gray 100. 
and I'm literally just referencing the JavaScript variable because it's all it's all objects. Uh, so I have link, which is blue 600, and text destructive or text danger, which is red 500. Cool. So after we've defined our tokens for constraints, the second the second thing I stole from Big Design System World is really good primitives. Uh, let me show you how. So you want your tokens to convert to components, and with React components, we kind of really have like a good, uh, what do you say, like a good box already. It's like a very good model for this. So let's focus on like this is what Code Sandbox looks like. So let's focus on just the left sidebar. Uh, and if you had to recreate this, I can use my text component. Text is like a primitive for which just renders a span. And uh, I put the title and the description. And on the left, you see what's in Figma, the, what I want to achieve. On the top right, you see code top bottom is how it renders without any stats. So when I put two text layers, it just renders below each other. Uh, and then I actually can go in Figma, check what's the what's the font size that my designer was thinking about. And I can see the font size is body three, and the color is a uh, text body. So I can go ahead and in my text primitive, I can say size three. Now this is the this is the main part where whatever it's called in your design tool is exactly what it's called in the in in my React components with props. So when I say body three, I know the text size is the third one, and that's why it's called text size three because I want the same exact. And uh, the the color for the second one is text subtle, so I can say variant is subtle. I could have also called it color is equal to subtle. There's preference, maybe color is equal to subtle was actually better. And then you see like the UI is really coming around, but there's like a gap here. So you see on the left, there's an eight, eight pixels gap. Now eight is on my scale of four points, uh, which is two into four is eight. And then we have like a stack primitive. So a stack primitive is just like a glorified flex box and it understands direction. So flex column or flex row. And when you say stack direction is vertical, you're stacking them one below each other. And when you say gap two, it applies the margin between the children, right? So now you can actually do this with flex gap. I don't, I'm not sure how good the support is, but when we started, it was pretty new. So we actually do this by margins. So there's a margin on the first text, which puts it down. And now you see like, it's kind of looking very close. And this is how far you can get with primitives. I didn't really write any CSS or I didn't really, uh, you know, make any style decisions here. All I'm doing is like referencing my constraints that are already defined. Uh, let me give you another example to just like nail down the point. So on the left, you see there is this stats component. And then we show a few stats, but it's made up of a bunch of things. And you see the spacing, the size of the icon. There's a few few decisions here. So to build, oops. So to build this component, uh, what you'd end up doing is like, I'm looking at what the size is. It's text subtle body three, which means I need a text size three, variant subtle. And I get that first one in. Now I need an icon. And I know the icon is also subtle. Now, when I put the icon, uh, what we do is all of our icon use current color, like the SVG fill is current color, which means if you wrap it in a text and make the text subtle, then the icon will also get the same fill because current color just takes whatever is the whatever it's wrapped in, like the container's color. And then I stack, I put this in a horizontal stack. So stack is horizontal by default. And to see like what's the gap in between, it's four pixels, which is one unit. So I just say gap is one unit. And I copy this because there's a bunch of things, wrap all of that in a stack. And then I need to see what's the gap between two of these values. It's 16 pixels, so I can just put stack gap is four and that would render it. And I change the, you know, change the icons and then copy. So just doing this much, like if you look at it, this is three components used here. There's stack, text, and icon. And if you use the right primitives, if you build really good primitives for yourself, you can really, you can get really far with just like basic building blocks, which are connected to your token system or your theming system. So the first two are honestly the main ones. Even if you're not building a design system, you can just take tokens and good primitives that are connected to tokens and get really, really far with it. And the next three are more like optional depending on where you work, what kind of application you build. 
So the third one is the theming system. And this really depends on like, does your application support themes? Does it have a dark mode, light mode, multiple themes? Uh, with Code Sandbox, we kind of have a lot of themes. So we, because it's like runs VS Code, uh, we support a bunch of VS Code themes, which means our entire editor is themeable, including like light theme, or you can go for like a purple theme. I think there's, there's one of those, yeah, there's shades of purple, which means like the application is immensely themeable. And how we achieve that, and I think this is of course like a stretching it a little because that's our use case, but I think the principles are still solid and you can you know, push it, take it to the extreme to a level that works for you. Uh, so when I say tokens goes to components, there's a bit more for us here, which is tokens and the VS Code theme get mushed together and create a UI theme, which is also a JavaScript object. And that is what is fed into the components. So uh, what this looks like is VS Code has a bunch of like, if you look at a VS Code theme, it already defines a bunch of things like sidebar background, sidebar foreground, borders, a few things. But then we also have additional elements, like we have a switch and a menu list and an avatar, things that you know VS Code being a code editor doesn't really have, but we have on top of it, around it in the sidebar, et cetera. So we define these things and add it to our UI theme. And most of the time it's based on the theme itself. So we try to use the theme to create, like we try to use the VS Code theme to create a UI theme out of it so that it seems cohesive and you know it doesn't feel like it's, it feels like it's part of the same theme. And uh, we simply do this by extending the same, using the same values that exist in the theme. So if you look at this avatar image, uh, what's interesting is that they want like the boring, uh, like make it round and all of that. We use border color, which says avatar dot border. An avatar background and the border both are the same, which is avatar dot border. And when you look at the text variants, it's body is inherit, subtle is muted foreground, link is link foreground, destructive is error foreground, and an active button uses button dot background. And these are very like when you look at this, there is no CSS, there is no style behavior here. All it says is like map it to the theme property, and the theme actually makes all of these decisions. So. A link might be blue 300, like our brand blue 300, or it could be pink or like a light shade of purple, depending on the VS Code theme. So the component really has no clue what theme it's going to get, but what it can always rely on is that link foreground would already always exist and muted foreground would always exist. And so that, it, you know, when you're changing theme, you're never really touching the components, you're touching the layer before it. And I think that creates like a very powerful theming system because the components always render one thing and all your decisions are based on the token layer. Cool. Uh, the icon workflow in is interesting. Another thing I stole, we had a pretty pretty robust automated icon workflow for, uh, for the Auth0 design system, uh, but it didn't make sense to go that far because honestly our icons, we don't, we're not really sure what our icon set is yet. We keep defining them as we go. And uh, if you, and that's why I kind of included this because a workflow doesn't have to be like fancy or it doesn't have to be high tech as long as it's shared and integrated and it's part of your process. That's that's your design system process. It doesn't have to be anything special. Our process literally is this Figma file called icons. So every icon that we use, we dump it here. It's on this like 16 by 16 square, that's it. And then we right click copy as SVG and put it in icons.tsx, like the TypeScript file with all our icons. We just keep dumping them there. And you can see by the number of lines, it's like at almost 400 lines. It's, it's a bunch of icons there. It's like 20 ish icons already, or maybe more. But we follow the same rule that it's an SVG. It's 16 by 16. That's the only rule. And then the fill is always current color so that it can be filled by it's like, you know, you can wrap it in something. If it's a link, you can make it blue. And that kind of is our icon flow. That's it. You like you copy it to the Figma file. Oh, I also have a demo. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, and what this gives us, like if you put it in this file, what you get out of it is that you get an autocomplete. So you can say icon and you can say name and you get an autocomplete, right? So you know what icons are present. And then if you wrap it in something, you also get the, uh, you also get the color of the parent. In this demo, you can also see there's a size. So there's a size 12 which is a custom size and the default size is 16. So sometimes you need to like tweak the size. You can do that with the size prop. 
And that is kind of it. Like the process is that simple. There's a Figma file, you dump it there, make sure it's 16 by 16, then copy it, put it in icons file, make sure you use current color. That's the process. This, it's a small team, so everyone understands the process. It's shared and integrated enough, and that works. So that this was just to show an example, like it doesn't have to be fancy. Your process is whatever works for your team. Finally, like this is something that was this is something that I'm not sure a lot of people do, which is visual testing. Uh, and this was extremely beneficial with the big design system world. So I had to steal it for small design system world. Uh, I don't think we can work without this. And the the long story is pretty short that we just use this tool called Chromatic. So what Chromatic does is if you use Storybook and you write stories, it will take your stories and create visual snapshots. I think it will take screenshots, like actual photos of it. And then through your commits, it will compare the photo. So if the visual photo, visual snapshot has changed, it will tell you that something has changed and you need to approve it. So in essence, like in, in what do you say? In principle, it's like just snapshots, but it's a lot, lot more useful because when, you, when you're talking about UI components, you actually want to see them. Just what CSS or what class has changed doesn't help. You want to like be visually able to see what has changed. More interestingly, what this has really helped is like because we have very low level primitives, when a primitive changes, there are so many components that get affected. And because we have stories for some of the more complex components, like a menu or a table, you can actually see when you change a stack or when you change a text primitive, these four components also changed. And then you can look at the visual diff and you can say, all right, this was intentional. Or what happens to me a lot is like, oops, this is this is a total regression. I didn't mean to do this and you undo it. And honestly, like with an application with so many pages or so many like configurations, it's really hard to test all of them manually, like visually when you're doing it. And like, unless you have like a very good design eye, you probably won't even see the minor things that happen when you change primitives. So that's it. Like that's the whole story. Like we use chromatic, you should do if you can. And that's kind of it. Those are my five top things that I stole from big design system world. Let me just recap this constraint based design, which is use design tokens. There is good primitives, create react components for yourself that are pretty low level, but are connected to your tokens. So that when your designer says, let's use, let's use a subtle text of size three, it means the same thing, right? Or when he says, let's put an error here. You don't have to ask which color because it obviously is error foreground color, right? Like all of that is. Uh, like a common language for you. And then uh, theming system, if you have a theming system, don't put it in your components, put it in your theming layer, super powerful. And then uh, the fourth one is have an icon workflow or a workflow for like anything that you need. And it doesn't have to be fancy. It can be as primitive as, as rudimentary as you need. As long as it's shared, it's a process. It's a part of your design workflow. It's part of your design system. And do visual testing. You'll be impressed by by how useful it can be. So these are the five things I picked for our tiny Swiss, Swiss army knife. And yeah, I encourage you to create your own Swiss army knife and steal all of these ideas from big design system world, even into front-end applications. And hopefully, hopefully you'll find something useful. So all of the links from the talks I mentioned, like Brad Frost's article about design tokens are on this link. It's on sid.st slash react global. And yeah, if you like what I hear, if you like what you hear, if I if you like what, oh my God, if you like what I have to say, then follow me on Twitter. That's my handle. Thanks. Thank you, sir. It was an impressive speech. Thank you. Uh, so we got still nine minutes until the next speaker. And before we go, um, I would like to uh, suggest you join me in the conversation. How do you feel about the speech? Have you had the chance to see what guys been replying in the chat session? Let no, me, I haven't. Let me read yes, it for you. Then. Let me interrupt you and read it for you. Oh, I see. All right. Every comment at all. I see. All right. That's good. I like it. <laughs> and then the next one. Damn, see, this is really good. Wow, this is really amazing from heart. Shish Venkatesh, 
and then Tejas Kisaria said, awesome, sir. And what I can do is only repeat the same words. Nice. I'm glad. I'm glad folks liked it. I hope it's useful. They can apply some of this back into their jobs. Sure. What What was the most complicated for part three? Not the complicated, but maybe tiresome before uh, this conference when you were preparing what you were thinking about. Just adjusting my seat, guys. I'm sorry. I need to do it. To feel comfortable. <laughs> you. I didn't get your question. Yeah, uh, preparing for this conference, what was the most exciting part for you and most tiresome part, like you hated it? Like, if you <laughs> if we go back in time, yeah, on, on Falcon 9, SpaceX, if you go back in time, like, what do you think is the worst thing preparing for this conference? Um, all right. So the best thing is that I really like this topic. Like I really like talking about design system. I used to do it full time, and now I just like smuggle things in when I can, like still wired in. So I really like that part, and I like sharing it. So that's the best part. The most annoying part, to be honest, was like mm -hmm. uh, there's there's so much weird things that we do in the company in code sandbox uh -huh. like the application okay. that's like our theming system is wild it's like nobody should have to support like the entire ecosystem of vs code themes and mm -hmm. it's like th there's some weird stuff out there like the themes that are actually good like cobalt but they have very interesting choices like they use purple and they use yellow on top of it and it looks really good in VS Code because like you use accent colors not too much, but when you create a UI around it, okay. it just looked ugly. <laughs> then I mean, it's like we took and made, and then like we made like a lot of it, like a lot of like weird choices and hacks to make it work. And I can't share any of that because it's like it's super interesting, but nobody has these weird problems, right? So it's like the the hardest part I think was like what are the interesting parts that I should keep? And what are just weird things that only we do that nobody would find interesting? There are a lot of so like it's, filtering to do. It is always like that. And that's the thing I needed to say because 90% uh, of what you said, I didn't understand. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> yeah, no, because your speech is clear as a, as a water from the waterfall. I'm just, you know, how to be in that ecosystem right understand how to be one of you guys and i hope yeah. uh, uh, i might become one of you guys i mean you're sitting here like talking to so many people there's no way you can know about all of them <laughs> sure yeah it's nice that people understand that because it's also a job as a moderator is not uh prevent any information from flowing like not to do <laughs> stupid jokes <laughs> which i'm trying hard uh, not to do, but I'm sorry, guys. In chat, just comment if you want a more stupid jokes. I'm gonna go with it. You should go with it, yeah. <laughs> Let it flow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if I was an independent contractor, maybe, but <laughs> mm. we all have the responsibility. But how is the weather, anyways? Oh, such a such a good day. So I don't I don't know if you can tell, but it's like 10 p.m. What, what? So you can't see the other side of the room because it's like it's literally just like this this one light mm -hmm. for like my face it's to 10, look. It's, okay. it's 10 p.m. 10 p.m. right now. Yeah, it's 10 p.m. But it's like a really beautiful day. Spent like before this, I was in the park doing a picnic. So you're in Europe. Yeah, so I'm sitting in Amsterdam. It's like the oh, last really? days of summer. So I'm Luke, just trying to some, some absorb comments. all of it in. I just pulled up some comments uh, from the chat great talk sir thanks hmm. yeah <laughs> Mitch. Mitch is quite empathetic but i like matthew's matthew's do he sandals i hope i pronounce it correct body nice talk i love it exactly let it flow <laughs> yes yeah, still three minutes so if you want to enjoy the body you can be enjoying it with me because I really appreciate your help, Sid. Uh, I feel that we connected quite well right now, that we almost 
like one universe. Okay, yeah, how do sure. I hide it? I hide it. Now I hide it. So what is like what is your what's your plan for the night? You gonna go to sleep or um maybe maybe play some FIFA like just a little before I go to bed. Okay, which team? Which team Barcelona. Uh so you it's, it's a tough time being a Barcelona hide. fan, but so, so what about Messi? Is he leaving? No, he's staying. He they, they, they're not letting they him offer him millions of millions. I mean, his his release <laughs> contract like seven hundred million. So <laughs> nobody has that kind of money. Should, should we start learning how to play football? It's too too late. I mean, it's too late. I, I think it's too late. <laughs> but in one in our minds, can we convince ourselves <laughs> to go to the coach and said and tell to him? Dude, we're gonna be millionaires. Just trust me. <laughs> like, like I'll I'll take one percent of what Messi takes, and I'll play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love what Barbara Hernandez saying. Barbara saying this was such a cool way to approach the themes. I loved it. We loved it too, Barbara. Thank you, and we are very appreciative of you being here. Both of us, as a as a guys on TV, and. Uh, as a team of uh, Geekle, because uh, behind this event, there is a lot of uh, young boys and girls and ladies and gentlemen who made it possible. And yeah, there is another comment before I go to dramatic. If you find you will be our future. Oh, damn. And That'd be cool. Nailed it. That'd he be cool. It. I can't wait for yeah. that. Okay, Sid. So, so Thank you very much. I appreciate it. It's almost time for our next speaker, Anisha Swain. I'm going to connect with her and uh, hope to see you in QA. Yeah, see you in a bit. Thank you, sir. Goodbye. Okay, okay, okay. Let's go. Anisha, I'm connecting you. All right. How are you, Anisha? How's it going? Hi, Petro. I'm fine. How about you? Wow, I love this energy. I'm super glad to meet you. And I hope everyone will enjoy this and ask some meaningful questions. Okay, Tell me uh, if you're ready to rock, if you need some time to ramp, to ramp up, or are you going to fire it straight away? So I'll just uh, introduce myself first, and then I'll just quickly show my screen and get started. Does that sound good? Sure, that sounds amazing. I'm leaving, okay. guys. I'm out. <laughs> okay, so hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Anisha, and uh, I'm an associate software engineer at Red Hat. And uh, I am here in software industry since last two years. And uh, ever since then, I have been using uh, React and Redux. And uh, recently, I got into React Hooks, and uh, I kind of find it very simple and elegant. So today, we're going to talk a little about React state management with Hooks. So without any further delay, uh, let's get started. And I'll just quickly show my screen. <laughs> OK, um, so why state management? Um, yeah, so why state management, right? Uh, with an in Interactive web application, there is uh, always a state, right? It's very important to understand uh, whether we uh, manage it or not. A state is always present in an interactive uh, web application. So, user perform an action and uh, things uh, change in response to those actions. And uh, state management just makes uh, the, that particular state of your application uh, more tangible. Um, maybe in, in a form of data structure so that you can uh, easily read uh, and uh, write to that and uh, kind of makes your uh, invisible state clearly visible to you to work with for uh, debugging or any reason for that matter. So rather than looking at the DOM and uh, deducing a uh, state based on what is there and what is not, an explicit data structure is much easier to understand uh, when we are creating larger and more complex JavaScript applications. So state management uh, help us manage state and uh, share it across between uh, components and uh, 
be be those components in the same hierarchy or uh, nested hierarchy now another aspect uh, of it uh, will be caching of data so uh, if we store uh, the data in a local state or uh, and uh, the component uh, unmounts uh, the data is uh, completely gone right it's uh, gone forever and uh, but if we want to preserve it in that life cycle and for uh, that session it's important to have something that will help in caching and uh, now the next point is it's always good to have a layout or a view logic separated from the application logic flow and it kind of keeps the whole system can uh, in structured the uh, way now uh, before getting into uh, redux and hook stuff uh, just a quick overview of the evolution timeline of uh, react state management so uh, React State State uh, was uh, always there since the first release of React. Uh, we have been using it since 2013. And then after one year in 2014, uh, uh, Flux was introduced uh, after Facebook showed issue with the typical MVC uh, model of the framework that was getting used then. And uh, Flux kind of fixed uh, a state, the state management issue with a, a unidirectional flow. And uh, then in 2014, uh, Redux came into the picture, and uh, which updated the state for a with a centralized store. In 2017, React Fiber got introduced, uh, which uh, introduced tax, task task scheduling according to priority, which kind of made the process a little faster. And it, in 2018, uh, we got context APIs where we could uh, easily pass uh, a prop from the parent component to a nested child component uh, without like uh, moving it around uh, within the unnecessary nested components where we didn't want to use them. And uh, now we have uh, hooks uh, in React 16.8. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's the whole journey of React state management in short. Now, uh, most of us uh, might have used Redux already. Uh, I'll just quickly summarize it. Uh, so what happens when we use Redux? Uh, Redux store data in a global store uh, in, a form, uh, in a form called uh, state, which is, uh, which is basically a JSON object. And uh, uh, it's a completely different setup. So store contain, uh, contains the state. Now these states are defined in UI, and the UI over here is React component. And uh, so states are used in UI for showing up data. Now, how does UI change uh, the data stored in Redux? So it triggers something called uh, an action, which is actually an object and have two keys, uh, a type and a payload. Type is a uh, string defined the uh, defining the action, and payload is the uh, value which uh, need to be replaced uh, with the old value in that particular state. Now, this action uh, hits the reducer, which is a pure function, and the reducer updates the state in the store according to the logic written uh, inside the reducers. So uh, a store basically contains different reducers with different logics and different states. So, uh, so it makes it much more modular and structured and this is the basic structure of uh, data flow in Redux. Now, uh, while using uh, Redux, uh, we have uh, some benefits and some of the problems that most of us uh, get into according to, according to the use case that we try to solve. So Redux have this uh, separation of uh, logic, which lets us keep our concerns for uh, different, different component. Uh, separate and even it uh, separates the uh, the comp uh, separates the uh, concerns uh, from the component UI itself, and it's kind of the a, a very good part of it. And of course, sharing data and is a big plus point of it. And uh, it also helps caching data. Uh, it's easy to debug in Redux as well. Like whenever we make changes to store, it uh, we will uh, get a new object, and that's why we can keep the trace uh, of the state state before any action. And it makes the code structural. And uh, as we have different setups for maintaining only one single task of the logic, so Redux also use middleware uh, if we enable it, and uh, it is an uh, entity uh, between action and uh, reducer. We can use them for like maybe managing permission or interacting with APIs, etc. 
Now the issue that we commonly face is like where to store the data. So uh, we have session and local storage, or we can store the data inside the component as local state or uh, as a global Redux store. So sometimes it gets messy to use these different things from uh, for different tasks in the same system. And again, while using Redux, a lot of code needs to be written. Uh, like if we're shifting our logic into something else, a functional component, then uh, even the line of lines of code gets uh, far more, and uh, it's, it has a very uh, the ball of bread becomes very large. And actually, it's difficult to learn the concept of uh, Redux at once, and uh, it takes time to understand the flow and concept of Redux as well, which can, which makes it uh, difficult to adapt. So uh, we're done with the definition. Now coming to the problem statement, uh, imagine a scenario where you have to pass a prop uh, or to a nested component from the higher level uh, component in hierarchy to, uh, to a lower level component. For example, we need to pass data from our component A to maybe component uh, uh, I and component G. So how do we do that? So uh, the first thing is if the state is in a uh, lower level, then we move the state logic to the higher level. Like for example, if the uh, state is uh, not present in component A, but component B, we have to move the state logic to the component A and it's, it's called uplifting of the state. And then we pass on the value to every level of component tree, which is highly redundant. Like for this case, we have to pass it through component C, D and B. So, Either we store the uh, data in local storage or, or centralized data store, uh, which will fire an action to capture uh, uh, the state, or we use local component state and do state lift, uh, state uplifting. So where we pass down the props in, at every level, which is absolutely redundant. So what's the solution? Uh, basically, we, we need a way to declare the data that we want to be available throughout the component tree, right? So we need a way in which any component in the tree that uh, requires a particular uh, data, uh, the, we should be able to access to it, should be able to subscribe to it. Now, this is where React context comes into the picture. So what does context do? Uh, context uh, provides a way to pass uh, data through the component tree without having to pass props down manually at each level. So um, typically, uh, when uh, we create uh, a new context for each unique piece of data that uh, needs to be available with uh, React uh, create context instance. Now, uh, this instance will have two parameters uh, both of which are components, uh, a provider and uh, a consumer. So provider allows us to declare the data. Uh, we want to be available throughout the component. It uh, passes on the, the data that uh, needs to be accessed in the nested component. And uh, so consumer allows any component in the tree to able to subscribe to that data and without uh, being able, without uh, like needing to pass it on to other components. And uh, so that kind of makes it uh, a little bit uh, more functional. So uh, let's move ahead with some examples. So uh, in this example, what uh, we are trying to do is we'll simply uh, get a value from uh, a high level, high, uh, higher, higher, higher hierarchy level component, and then we'll pass on that uh, particular uh, value, particular state to a nested component, right? So at first I have created a comp uh, component which uh, uh, creates an instance of uh, uh, create a context named increase context, and then we uh, export it to be used in uh, the provider context. So here our top level component is app.js, which uh, basically ha is a class component having a state, uh, which is count, or a state having a value count. 
and uh, in order to pass the value to any uh, nested child component we have to pass uh, we have to use wrap the child component inside uh, the context dot provider and then pass on the value as an object uh, with inside uh, the value uh, va value prop and uh, if you can see here i'm uh, just passing on some value of the count and uh, in order to consume that value in, in order to uh, consume that in, the, in order to subscribe to that data whatever is passed from the provider uh, we need to use something we need to export the uh, context from where it is defined and then uh, we need to wrap it around uh, context.consumer and then simply uh, simply use the data that was passed it will be available inside uh, the consumer wherever we use it. So this is the uh, basic flow of uh, when we use the uh, context with provider and consumer. So the provider provides the data and uh, the consumer uh, consumes the data uh, directly from the provider and it at any point of the uh, hierarchy in the component tree. Now, uh, what if we just don't want to pass a value, uh, but a function to update the value of the count, right? Uh, like, what if we just don't want to pass a static value, or uh, we want to change it as well in, in the nested component? Then the first uh, intuition might be to uh, pass a function with uh, update, uh, with which updates the state inside the value. Like, for example, here I have. Uh, passed on the uh, passed on the state uh, count and then i have passed on a function uh, which updates simply updates the state count and uh, it will work as well uh, we will uh, as the previous example will simply uh, reference uh, the both of the value passed inside context.consumer and we'll be able to uh, make it work as uh, usual as normal and but uh, it will have performance issues like when the data uh, passed inside a value prop uh, will change. React will re-render every component which uses a consumer to subscribe to the data. So basically, every every uh, thing that will be attached to the provider will be changed. Every component which will be attached to the uh, provider. So uh, React will uh, like basically create different objects for uh, every, ren every render and uh, render of the provider component as it will take every render as creation of a new object and will compare it to the old object so basically it will compare it to the content of the object won't change but it will compare the same object same uh, content with the, with the new object with having same content and it's called reference identity so instead of passing on an object every time we will pass the reference of the same object so uh, here, for example, we uh, instead of passing on the whole function, we kept the function inside the state and passed the reference to the state. So anywhere inside the component tree, we can now access uh, the count and uh, the increase count function values using consumers. So uh, just a quick note that I'm using only two components just for sake of simplicity, but we can actually break down these components even in a more modular way as separate components uh, like for example we can have we can make a separate component for uh, creating these providers context or provider as well so that uh, completely is up to you now uh, what if we have multiple providers like uh, we want to collect data from different components and uh, consuming all the context at the same place if uh, that happens then uh, uh, the render prop uh, the in the consumer is kind of hard to follow for example uh, here i have used two different context here yeah, the increase context and default context so basically the increase context simply increases the count but default context give a default value uh, but uh, basically i have uh, declared both of them over here but you can we can actually use different components from where we will export these contexts so the uh, in that case in provider we have to nest the provider and then send value as we were doing before like for example here the increase context provider and the default context is nested uh, inside it and we have wrapped the 
uh, the nested uh, component uh, is uh, the, that the nested comp uh, component over here, which is increase, right? But if you see the way con con the con consumer consumes the data over here is kind of weird. Like uh, uh, now I ha we have uh, uh, like uh, nested uh, increase context and then it's returning some value and then again we have a default context and it's returning some value so it's it, with uh, more and more uh, more context it becomes more and more complicated right and uh, here we have used only two context and if you want to use uh, like multiple uh, context and we want to have uh, different state values inside our nested component it's going to be very complicated so <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is where hooks uh, comes into rescue with uh, all the nesting thing going on when we have like a lot of multiple values passed inside the provider. Hooks uh, makes it easier to follow in the consumer part. Right. So before getting into the example, a little bit uh, information about hooks. Uh, hooks are new addition to React 16.8. Uh, they let us use state and other React features without writing class. So um, basically, uh, you put your functions on catalysts so that you can uh, uh, so that you can stop relying on classes and move on to functions. So if you prefer. Uh, if you prefer classes over functions, then it is a different story. But sooner or later, you'll have to dive into hooks to introduce your own logic into functions in a simpler way. So hooks are basically like functions which uh, hook into React state and lifecycle features from functional components. Uh, it does not work inside classes. So basically, if you write functional component and uh, then you want to add some state to it, Previously, you do it by converting it to class component, which uh, even I have done it before in before examples. So uh, the thing is that that's not required. <laughs> uh, that's the whole point of it. So if you don't, uh, if you don't need to, uh, you know, complex uh, class components, it's a good way to you move on to hooks and use uh, uh, functional components, right? And uh, the good news is hooks are backward compatible, which means uh, it's not going to break any changes. Uh, also, it doesn't replace our knowledge of uh, uh, React, uh, uh, like replace the knowledge of our React concept. So the basic uh, prerequisites sites will be like uh, we need to use Node version 6 or above and uh, NPM version 5.2 or above. And uh, a tool like create uh, create React app uh, for running the React app. Now uh, there are three basic hooks for state changes and a couple of additional hooks as well. Uh, for this uh, session, we will deal with use context, use state, and uh, use reducers. So uh, why do use uh, hooks? Uh, we know that components and uh, components uh, and top-down data flow uh, help us organize a large UI into small, independent, uh, reusable chunks of code. However, we often can't break complex component down any further because uh, the state is so uh, the logic is so stateful and also can't be extracted to a function or another component. So that's huge concern. Uh, when we try to solve these use cases with components alone, we usually end up with uh, either huge components that are hard to refactor and test, or duplicated logic between different components and uh, lifecycle methods. And same thing will be happening in both, but unnecessarily, uh, we will have to write code, like uh, uh, render props and uh, like complex, uh, like render props and high order components. So, well, uh, hooks let us organize the logic inside a component into reusable isolated units. And we can have our logic fixed somewhere and uh, uh, then use it again and again in different uh, components. So uh, now I'm moving on with the same example. Uh, so all the nesting in the consumer side will uh, just go away with uh, the use of simple hook uh, use uh, context. 
uh, we, we just simply reference the context using use context and uh, use the value to get uh, the state and uh, or the data that we wanted to use inside the component. Now, now we see, you see, uh, previously we were using class component, but uh, you know, uh, actually uh, the the thing is, it was it was not required. We didn't have that much take the function to. Uh, we didn't want the UI logic to. We didn't have that much UI or application logic to use uh, the class components, and it was not stateful. So you know, we are going to eliminate the class component from here, and uh, we'll convert the nested. Uh, component increased or JS to functional component and uh, use hooks right so uh, but uh, uh, you know see uh, we are still using class component uh, in app.js and uh, we are uh, tracking uh, uh, we're tracking these uh, state with set state and to emulate this behavior uh, we can actually emulate this in a even simpler way with react hooks uh, so we we don't need to get into class component. We can do it in a much more elegant and simple way by using just using uh, use state hook. So, uh, what does uh, calling use state do? It uh, declares a state variable, uh, kind of eliminates the whole uh, constructor and super keyword stuff, and uh, just simply uh, uses uh, the use state in just a couple of two or three lines. So in this example, I have taken a simple button which will click on click will increase the count. Uh, and uh, the, uh, for that, we I have uh, simply exported the use state and uh, then, uh, sorry, imported the use state and uh, then the use state then returns a tuple where uh, the first parameter count is the current state of the counter and the set count is uh, the method that will allow us to update the counter state so we can use the set count uh, method to update the state count uh, anywhere in inside this uh, component and uh, in case uh, and we can actually uh, make uh, is, we can actually convert, uh, change this uh, current state to anything and here uh, inside the set count function and simply uh, increasing it by one. So, and uh, when we want to display the current count in the class, we read this dot state dot count previously in the class component. And uh, now we can simply just wrap the variable inside curly braces and uh, that's it. So the idea with hook is that we are able to keep our code more functional, elegant, and avoid class-based component if it's not desired or needed. So, you know, uh, if uh, we can make it simple, so it's it's better kept simple. <laughs> now, uh, to use the set state in our previous example where we used context, we simply uh, removed the constructor and super keyword and converted app.js component to, to functional component and uh, use the count and set count tuple to keep uh, to keep track of state variable and uh, pass this uh, this in the value in the provider so that the consumer can uh, have a uh, can access to it right now the code works the same way as before but uh, the lines of code the chunks of code is uh, reduced uh, significantly and uh, that's that's i guess the beauty of it so now uh, another thing is, uh, what if we want to create multiple actions or even more complicated logic, even though we, we can actually create more set, set uh, reference and pass them down. But uh, the best approach to do it is use of uh, another hook called uh, use reducer. So use reducer hook is uh, basically an uh, alternative to use state. It uh, accepts a reducer object with uh, which will keep track of the state according to the type of action passed and uh, an initial value of the state so if you are familiar with redux uh, syntax then it might be more uh, you might understand it even in a better way so uh, it's kind of very simple actually so basically as usual uh, we <coughs> use uh, the use redux redux so you can actually import it over on top of it I don't know why I didn't do it here. So uh, 
it uh, returns a tuple as uh, usual, which uh, uh, keeps track of the current state. And then it returns us another uh, uh, another function dispatch, which uh, points to uh, points to a points to a function reducer. So what reducer does is it uh, keeps track of the action type, and according to that, it changes the state. Right. So uh, when we use this uh, use this reducer, we simply dispatch an action type to the reducer function over here. And according to the action type, it determines what uh, thing to do with uh, the state. So that that so react uh, the use reducer is usually preferable to use it when uh, we have complex state logic uh, that involves multiple sub values or even the next state depends on the previous uh, next state depends on the previous one, right? So now we can emulate the exact same functionality in uh, different uh, nest, nest, uh, in uh, uh, our previous example. So we simply created the uh, 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 yeah, context uh, in this context, uh, and uh, uh, in order to in in order to pass the value, we pass the tuple with the action dispatch, and uh, in the consumer side, we'll be able to. Uh, use this patch function and uh, it will uh, do the same thing that uh, it will uh, do the same uh, it will uh, be able to you know uh, get this, the data passed from uh, the higher uh, higher hierarchical uh, component and uh, it will uh, do the thing as per your logic so, uh, so we can emulate the exact functionality in different nested components by simply passing the dispatch function inside uh, the value object of the provider. So um, historically, uh, how we have structured out uh, React component uh, has been coupled to component life cycles. This kind of forced uh, related logic throughout the component doing the same thing. Uh, before uh, React hooks, when we want to create dynamic component, we had to create a class component and use lifecycle methods to change states to make it usable or uh, make it encapsulate. By but by create by creating an ES6 class, the class needs to uh, like, uh, get extended by React dot component and with a render method inside it, which will return a JSX markup. Also, we need to assign uh, to uh, initiate a state. We need to assign the initial state in the constructor with this dot state. So, whereas in hooks, use state hooks allow you to add state in, uh, uh, yeah, allows to use uh, um, initial state with uh, this dot state dot statement in the constructor. And uh, well, we can import use state from the act, which will allow you to set the initial state in the argument. So comparing these two uh, ways, uh, comparing these uh, ways to create a component, we can clearly see that hooks need uh, comparatively very less amount of code, and uh, it is more clear to read and understand, and definitely provides uh, sharing non-visual logic implementation. Right. So now. Uh, some uh, some of the pointers about uh, using context and hooks uh, will be like when to use hooks. So uh, we need uh, hooks uh, are kind of uh, uh, we can use hooks for like, simpler um, logic when we don't need middleware where uh, we have easy and straightforward logic and we don't need much of the server side rendering and. Uh, uh, the advantages of it is we, it's a module level store and you uh, like we can use redux uh, only when it is required and uh, it's it's very easy to move around the logic uh, in in hooks and uh, doesn't replace the previous knowledge of react concept and uh, get uh, far less uh, amount of uh, code and uh, it's more uh, structured so a couple of uh, disadvantages or i should say that uh, it's kind of depends on the use case that uh, there is no middleware support. And uh, if you want to have a lot of uh, server-side rendering, 
uh, that's kind of not possible and uh, we can't do time travel debugging so debugging becomes a uh, difficult and uh, well, context hooks uh, have a lot of render cycles so it might impact the performance as well and uh, context can only store a single value so now where to use hooks context uh, even though uh, in the example we used hooks in component level we should prefer to use context providers in router level i feel now why am i saying it uh, because uh, it will reduce the re-renders and hence improving the performance now we can also try to do it with react memo but uh, by keeping but by keeping it at the router level we will be able to get all providers at a single place and uh, all routes using provider can be easily pointed out so there are a couple of rules we need to keep in mind while dealing with hooks uh, we can't call hooks from regular javascript functions uh, it should always be called from uh, react functional components and uh, we uh, we can't we shouldn't call uh, hooks inside loops conditions nested functions and uh, we all should always use hooks at the top level of the react function so by following this rule we ensure that hooks are called in the same order each time a component renders and uh, that's what allows uh, react to correctly preserve the state of hooks between multiple use state and use effect calls Now, uh, so some of the uh, best uh, practices uh, yeah, of hooks is uh, custom hook is a JavaScript function uh, that uh, uh, whose name starts using use and that may uh, call other hooks. For example, uh, you now we can combine some of the basic hooks and create a custom hooks. So keeping uh, uh, we should call all like try to call hooks from custom hooks. And uh, keeping React hooks simple will give us more power effect to effectively control and manipulate what goes on in a component throughout the lifetime. So, uh, and uh, avoid uh, writing custom. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, uh, so if uh, we don't need to use uh, like multiple hooks, then it, we should definitely avoid using custom hooks, and uh, we can simply use uh, an inline uh, hook instead. So that depends on what is your use case and what kind of logic you want to put in. So it's basically the whole idea is to keep it as simple as possible. And uh, one advantage of React hooks is the ability to write less code that is easy to read. In some cases, the amount of uh, uh, hooks like use effect and use state can still be confusing. Well, when you keep a component organized, it will help in readability and keep the flow of the component consistent and predictable. Uh, if the custom hooks are too complicated, you can always break them out uh, into sub uh, custom hooks as well. So extract the logic of your component into, uh, into custom hooks to make the code readable, but don't use just for fun. I mean, if you can do it with sim in a simpler way, then it's good to go with that. Now, a React Hooks snippet is a Visual Studio Code extension to make React Hooks easier and faster. So they currently support, uh, I think, five hooks. Uh, so definitely uh, uh, try it out. And VS Code plugin called ES uh, plugin React uh, Hooks enforces the rules that was mentioned in the previous slide. This comes in handy in enforcing the rules when working on a project. So I suggest you make use of these plugins when working on your project, especially when working with others. You can add this plugin to your project if you would like to try it. Now, these are some reference uh, and uh, uh, conferences, talks I used to uh, get a uh, good uh, idea about uh, like how to use hooks and context uh, for state management so definitely go check it out uh, i'll put the uh, slide link in the comment section and uh, yeah that's it from my side thank you everyone for having me here it was uh, a really amazing experience it was actually my first international conference so I was kind of excited and nervous at the same time, but uh, I guess thank you for being an amazing audience and uh, a host. So yeah, thank you. 
Thank you, Anisha. Can you turn on your webcam? Okay, I got it. I got it, got it, got it. So it's super bright in here. Um, let me just tell that we are having a Q&A session. It's planned to be in three minutes. So before those three minutes, I would like to ask you the question. <laughs> How do you feel? The general question, I want, I, I'll be asking this everyone, guys. So if you're a speaker watching me right now, just prepare your speech, write it down, write down the scenario the true one how do you feel about the conference and how it's gone for you so uh, i think uh, i enjoyed preparing the slides even more i wanted to keep it as simple as possible uh, i mean uh, i saw some of the comments and uh, i tried to you know put it in a way where we build up the, uh, the scenario one by one instead of going directly to uh, the thing uh, I mean, the whole idea was to, you know, even if somebody who is not familiar with uh, the concept should be able to follow in from even the middle of the slide. So I don't know how I did it. <laughs> so yeah, nice. we'll, see you, uh, we'll see you there. Nice. Let me show you something. Just pull it up real quick. We we'll start with thank you by Chris Ward. Then we go straight to Caitlin Loon. And she says, thank you so much for the helpful information uh i hope you find this voice actually not boring okay we got Pavel here Pavel is a moderator for senior <laughs> track he's my teammate he wants to say some say hello hey say guys. hi hey nice to have you all here yeah so just in the next room we have a senior track and we got this guy who is a moderator there so hello guys from Pavel and my name is Petro. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's Nisha. I'm gonna I'm gonna add up our beautiful spectacular speakers, Aaron and Sid. You guys you guys are ready. So uh, all of you all of you, three of you right there uh how we're gonna go is i'm gonna ask questions just pass questions from the chat section um uh, mostly it's directed to someone but there are some general questions too uh that you could answer uh, by by what you decide you just decide let me just show you yeah you know what if i leave the stream right now there's going to be two ladies and one gentleman and we always have this comment that we uh do not have enough uh women speakers and i just want you to understand guys that's like we're trying hard to have it balanced but sometimes it just doesn't it does like we want to have more female uh representatives here on the stream because that energy is just out of this world when you guys speak so if you have any friends who's uh encoding and programming in software development we we, have, we are having some upcoming events for cross-platform from for node.js uh this event i'm the community manager for node.js actually that's going to be in early december we're going to have python upcoming event um you guys are welcome to invite your friends and if they want to give the valuable information share their knowledge we're more than welcome we're going to accept it we're going to be appreciative all right okay so the question is um i think we start with erin question is for you okay let's do it okay 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 i'm looking at it up and the question is could you please recommend what tools to start with to do automated testing of a web project just basic not for accessibility and how to find a balance and not to spend too much effort on tests do i need to repeat it or is it understandable no i got you um i think you absolutely have to be running eslint and there are a lot of plugins to eslint um the airbnb is fairly standard to extend their uh, config for ESLint. So that's a great place to get started. 
um, because it's just going to point out things in your code that are likely to be bad practices or cause problems. So, uh, and then it really helps enforce standards across a team. So everybody's kind of writing code in the same style. So that one's huge. Um, I mean, I think you do need to have some level of unit tests. And I think um, while the learning curve may be hard, it's good to just kind of push through and start learning and start writing tests and uh, get a sense for what's the most appropriate amount of testing. There's definitely a too little and there's a too much. Like you can try to go for 100% test coverage and that's not actually buying you anything, but it's just taking more of your time. So there is totally a happy medium in there. And I don't think it's easy to figure out until you do it and get some experience and kind of learn from what tests were actually helpful, what actually caught problems for us, and what did I spend a lot of time on and like actually wasn't useful. So that's a big one. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. I mean, I think that you do want to set up a continuous integration system that's running your lint and your tests and, you know, failing a build if any of those fail, because you definitely want to make sure everybody on the team is running those all the time. Sure. So if somebody didn't and they push and the tests fail, we need to all go fix that stuff. So those are kind of, I think, the big ones for getting started, at least off the top of my head right now. All right. Thanks for the answer. Anisha just disappeared and I want to ask her a question. Um, I'm going to ask a tech team to contact Anisha, but let's move forward, guys. Uh, then, uh, I mean, the choice is pretty obvious, Seed. Something for you. The question was, uh, no, that was the basic question. What the example page link somebody asked you when you was showing something in the middle of your conversation? Um, if you would get what they mean, guess, no, can you I'm say that sure. again? Yeah, hey, see, it was the example page link. So you were showing something, maybe. I mean, all of them were from the examples were from Code Sandbox. So you can send me a link then or whatever. Sure. Got it. Yeah. Anisha, welcome back. We're waiting for you. Um, question for you. Can we directly refer to React hooks documentation or is it better to understand three docs before going ahead with the hooks? So uh, I think uh, the, uh, the best thing about React hooks that I like is I had to go through a lot of documentation to understand the uh, Redux flow, uh, Redux tongues, Aga, et cetera, et cetera. But with React hooks, I mean, the documentation is uh, enough if you are already familiar with the, con the concept a little bit. And uh, with a little bit of explanation, maybe uh, one or two videos, you're good to go. And uh, I think that's the best thing about hooks. You don't need uh, any need to replace any previous uh, knowledge about uh, React at all. So yeah, it's it's uh, within uh, in between Redux and uh, hooks. Uh, definitely, hooks are easier, very easier to implement and understand. Sure. Thanks a lot. Do you guys want to have a friendly exchange? Because there is a question for everyone, and I want you to. I want you to be engaged for each other, I would say, and uh, definitely I'm requiring your help right now. And there is a question that goes from Akriti Anand, and he says, I understand that functional oriented programming is cleaner and the code is more readable. Hence, React community is moving from class to functional. Are there any trade offs we are making here? And I want you guys to debate, just go all in whoever interrupt each other uh don't look back i mean live your life let's just go ahead with it who wants to start who can start um i can start um oh, sure, sir. I okay like if you if you want to make it like interesting i don't think hooks are functional in the functional programming sense at all. 
like it's functions over classes, but it's not like functional programming. So I think it it's like, I don't even think they intended to, you know, like use it as a marketing gimmick, but it's just how sometimes happens. Like people get excited by the jargon. Um, so, but, but what is interesting and, you know, of course, Anisha would have more to say about this was that uh, in their documentation, they kind of like wrote a post about why they like hooks better and they think it could be more interesting. Uh, and none of those reasons were like paradigm A is better than paradigm B. And you know, that's, that's the way everyone should write code. And like, there was no like dividing nature of it. Like, I'm sorry, there's like not enough drama <laughs> in that. <laughs> you try hard, you try hard. I think to, if I can jump in, I think to me where functional programming does come in is when we're talking about making sure that our function components are pure. Um, but besides that, I agree. There's not as many more, you know, fundamental functional programming concepts in using functional components versus class components. It's really just that concept of, is it a pure function? Nice. Yeah, uh, so I mean, I, I do agree with that. So it's, it's basically, uh, you know, uh, it, it depends on the use case that you're in, right? So uh, I, for me, the whole uh, whole idea about idea of it is uh, like, if you do not need to use class component, you don't have the component to be that stateful, then it's a good thing to move on to the, the functions. But uh, it, it absolutely depends on the use case that uh, you are working on, right? Like for uh, right now, we are developing a, a product, and uh, we uh, we are using and design with UMI routing, and uh, we are not even using hooks. So in some places, it uh, might be helpful, might reduce uh, our task a little, but we do need to use Redux over there because uh, our function our components are very stateful, and they are using React compositions. And uh, even uh, like I, I saw a question where they asked, like, is there any downside of this? Yes, there is. I mean, there are a lot of rendering going on. <laughs> and uh, to overcome that, they recently uh, launched, I think, uh, as a separate team of Facebook, they launched Reconcile. And uh, uh, so I would say the basic idea is like use according to the use case, whatever is uh, works for you. For example, if, if uh, there is a very small uh, component with uh, not so complicated logic, it's it's good to go with the functional component. Uh, and uh, if it is uh, like very stateful, then it's it's good to go for uh, like Mopex uh, or uh, Redux. So I, I'll say that. <laughs> I'm gonna have just sunglasses anyway, guys, because it's it's so freaking bright. I'm among, among those rock stars. Uh, you know what? I got the question. When, if you, uh, one of you were experienced the speech of another one, how much of the information you were you were understanding? And if you got a question, do you have anyone of you between all your three guys? Is it clear? Do I need to paraphrase it? Can you restate one more time? Yeah. Uh, if you were by chance watching uh, a speech by another person who is in q a chat right now how much of the information did you get uh and based on that what question you you would ask a person who was a speaker so if we have a question for another talk that we saw today what would we ask yeah for example you would what would you ask anisha seed seed anisha erin and Anisha see the Aaron. Gotcha. I mean, we can skip it anyways. <laughs> so there is a question, I think, for everyone. When starting a new project or at the early stage startup, do you focus on accessibility first of the gate or focus on addressing it later? Which, what is your take, guys? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, it's okay. Yeah, I have... I've worked at a big company and I've worked at a very small company. And so the answer is kind of different depending on that, depending on budget. 
Um, at the big company, we started with accessibility from the very beginning and every story was tested for accessibility. And so it was, it was very loaded with focus on accessibility. In a smaller company where we're moving really fast and uh, a story, you know, the story I finished today is going to be changed dramatically by the story I finished tomorrow. It's not really uh, efficient to be doing accessibility testing constantly. So it, it, it's, you know, you're always going to be thinking about it a little bit and the things you know to do, the things that are simple to do and fast to do, you probably should always be doing. But to do like a really big focus on testing and, and major fixing of accessibility issues, I think you, you might be able to put off until the feature you're working on or the app you're working on stabilizes a bit, then put a lot of time into looking at accessibility and fixing things a little towards the end. So it all just kind of depends on what's going to fit your project better. Gotcha. Sid, what do you have to say about it? No, oh, yeah, I agree. I've had the exact same experiences, but it's like it's a big company. You can focus it from the start. And it's like in the design system team, we could just spend infinite amount of time. We had the permission to just go down these rabbit holes. And it's like, there's some really fun rabbit holes. Like if there's a form inside a model, figure out the keyboard, like tab, tab, direct. It's a lot of fun. Uh, but now at a super tiny company, it almost feels like I'm stealing time to make sure the app is somewhat accessible. Uh, and then when it gets hard, I kind of can just say, okay, maybe I'll come back to this next week. So there's like, it's more chaotic. It's more like borrowing and a little here, a little there. There's not enough structure to it. Anisha. Yeah, so uh, I don't really have experience so with startup, <laughs> but uh, yeah, in big companies and MNCs, so they, they, I think uh, the, uh, we, I mean, we are working on. I'm working on a UX designer right now to uh, get a user interface uh, for performance benchmarking, and uh, like I feel like that goes through various different kind of uh, testing. Okay, this satisfies this rule or not, and it goes on. I mean, it's kind of uh, overwhelming because it goes on for a very long time and i feel to make sure that uh, it's it's okay to put it out and start implementing and uh, i i guess how whatever i have heard from my uh, colleagues or friends and start of the scenario is a little different and uh, it's, it's a little bit quicker and uh, so i think yeah they in mncs they do focus on accessibility from earlier stage of uh, the development process Get it, get it, get it. So there is a more technical question right now from Sebastian Puente, or Puente, I'm sorry, Sebastian, I'm mispronouncing it. So, no, that's actually was for Aaron, but if you guys could reply to it too, you're welcome to do it afterwards. So regarding A11Y, what value do you get from unit tests or E2E tests against just having the YesLint plugins configured? Is it worth writing a bunch of unit tests for a one one Y for all components. So help me out if I'm wrong. Yeah, um, like in the example I showed where you could kind of test a, a large component, maybe a component that represents an entire page in your unit test, then you don't have to write a whole lot of those. Um, I think it would probably get really time consuming if you were writing tests against a lot of little components you might as well just spend that time manually testing. So I don't think there's a lot of bang for your buck doing that. But if you're testing like every page, that hopefully shouldn't be a lot of tests. And I think that's probably worth doing. Sure. I'm thinking that we're gonna go with a couple of technical questions and we're gonna wrap it up with philosophical questions, lifestyle questions, or just your, your way through the coding career question, something like that. Um, so for Aaron, once again, when implementing ESLint in my pipeline, where do you recommend is the best place to enforce it? GitHub action status check before merge, uh, question mark. With every push, question mark, a hook that runs on your local machine that enforces linting before publishing. 
I could actually copy paste this question in a private chat for us guys so you can see it too. Um, so yeah, I can I can definitely answer that. In fact, um, I just recently joined a team and they had a um, a pre push get hook um, that was doing linting, and um, I did not enjoy it <laughs> because you know I might have some changes that are unstaged and some that are staged, and my unstaged stuff is not done, and so the linter is going to fail. But then it would. Pre prevent me from committing the stuff I had staged. So I don't recommend doing that. Um, I think that at the PR level is probably the best place to put that. Um, you don't want something blocking you too often. You want that gate to be before you're able to merge the code, in my opinion. Okay. Okay. And there is one question for all of you. What does it take? On upgrading legacy projects with new features, should you keep it? Should you keep using outdated code or refactor everything? Focus is on time versus quality trade-off. I'm actually feeling that this question is not super technical, but more a philosophical one. Um, but if you guys have a desire right now to answer this question, I would love to hear a seat take on this, and then we go with Anisha. Sure. Um... Like my gut reaction is that you, do you really have a choice of being like, we're going to throw everything away and we're going to build everything new and get it right on the first try so that it's never bad. I always feel like it's a constant refactor that happens. Like every time you touch something, you end up going and like, you know, refactoring it. And it's like some code goes stale. And then whoever wrote it, probably you wrote it with your best intentions in mind, with the information you had, but now the assumptions are no longer true. So it's all crap. And it's like a constant thing. I've never like been lucky enough to like inherit an old project and be like, now we're gonna throw it away and rewrite it. And it's gonna be so good. Like I have been part of like massive refactors where we threw a version out, built a new one, the same team, all the assumptions, we knew everything. Like we were best set for like doing it all over again. We still didn't do a good job. Like we still got a bunch of things wrong. We still had bugs. And by the time the project was over, we already hated parts of it that we wanted to change again. So it's like, for, for me, I've, it's always been like a constant thing. I don't think there's a, I don't think somebody can say, do this and it will work out. I don't think anyone will disagree with this, man. No, 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 nobody can disagree with it. I mean, uh, before a few months, we were trying to up uh, create React to use hooks. <laughs> and uh, like it, it's, you know, it's, it's a risk to take, uh, like that nothing will break in production. Sorry. Uh, okay. okay, I thought that internet connection was logging. It was actually indeed logging. But that was my internet connection, not yours. So I'm double sorry right now. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So uh, yeah, that's what I was saying. Uh, that uh, uh, it's uh, it's always a good idea to keep it updated instead of just switching, trying to switch it at a single instance. Because uh, even though it maybe Re React hook says that it won't break it, but you can't take that risk when you are in production. It it might break something. So it's a good idea to keep. Uh, you know, make it updated as much as possible. Uh, like uh, I have been in a scenario where it takes uh, 20 days to like fix a production and then push it to staging and then check it then again production. So, so it's it's a bad idea to just switch it like that and expect that everything will work out. Uh, that's a bad idea. Not just bad is the next question I wanted to ask you. But is it really bad? Let's, let's evaluate it. Can I even say like that, being a moderator? There are no bad questions, guys. All questions are good. Uh, Nishma Maski asks, is jQuery really bad for website house? What does she mean? And what meaningful answer can you give? 
is jQuery really bad for websites health? Who's ready to answer, guys? Raise your hand. I can go second. <laughs> Good play, sir. Good play. Should we skip this question? Should I really go deep down with this question? I mean, it's a good question in the sense that, like, uh, like, like you need advice that use Vue.js because React is bad, or you like use React because jQuery is bad. Like, there always has to be a villain and a hero. For some reason, like, we really like that narrative. So I've heard like people say jQuery is bad and like different reason every time. Um, but I grew up on jQuery. I love that shit. Like I, that's how I learned to do web dev. So I like, I don't like hearing bad things about it. It's still a great piece of software. So in fact, like I, I would argue that for some projects, jQuery is actually a better solution than something like React or Vue. So yeah, it, it has a great place in the ecosystem. It's just old and we don't like old things, but other than that, it's great. Use it whenever you can. Good, good, nice, nice, nice. Nishma, it was actually a very good question. It was just me being myself. Appreciate it. Uh, ladies, your take on that? Um, so uh, jQuery is like an excellent tool for letting developer directly manipulate the DOM. So uh, I think it's an excellent library when you need ad hoc direct manipulation of DOM. And uh, avoiding jQuery at all cost uh, is not likely because uh, like when you are using uh, Angular or React or something, it's, it's very unlikely that you are going to use it. So I mean. I, I mean, I don't have any hard feelings for jQuery. It's amazing. I mean, it it really gives a very it's a very powerful tool for direct manipulation. And uh, even though people will argue that uh, you should not do that, but I kind of like it. Nice, nice. Okay, Sid wants to add something real quick. Yeah, I I actually have a question for Aaron on like related to. This space. Go ahead. Just uh, sh shoot it do straight. You, Don't be afraid. Nobody's watching. But do you feel like maybe. jQuery UI, like at its peak, like the just pull some UI, the chances that it's like really high quality and accessible were way higher than like finding like an accessible thing now. Like I, I when I like try to pull something from npm, like React hyphen color picker or date picker. There's like at least five or six that you have to go through to find the one that's like responsive, accessible. And I feel like maybe it's just like a lot more of us now. Uh, but jQuery UI just had this weird thing that like it used to work out of the box and be good. I, I wonder if, this just, if that's just me. Like I, I just don't know how to search for good things. Yeah, I mean, I didn't know anything about accessibility back when I was using jQuery. So I definitely can't say from any personal experience. But my guess is that because those components were simpler and we weren't doing so many fancy things with the with CSS and styling and whatnot, that um, they probably were more accessible than a lot of our components today. You know, the third-party library components that we find that look cool. Um, or do a lot of things, but they aren't written to be accessible. Um, but that's just totally like conjecture. I don't know if it's really the case, but I, th I think probably a lot of our stuff was a little more accessible, you know, a number of years back because we weren't doing so many fancy things. But I mean, you can argue, you know, should we not do fancy things? Uh, that's important too. Let's argue. I mean, th th the theory checks out. But yeah, it's like, I, I guess we've struggled to keep, like do fancy things while keeping it accessible. Right, which is totally um, possible. Like I hear the argument all the time of, you know, if you just write HTML, it's accessible to begin with and then we break it. Well, I, th I think it's okay that we write complicated and fancy things. There's also ways to make it accessible. You can do both. Nice, nice, nice. I got a follow up for Erin. 
um, Sepsol, uh, that's a nickname, I believe. And Sepsol being a huge fan in the uh, chat section, I appreciate it. Uh, okay, I just made sure it wasn't Sepsol, it was somebody else. Uh, it was a heel pattern, yeah, I missed it, guys. So, Aaron, is there any other tools, other jobs to easily test the accessibility features? Um, so for people who don't know, JAWS is a screen reader that is um, licensed um, that only runs on Windows. So we've got on Windows, there's JAWS and NVDA, which is free. On Mac, there's VoiceOver. Um, you know, when it comes to the screen readers, I think that you kind of have to learn them all and test with them all, at least, you know, as I argued, you know, if you want to wait a little towards the end of your project, once to stabilize, run, you've got to run through with all the screen readers because you don't know, you know, all of our users are using different screen readers. So we, you need to make sure it's compatible with all of them. Um, you know, when it comes to the easier ways, it's kind of these auditing tools that I talked about today but if you're, you know, you're going to that manual testing phase, which you do need to do, you've got to target each of the different areas that people are going to be approaching your app with. So you've got to cover the screen readers. I don't think there's really any um, shortcut to those. You've just got to learn how to use them and use them on your app. You've got to look at um, some of the high contrast tools, see what your app looks like in various high contrast modes. Um, you've got to try it out with a keyboard only. So like kind of those things you just have to do. And unfortunately, I don't think there's any faster way or easier way to do them. Good, 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 good. I love it. Just was waiting for, for a moment of silence. For, <laughs> for the, but how do you guys feel? How do you guys feel about not moving for such a long time? Because I'm sitting right here and I feel like my body is aching. Like I want to do waves i want to yep. do a little bit of exercise i was and doing some stretches between talks. For, real, for real for real yeah. was your, what your what were the favorite stretch moves of yours that you did um i you know i stretched out my legs because they're super tight and so it was like got a lot of touching my toes and stretching my legs out stuff can we go with the upper body demonstration if there is such an opportunity? Yeah, I mean, you know, you can. Goes, like what you can do. Like that's actually very good. I think that's going to be one you know. of the like top three uh, <laughs> advice you could give. To. Yeah, yeah I guys, want to do that's what I wanted from the beginning. That's what I wanted. I love it. Let's go. <laughs> Yeah, you know what? It's 3 a.m. over here. Wow. And if I do it right now, I won't get sleep up. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And tomorrow you show up at work at what time? 8 a.m.? 9? Sorry, yeah, at sorry, tomorrow, what time you show up at work? I think I'm going to probably take a sick leave because I'm not going to wake up. <laughs> <laughs> That's not happening tomorrow. So there is no boss from your company that's watching this by the way asking talking about the the culture of the company what what you guys can tell about the culture for developers the what should it be for developers to grow professionally mentally what kind of culture do you personally feel is good for you and would advice for those upcoming guys who want to join an office what they should look after, what, should, what they should look for, what type of environment. Uh, I think anyone could start. Sid, your turn. All right. Um, OK, I'll, I'll shy away from giving like any advice, because it's like, I'm scared of giving career advice because it's like, so I don't know what works for me yeah, doesn't that, work for somebody yeah, else. No so it's, I don't know, it's just cryptic. Um, but I can tell what I like, like what I enjoy is that this 
like every if I look back, like every time I've grown a lot in my career, it's been when I had a lot of flexibility to chase weird rabbit holes, right? Like in a place where I'm expected to be super productive and efficient, like you know, where people ask, "Is this task worth it?" Right? Like if somebody says, "Is is accessibility really worth it?" Should we tackle that? That's a place that I I don't know. I I just don't get a lot done. But if I'm like encouraged to like build something that I think is high quality, like I believe that this is worth everyone's time, uh, that that's a that's the kind of environment that I really I really strive in. Like I'm the person who doesn't enjoy the zero to eighty percent, but then spend all my time in like the last twenty. That's my jam, and that's not a lot of places that enjoy the last twenty because it's like diminishing returns, I guess. Nice. How much of these qualities you let us share with Sid? What about that 80 percent and last twenty? You go, you, you girls feel the same? Anisha. Yeah, I mean, um, I kind of, uh, uh, I mean, if I, I feel like uh, I can't really work on a like uh, the uh, environment where uh, you just have to uh, like make it anyhow and without really getting into uh, like what should be the concept behind it and uh, I mean it sh should be fast but it shouldn't be you know like uh, don't care about anything just make some anything and just give it in, in a specific time I just don't like it and uh, apart from that, I, I really like taking uh, some of the time that I get in a day for uh, my personal uh, uh, personal learning so that each day I learn something new apart from my work thing, because anyway, I do that like uh, around like 10 hours a day. So I like taking a couple of hours for myself and uh, that I guess everybody should have that flexibility to do that because every time it's uh, it's at least for MNCs, it's very highly unlikely that you get to experiment with different different technologies out, out of the box. Uh, in startups, that you get more uh, more and more features coming up very you know very fast rate. But it's in MNCs, it's kind of unlikely. So, so it's it's nice to experiment with different things that you usually don't deal with in your work environment. So I kind of uh, enjoy it a lot. Yeah, I'd say I I go through phases where I I do want a lot of time to really dig into like the nth level of understanding something and figuring out what is the like absolute in my opinion best way to do x. Um and then other times I just want to write code and I just want to like produce and that's really exciting. So, like I'll do one for a while and then get bored and then want to do the other. Um but I think this kind of ties in really well with a question I saw somebody asked about, like for a junior dev, would they be better starting off at a big company or like a small startup? And um, I think in my experience with working for each, I think a junior dev is going to thrive more in a bigger company where they are given more time and there isn't this constant clock ticking where you better, you better be producing um, I think you kind of have to be at like a senior level to be able to just churn out code that works and you're not thrashing on PRs because somebody asks you to do something a different way or like you've got bugs because you're rushing. So that's what I think about that. Nice, nice, solid answers. I was so obsessed with the, with the, the speeches of yours. So many productive, effective, uh, valuable information, guys. It's amazing about it. Uh, there is actually a technical question we got one popped in the chat. So, what do you, what do we think about Swilty as compared to React? Uh, what do you think about Swilty as compared to React? Has any of one of you given it a try? Swig was asking that questions. I don't have any experience with that. I have not tried Svelte. I love React and I'm kind of in this mode right now where like I don't want to do anything else. So it could be great, but I don't yeah, really I was about to follow up. Do you even know what is 
uh, the first time I said Svelte, but yeah, now I know that the, the right pronunciation is Svelte. Svelte, thank yep. You. Yeah, thank you, Erin. Um, I'm learning every day. And that's because of you guys. Um, there are a lot of things coming up in chat. You guys, what you want to do? Because we got still 10 minutes left and five minutes. I'm thinking five minutes and then, then we go take a rest, dear audience. We're going to take a rest. We're going to do some exercises that we showed you. Um, maybe drink a cup of water with lemon, with different stuff in it to refresh ourselves. What you guys want to talk about? You got any ideas? Maybe you wanted to discuss something. Maybe you want to ask questions. I have a question for Sid. Um, so how do you guys uh, deal with the user experience research? Uh, com considering that you guys have a very small team, how do you deal with that? Um, the short answer is poorly. And like the longer answer is uh, we, we kind of work very transparently, openly. Like, I don't know, I think that's that works for us because like it's in the client side is open sourced and the product is like has a giant free tier. So we want more and more people to use it, which basically means we have way too many users. So we get a lot of visibility. So then anything that new that we're working on, uh, we get a lot of eyes on it, right? So uh, what we've started doing like a few months ago is like there's like always like a parallel feature flag. We don't build feature flags, we're not that smart. So we're just like, uh, right now I'm working on like profiles, an alternate version of the profile. So it's just available on a different URL. And then whenever I want some feedback, I either like DM people on Twitter that I want feedback from, or sometimes I'm like feeling brave about it. I just like post it, like here's a work in progress, right? And then people are kind enough to like reply with feedback. Um, that's really like our soup and it's like flawed and it's not, I can't even call it user research cause it's like, it's so biased based on like literally the people who already like you and follow you, give you feedback. Uh, but there's like, it, it gives us like a good early hunch about if we're in the right direction or not. Other than that, we just like really hope we get it right. And then when we actually do release things, we get, that's when we really get to know. Yeah, that's that's a nice approach. Um, yeah, <laughs> thank you. No, it's nice, nice. Yeah, guys, I'm gonna jump real quick. Um, wanna finish it up with some closing speech, some closing words. So first of all, really appreciate of you being here. Three of you are heroes, making it possible for everyone, for our team, for the audience. Uh, there are so many positive feedbacks, so many positive. Uh, questions, comments. Uh, I want you to understand that what you're doing is really special. Uh, I mean, I, somebody could argue what it takes to uh, talk at online conference. Many people do it, but even more people not do it. And uh, the thing that you give the opportunity for somebody to learn from your knowledge, are you sharing your experiences? I think that's really big, big here. And um, yeah, I hope to see you somewhere in the real world. And I hope to see you and hear from you. And uh, just enjoy your successes as you move forward in your software development journey. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. It's been a yeah, pleasure. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, it was nice meeting you guys. Yeah. Thanks for being like a really good hype man. Seriously. <laughs> I enjoyed that. Yes. <laughs> yeah, for real. Like yeah, let's yeah, imagine yeah. that let's imagine that nobody watching us. <laughs> okay, okay, guys, I'm gonna finish it. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, let's keep in chat. All right. Yep. Bye. 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 Nice to meet you all. You too. All right, guys. So we're gonna have a quick break because we want to just. Let our mind rest for the reason that we want to learn even more. And there are so many good speeches upcoming for you. Let's just have fun, refresh, and come back stronger in 
nine, ten minutes. All right. I'm going to leave this background anyway, so you're going to enjoy it because pines in the wood uh, and the fog, you can enjoy it anyways.
All right, all right, all right. And we are back, waiting for our next speaker. The next speaker is Mr. Um, Ladislav Navratil, Master in the Product Development App Building. Uh, check it out, guys. I'm going to add Ladislav to stream. Hello, Ladislav. How do you feel, sir? Hey, hello, everyone. Thank you for hanging me. Well, uh, it's a strange time, right? Uh, because we uh, it is. are streaming from our living rooms. Uh, but it's amazing to see how the community can uh, adapt and we can share the knowledge and experiences across the whole globe. So I'm pretty excited. Yeah, sure. It's something that we will remember forever. We already adapted quite well to Do you feel comfortable being fully online, like transferring to digital life more than, than before? Well, I guess it's it's new normal, right? We're all working yeah. um, remotely, partially. Right now, we're almost all of us on the full remote. It's new experiences. It has advantages, disadvantages. We have to adapt. That's everything we yeah, can sure. do. Where are you streaming from, by the way? Uh, it's my living room. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, the, the location in terms of... Ah, sir. Yeah, uh, I'm, based in, I'm, based, I'm based in Prague, in Czech Republic. So we have midnight right now. So it's also one uh, one the cool thing. I think I never discussed the tech that late with anyone, especially sober, you know. So I'm excited from it as yeah. well. <laughs> you got double latte, double espresso. Sorry? Yeah, a lot of Red Bulls. Espresso. Red Bulls is really? my thing. How many of them? Yeah, I think first is right now, but uh, I still have to survive yeah. till the Q and A uh, in two hours, you know. So it's still I think one more I will pop up. <laughs> got it, sir. Okay. I offer you to take this stage and present your material to the best of your ability. Perfect. How do you feel about it? Let's go. So again, hello everyone. Uh, it's really nice to imaginary see you uh, from my living room. Uh, how I said, it's the strange time, but I really think, wow, how the community uh, can adapt and basically keep working and keep fighting all the problems. And today, my talk will be about a similar, uh, similar word. It's the product development. It's also the environment where everything is changing. And basically, you have to adapt, and you have to be always better. So again, my name is Ladislav Navratil. I work as a CPO uh, in Nangu TV, as a company based in Prague, Czech Republic. And I'm also founder of the Unlim uh, IO, and will mostly speak about the second project of mine today. But first of all, mastering product development. So what is the product development? It's the first main question. It's a process of bringing new product to the market. And it's basically really challenging. It's, it has a full team of people who has to work on it to bring new something from the idea to something what the end users can use and it will bring them the value uh, and the joy. Every product development uh, contains a lot of roles. Uh, it doesn't matter if you are a small team or if you are a big team. It just means that uh, sometimes in the smaller team you have to one person have to take more roles, but all these roles are always there. First of all, it's product manager. Product manager is the CEO of the product. He's basically saying and seeing the idea, describing what we should do next and how it should be how it should be he has to speak uh, with everyone and trying to like put his vision uh, to everyone else in the process after that we have project manager uh, for us developers it's um, a little bit hard person to work usually uh, because we don't understand so much each other for project managers it's just the time everything is time and resources which they has to be handled and communicated to the rest of the world so they're really important for the product development because they're communicating, uh, basically taking inputs from you and bringing it to another parties. Like it can be management of your company or it can be the customers. So everything is keep on the track. And if there's some delay, they're the first person uh, who knows about it and can uh, prepare another parties that there'll be some delay and so on. UX and UI designers uh, is the right hand of the product manager. And they're basically taking from the words the thing and giving it the life, how it will look like actually, uh, and basically describing and finding the way how the user should interact uh, with the product uh, 
and how everything should, uh, should how look and feel should be. Product owner, it's basically the the person who is standing between product manager and the team. He's working much closer to the team uh, and more detailed describe the whole product. He's creating the use cases, uh, the user journeys, uh, and basically better better translating the idea of the product managers and UX, UI designers to the team. After we have someone, uh, if we are working in the agile teams, we have uh, some position uh, like Scrum Master, where basically just keeping the velocity of the team on the track, that they are taking care that all the team is working predictably. Uh, and basically, as a first person, they're like announcing that there'll be some issue or that there's something what we have to take care, uh, like a take notice on. <sighs> After it's us, right? Developers, uh, people who are actually building the, the end product. This is the biggest uh, part of the product development and the hardest because there is a lot of pressure uh, and every, a lot of things can go wrong. We'll speak about it. After really important parts are the testers. It's basically the first level of the our feedback. They are taking um, inputs from the product owners, uh, how the application should behave. They're building test cases. And after, they're checking the output of the developers uh, if it's how it should be. Uh, so this is the first feedback line you getting uh, the developer uh, get back the information if everything went correctly or not. And last but not least, there are customers. On the end of the day, every product is developed for the customer. It doesn't matter if you are B2B or in the B2C world, if your end customers are really the world from the street or it's some cor corporation who is paying for it. On the end of the day, the customer has to be the most satisfied in all this chain. And this is really tricky how to do it. Also, what is really important is how the development lifecycle works because it's really connected to these roles. So on the beginning, we have idea, basically what we want to create, after uh, we creating the user stories, we slightly describing how the application should behave in every state, what everything it should, uh, should be done. Uh, after we are putting the, the designs, uh, so we are giving basically the idea and getting visualized. Uh, we creating the UX, how the application uh, should work, how the user should interact with the application, where the buttons should be, how the navigation should work, really important part of the whole design system and how the whole application should look like uh, in the design world. Really important and really often uh, teams are skipping it, are prototypes. Uh, if you're doing the prototype, it's helping the developers a lot because they see how you think and how you like had its mind in the idea uh, how uh, the application will be interactive. with. And it's really big help for everyone. You can get the feedback as soon as possible. You can even do the user tests if the application how it's designed is correctly, because sooner you will get the feedback, uh, faster you can adapt on the changes and basically not spend resources for something, but after you will have to re redo. After prototypes, you, you're going to do the product description. Uh, which you detail it's basically a cookbook of your product. There should be described every single detail of how the application should behave. And after it's going to the one big black box and it's called development. And basically uh, there are so many uh, roles who are expecting what will come from the development. And it's really tricky uh, to fulfill uh, their expectations. And on the end, we're getting feedback from the testing, feedback from our customers, and we basically iterate all over again. We are enhancing our project and so on. But product development basically brings a lot of challenges. Uh, it's really problematic in communication. There is big pressure on the developer and a lot of expectations. Why? Because the chain of the roles and of the life cycle is so long. And the biggest time is staying in the developer world. So if you're communicating wrongly, basically someone expecting that it will be done in next week, but when you're not showing the progress, all the issues, you're not communicating all the obstacles, uh, there'll be always just uh, disappointed people and basically the work environment will not be pleasant. Because when you're going through all the life cycle, uh, the longest time is spending in the development and all the roles from the product managers to the, uh, to the customers, they're expecting that everything will work, uh, how they create the idea and uh, it can create really big issues uh, if, uh, the communication uh, is wrong. So how to do it, how to prevent all these issues that you will really work on something, you will work really hard, uh, you will do your job basically great, you will be a good developer, you will create everything, uh, everything how it should be, 
but you're not showing your progress enough or not often enough and in this time you will have troubles um, because another party is there expecting to see something after they see it in the longer time it's not by their expectations so they will start to be uh like disrupted and they would like to, to change something so first rule what you have to do is to show the progress show the progress as much as you can do it daily if it's possible more often progress you will show sooner the feedback will come expectations will be aligned but what does it mean to show the progress it's not so easy first of all you're doing on some application you're working on some code you have to create you have to build your application so you create the build you want to show it to someone so you have to upload it uh basically to deploy it distribute it uh to the parties who will uh who will check it uh after that so you have to have some uh, environment where you can uh, upload your application after you have to notify all the parties that you created some new build that there is something what they should, should check it out and basically ask them for the feedback but with the notification you should also create the release notes and just imagine that you are doing this work daily or weekly it's a lot of job you have to spend a lot of time with communication you have to write a lot of a uh, lot of text a lot of the lot of a lot of um, uh, release notes and another stuff but it's not ending by here right it's not ending that you're just saying hey uh here is it do whatever you want uh i'm working on another issues right now uh most important part is the collect feedback and it's much harder part than just to notify everyone and write the release notes because collect feedback is also really tricky you have to collect feedback with uh, your external uh, external parties and internal as well uh, so how is it normally working you know you have to again to, to be sure that everyone who you need feedback from uh, will actually give you the feedback so you have to uh, really force and check that everyone important gave you the feedback because on the end of the day if uh, for example you will write the chat hey give me feedback for this build and you will not get it yes maybe it was not your fault and someone else should have done their job but as a team you failed because you didn't get it on time and basically you have all these troubles again so how does it work you're asking for feedback from someone and someone is like just telling you yeah something it doesn't work so most probably you will ask for the ticket right because as a developer you you like to work with your queue of the task you don't like the switch from one to another you need some order and it's fine so you're asking to create a ticket but to create and give the good feedback is not that easy. You basically have to be pretty skilled to give you all the information. So let's say that the user create a ticket telling you, hey, go to fix it. And you start having questions, right? First of all, hey, can you give me some screenshot or some data uh, by which you can replicate this information? Uh, so you're asking, hey, uh, can you more describe how you do it? How did you do it? And basically to get this answer, the person on another side has to be really trained. Uh, and it's really, easier to do it with the internal people but think that you're communicating with the customers as well and other things which are really variable it's the data what the application is getting and they are changing in time they're changing by how the user is logged in what was the time when they were like co-working with the application what kind of um, data was actually uh, transferred uh, to the user and this is really hard to get from the normal users You'll maybe get it from your testing department, but in general, uh, there'll be a lot of troubles. Uh, so to give uh, and get the correct feedback, it's very hard. And on the end of the day, you will be just disappointed. After you would like to know if it's like uh, happening repeatedly and another data information, you will usually not get the answer for what you need. So you will try to do it by yourself, try to figure out how to basically put your application to this state that if it will broke, that you will be able to fix it. Uh, and with all these conversations, you are just more disappointed and let's continue uh, that the life with you living is not, is not pleasant. After that, you have your feedback, you have your tickets, you basically find out maybe how to, how to fix these issues. So you have to enhance it, fix the issues and iterate. And basically all over this communication start again. So you're getting feedback for every version. How we said, more often you do it, it's better because it's giving you, uh, the sooner feedback gives you, uh, you're not spending the, your resources uh, on something what you will change, uh, you will have to change anyway. So you iterating, there is iteration by iteration, a lot of work with communication, one ticket by another. Uh, one day, 
you are ready to deploy to production. You made enough of internal loops, and you basically some happy with some some version which you marking as is good to go to production, and you shipping it to the world, which is completely different uh, before where it lived uh, now because you were with the with the internal people, with the skilled people, with the trained people, how they should create tickets for you, how to describe and give you the feedback. Uh, but you're going to the environment which is much harder. There is much more conditions where the application is living in. And you're getting the same feedback by the users which are disappointed, by the users who doesn't basically uh, expect that the application works wrong. They expect that everything works correctly. But of course, bugs are happening. They're happening in the production. Uh, but it's much harder to get feedback from the end users because they are not so trained and you cannot ask for so many information uh, like of the internal people. For that reason, uh, I would like to introduce uh, our project, which is called Unlim. And it will help you with all these issues. Unlim uh, creates instant preview of your product. Uh, so you can all parties uh, within the team can see uh, how the application looks uh, in which state. It will allows you to, to share uh, and create releases within your team and even with your customers. So you can automatically notify everyone who is important that there is something else what they should check. It also creates the automatic release notes because it knows what kind of issues were closed and which version. So it will basically uh, notify all users what are the uh, solved issues and which issues are known and should not be reported again, which is also really important. And it's annoying in other parties when they have to report all over again and uh, issues which have already been reported. What is really important to say that Unlim works out of the box with your existing projects. And it basically collects the feedback for you and with all necessary data, we'll get to it. And last but not least, it uh, allows you to collaborate together uh, to, uh, to create the best possible product. So right now, I would like to show you the demo. So we'll launch uh, the Unlim application. It works on all possible systems, on the Windows, uh, Mac, uh, and Linux. Well, when you're turning on the Unlim, you will see your recent project which you have here, but we'll start with the adding of the new project. When you're creating the new project, everything what Unlim needs is the access to the repository. Uh, for that reason, uh, my friend prepared a long time ago some, uh, some nice application uh, in React, but Unlim will work uh, really good with uh, all another technologies. It's not uh, focused on the React per se. Uh, so you're putting just your URL of your Git repository, you're putting some uh some uh name of your project if the git is protected with username and password you have to fill username and password just uh be careful because this is shared with another uh with your team members they will never see it uh, it's uh, encrypted in the online server uh, but it will be distributed so what we uh what we recommend is to create a new new user uh, in your git repository with for example just read only access uh, but uh, we're also working on the SSH, a SSH uh, access and also to support GitHub and GitLab um, tokens. So you will be able just to share the access token and these access tokens can have all necessary rights. This will be announced soon. So after when you fill the, the Git repository, you're just pressing next, uh, the, uh, uh, the Git repository is being cloned. Uh, next step is to, to set the flows, installation flow and the build flow. Installation flow is basically the part where uh, application getting all necessary dependencies. Uh, so it can be npm install or you can like change it to, to yarn if you are uh, more used to it. Uh, build flow, you have to set the build folder basically when you will call the, the build script where the, where the answers will be, uh, where the results will be saved. Next step is the versions. Versions, basically every, almost every application uh, has multiple versions. Usually you have some development uh, environment and the production environment. So at least you have this dev and product uh, versions. This application, what I'm using here is really just a simple one. So we'll stay with just one version and I will show you on the bigger project how it can be used. Basically the version is just that you can use in the, in the flows. You can use the variables 
and the versions you basically setting the values of the variables and when you're building it it's changing the uh, the build uh, build command or, or installation command so it will allow you to to create multiple builds of the same commit uh, and see how is it done last but not least uh, you can share uh, your project with uh, with another members when you're done uh, the application brings you to the dashboard where you see the releases. Of course, there is no release yet, some recent issues, and the recent commits. So we'll start with the creating of the we'll start with the creating of the new new build and new release. So you choosing one of the the commits, you putting the release some numbers. So let's say that this will be zero point one number, and you filling the title and the description. So uh, this is the version for global summit demo uh, we're pressing save and right now with one click we can create uh, and basically see the instant preview uh, of the newest commit of the newest version which comes from the development right now we created the the release which is just the local draft it's not shared with anyone if you want to share it with our internal users we'll just hit the pre-release pre-release means that uh, your internal members will have access to it after that, there is possibility to release um, basically publicly, and all the customers who have access to your project will see it as well. Uh, also important is to say that basically right now, uh, what is happening? The Unlim is installing all necessary development tools after it's installing all, all dependencies of your application and creating the production build of your app. Uh, this is done just for internal users. If you will um, uh, invite the customers to the application, they will never have access to the Git repository. Basically, Unlim for them will not have access to the Git repository. It will never be cloned. They will never see the commits, but they'll be able to see the done builds. So first of all, we have to finish, finish the build. It takes just a while, depending on your size of the project. And also if you're running the application first time, because the first build is installing some, some development tools after that, it's always skipped this, uh, this part. So let's just wait a uh, little bit longer uh, when the application is built. Uh, so far on the dashboard, you will always see the, all the releases and also the open issues, which uh, will uh, will sh show you uh, just in the minute uh, how it basically can be created, what does it do for you, and so on. After uh, after dashboard, you have the preview when you have done build and you hitting the play. You, you basically will go to preview and we'll see the application how it's working, the list of all issues here, and of course the settings of the project where you can, for example, invite the members, uh, members, and other members to your team or even the external members which will not have access to the Git repository. So when the build is done, we have two options: we can play it and see it instantly, or we can deploy it to the server that everyone else will have access to already done build. When we're pressing build, we, we see the application. We can just close it to see it more bigger. And this is the application of my, of my friend. It's basically the, uh, the mine searching of this minefield. Uh, I have not good luck with this. So you can, you can play like that and basically enjoy the, uh, enjoy the game. Yeah, I suck in it, sorry. Uh, and when you will solve it everything, uh, you will get the treat. Right, so let's say that we are not fine with this version and we want to change something. So we're going to, to, to issues. If you will hold just control and click anywhere, let's say here, uh, it creates the issue with the screenshot with exact point where you clicked. And I'll say, uh, let's change the picture of the girl. Uh, I think uh, it should uh, have out as well. So we're creating the issue. Everyone can access the issue. Everyone will be notified. The new issue is done. And you can, of course, comment on the issue. So can you give me some, some options? And you can just create comments and like that. Automatically, it will be seen on the dashboard and also in the issue list, in the issue list here. So right now by one click we already get the information where is the issue with the screenshot with description title and so on but it actually does much more and we'll go back to it so uh, 
You can anytime play this uh, this build or you can deploy it just by hitting deploy button. It takes just a while. It's basically archive uh, all the build and deploying it to the server. So next time the users can just uh, by one click download it and it's much faster. It's like within seconds they can preview the version. So this is really handy when you need to collect the feedback from your customers or like from the wider audio. Uh, they don't need to uh, install any any development tools and so on. Uh, it would be a really lightweight application for them, and they can pre preview it. And also, when you when you playing the application, there is multiple things what you can do. You can see how the app is working in different types of the screens, uh, even television. So from the mobile to the big television screens, uh, you can zoom it by by yourself and see it. How is it working? And also, there is the present mode. So what does it present now? Let's say that we want to see it on the computer. We're hitting the present mode. And we can control the application here with, uh, different, with different design. Uh, when we, uh, we can uh, customize how it should look like. So for the presentation of your progress, you can, you can, use, this, you can use this mode. Uh, the presentation mode works for every type of the device and you can customize it for every device basically what should be around for the for the graphic and so on uh, so uh i will show you right now how is it working in a little bit bigger project than just this simple one uh when you come in here you see the list of the old dashboards list of the issues so you can check it out uh what is there the comments what is the issue about uh, and you can go to the releases and basically just easily download uh, the version if it's already shared with someone. And you can see that within a couple of seconds uh, you have it done. You can press play. And this is basically a television application for O2TV uh, where you can log in. Everything is working like on the television. And basically, you see all application. This app even uh, is controlled by the keys uh, because it's done for television. It doesn't have any any mouse cursor, but you can see that like whole app you can see immediately. And again, if you don't like something, you can just click and create an issue. So, uh, also, I can maybe show you the presentation mode for the big screens. Like television again you can completely customize it and really you can see that this is much better way how to present your work uh, to someone again it's fully working application uh, in these frames uh, which you can customize also you can open your application in the browser so when you see some build which you would like to i don't know uh, to more debug or something you can open it in browser uh, it uh, runs locally in your computer you can open the, uh, the development tools and so on. So in the issues list, you see all the issues here uh, on the one place uh, nicely. And, uh, and that's it. OK, but this is not everything. And especially about the issues, I would like to speak a little bit more. Uh, Important part is that when the user clicks and basically interacts with the application, we know much more. So it's not ending here. And we have something more to add, uh, some features which will come a little bit later. Uh, and they are much, uh, they're at least the same interesting, like what, what, is the, what is it doing right now? So first of all, when the user interacts with the application, we tracking we tracking his progress. Basically, everything what he do do when he creates some event like mouse move, mouse over, pressing some keyboard, or when the application do something, when is fetching some data, when is receiving some data, uh, when is it working and making some calculations. We all this uh, recording, and basically, when you click on this issue, we'll put this issue tracking together with it. So next time, when you will just come and you will see the issue that some new issue was uh, was founded, you will just hit the you will just hit the play, and the uh, and the it will be uh, shown to you exactly what happened. So you will actually see the application in the completely same state with the same data what the person who reported uh, the issue get it as well. Even together, uh, you will see the data what he received when he was logged in after something. Because we all taking it to the close environment and basically put your application 
to the same conditions with the same responses, with the same way how it happened to the user. Uh, there is also a new thing which is prepared, and it's that you'll be able to develop against this close environment. So you'll be able to connect your development tools, and you'll basically be able to, to debug it exactly with the data what you get. So this will, this will bring you instant feedback with all necessary data without any questioning, without asking, without creating the tickets for you. user will just click and you will get all this info, all this information uh, what are needed. Uh, so after that, it's not everything what Unlim does. Uh, Unlim recognizes your application. So it recognizes what are the components, what kind of components are used in your in your application. And when you will click on one component, we'll show you what kind of state the component can have and where everywhere is used. Thanks to that, uh, we can also create the component library. So on one place, without anything special, you don't need to set up anything. It will work out of the box. Uh, you can see all components in all states, how they are, and you can browse them, uh, browse through them. And also you will see the styles in your applications, which are used, what kind of colors are used, and that it will notify you that maybe you're using some wrong styles across the application or that you're using too many variables or too many values uh, or different proportion of the, of the grid uh, of, the, of your UI. But what will also allow you to do is to change in real time your application. So just imagine that you're asking for feedback from the graphic designer, and he not just will give you the feedback, but he can enhance the application by himself. So all these restyling things he can do without basically touching the programming for you. And don't forget that it all works above existing projects. So you, you don't need to set up anything. Uh, there'll be most probably a question about the pricing. And I'm really honored to, to tell you that all application is for free. Uh, Maybe we are uh, thinking about in the future to bring some paid version, but it will be for a large team and some advanced features. But what I showed you, it will be for free. So what is Unlim.io? Let's just a little bit recap, uh, uh, repeat. Uh, Unlim.io gives you instant preview of your application within your team. It letting you sharing the releases within your team or even outside of your internal team with your customers. Uh, it automatically creates release nodes because when you closing the issue, uh, it's connected always to some release. So every release will have the list of the closed and still open issues. So there will be known issues and uh, issues which were solved. It works out of the box with your existing project. Uh, it just need your Git repository and one time setup of your installation and build flow. And it collects feedbacks with all necessary data. And this is something what we're really focusing on. And we will bring more and more features uh, with, uh, with the issues and will enhance basically what it does uh, today. And last but not least, it's, it's really a tool which letting you collaborate together as a team and collect feedback from everyone, all important parts that you will be able to create the best product possible. So again, the re recapitulation. What is necessary to build and master the product development is to show the progress as fast as possible, as often as possible, and which Unlim grades perfectly for you because you don't need to do anything. You're just committing your codes to, to, the, uh, to your Git repository uh, and Unlim do everything for you. It allows you to collect the feedback to notify everyone that there is new release, that the feedback should be collected, and it can even force people uh, through the review, uh, through the review steps and it allowing you to really easily enhance and iterate all over again. And last but not least, basically this version is ready to deploy to production, which is also something what we're focusing on. So this is Unlim.io. Uh, it makes product development much better. And right now, uh, basically today, we're opening the public alpha. So you're able to go to unlim.io uh, to try it. So if you will go, if you will go to Unlim.io, you can download it for every possible uh, for every possible uh, platform. Just please be noticed that the Windows currently is just for read only. You cannot create the build, but you can share the build to the Windows platform, download it there, and run it. But you cannot build it there. It's something what we're working on. It will be possible in the future. Uh, and what I may be encouraging you, join us on Slack. 
uh, I had a lot of Red Bulls. I would like to, to chat with you. So just hit the Slack button or subscribe to stay updated because we're working hard on this. This is really today we are first time giving it basically outside uh, uh, outside to the world uh, for try. So it will be really awesome to have you uh, to help us basically build the product better, try it. Uh, let us know what you think uh, and let's take the next it. Thank you very much. Nice, 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 nice. Appreciate it, sir. That was actually a Red Bull base Cornwall. It's good speech. Uh, it was amazing, man. You did really Thank you good very much. Job. Thank you very much. You did a really good job, and I'm looking forward to see you on QA session. Awesome. And yes, and right now we're going to have a short break a couple of minutes before we're going to have our next speaker. So, yeah, let us all Thank you very much. Appreciate it. See you soon. And yes, guys, couple of minutes break. We're going to go back right here with new energy, new words, new stuff, new, new anything, anything you wish for. We're going to get back with it. All right, all right, all right. We're back. That all right is going to be our uh, significant thing, intrinsic characteristic that what we're going to do today. So the next speaker is Mr. George Carlson at. Yo, Abbott. yo, what's up, sir? What's hey, I'm just glad to be here. Appreciate it. I mean, yeah. I love the energy. <laughs> Thank you. I gotta yeah. be honest. It's a. It's probably. I don't know how late it is where you are, but it's uh It's, it's hard to get the energy at the end of the day. But I think I'm ready to bring it. I'm gonna. 
take it all from you. <laughs> I'm going to ship actually, you some coffee. <laughs> I'm actually not going to take it off. I'm going to give it back to our audience so they enjoy the sun and they listen to building your first GraphQL app with React. Am I right? That's right. I'm so excited. This is such a fun talk. I haven't given it forever either. So this is going to be a blast. Everyone's in for a treat. Yay. Yay. Let's go. You want to go? You want to start now? Yep. Let's do it. Go ahead, sir. All right. All right. Hey, um, this is building your first GraphQL client in React. It's also JavaScript too, right? But same difference. Uh, let's just jump in, eh? Hey, did you know that GraphQL is used by all these companies? Hmm? Did you know that? And a lot more. I just couldn't fit them on the slide. And did you know it is available in pretty much every major programming language, including all of these? It's a common misconception that GraphQL is a... Uh, like a tech, but it's really a specification for how we're building out RESTful APIs or this new standard for RESTful APIs. So the more you know. Da -da -da -da, burr -burr -durr. Now, before we get started, I just want to say a couple things. First of all, thank you so much for coming here. These e-talks are super hard to sit through, and I really appreciate you bearing with me while we chit-chat here today. And I'm just thankful and honored and humbled to be here speaking with all of you today. I love you all so much. If you want to follow along today, you can scan that little QR code or go to joecarlson.dev slash GraphQL. That'll take you to a page with all the resources in here as well. I don't think I can comment in the chat here, which I wish I could, but alas, I cannot today. Um, but go check that out. Anytime you see a little QR code, just know that that's going to take you to the resources. It's going to include videos, slides, links, resources, source code, whatever you need. I got you, baby. All right. Hey, what if you got a question? What do you do? Huh? Hit me up in the chat. I got the chat right up in the uh, little thing over here, the little doobly doo. Or I'm pointing. Am I pointing the right way? There we go. On the other side of here, right? Um, hit me up. Just hit me up. Ask me a question. I keep an eye on the chat here. I'm keeping an eye on you. I got you, baby. All right, we got you. Um, it doesn't disturb my flow. I will have time at the end for questions, and I will be available for a Q&A panel here in, I don't know, like an hour or two. Um, but who is this talk for? This is for people who are, you know a little about JavaScript, you know a little about React. I think we're pretty safe here at this conference. Um, but it's most importantly, it's for people who are interested in learning about GraphQL. I think there's two types of people that go to conferences. One, it's expert making sure they want to, like, they know everything about the thing that they already know about. And two, it's people who are interested in learning about if it's worth their time to learn this new piece of tech. So if you're interested in learning GraphQL or like kind of on the fence about it, with like whether it's with your time or not, this talk is for you. We're gonna talk about the pros and cons, how to build it, a little sample app, whatever. Um, but most importantly, none of that is for you. It's for you, it's for you. This talk is for you, even if none of those things are for you. I'm hoping you have a blast. I hope you learned something new about GraphQL. I hope you learned something new about React. And uh, great. Okay, enough babbling. Who the heck is this guy? Who's this guy? Who's this douchey dude with a man bun and a mustache talking at me about GraphQL? Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked. My name is Joe Carlson. I work for a little company called MongoDB. I'm a developer advocate and software engineer. It's great, it's a fancy title, just basically means I get to chat with developers like you. If you are interested in hitting me up at all, best place to get to know me is on Twitter. I also make videos on TikTok, I post this all on Twitter too, but if you wanna get a hold of me afterward, ask me questions, chat, whatever, hit me up on Twitter, that's the best place to do it. Again, link in the doobly-doo for all the resources here as well. And most importantly, if I say anything controversial here in this talk, please know it's my personal opinion, not the opinion of my employer, MongoDB. I love my job. I don't want to get fired. Please, please don't report me. It's, if I say, just just know, I'm trying to give you some cool stuff, all right? All right. What are we going to be talking about here today? A couple things. First of all, we're going to be introducing GraphQL for y'all. Next thing, I'm going to be talking about Apollo, which you maybe have heard about, but we're going to, we're going to dig into it today. And then we're gonna go through a sample app and show you to make queries and mutations using GraphQL, using real code. Hmm? Now we're talking. All right, let's just get this jump in, right? I feel like I've been talking for forever. Um, what is GraphQL? 
I don't know about you, but when I first started learning GraphQL, this is what I felt. It was a little intimidating. I didn't really get it. I heard everyone chit-chatting about it. I didn't know what they were talking about, though. But imagine this. Let's say you're working on an application, like a front-end React application, and you have an endpoint for your e-commerce store, uh, right? You have some user. You can get some recent orders from your user, and it returns an array of SKUs, okay? A SKU is like a short ID of an order or an, uh, a product. Okay, um, cool, great. You're showing that on the DOM, you've got your React thing, you're mapping over all these, awesome. But whoa, 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 whoa. We're front end application, we're developing React applications here. And it's never that simple. Requirements always change, product managers want different stuff. Now, what the, your product manager is asking of you is a hydrated list of orders. So instead of just the rate of SKUs, they want actual details about those orders. They want the order date and the name and the description and the price and the shipping date. Oh, they want all that information hydrated in that order. Uh-oh. Okay, so we're front-end engineers. We have to figure out how we're going to update this, this API. What are we going to do, huh? Well, uh, you go back to the back-end team and maybe, or maybe you are developing the back, maybe you're full stack, right? Um, but Another question remains, how do you actually change your API to reflect this new hydrated SKUs that you need to show on the DOM? Hmm? You could do a brand new endpoint, get hydrated recent orders, cool. Maybe you can call it something else, hydrated SKUs. Maybe you have a query at the end of it of your existing one that shows whether it's hydrated or not. Maybe you put a, a little option in the header. There's so many ways you could possibly do this, right? And but the, the point I'm trying to make, though, is with REST APIs, there's no one standard for updating and changing and mutating your existing APIs. And it tends to be a pain in the ass. And as React application developers, a lot of times we have to update and change stuff with the back end, right? Like we're requesting new information, we need new data, and it takes forever. Ugh, who needs it? REST, right? So as, as front end application developers, what we're doing on the front end, typically, we're making many, many separate REST API calls out to separate REST services, and all those REST services are hitting up other databases and data stores or whatever, right? And sometimes you have to wait for one, we have to, maybe I'll go like get all that list of SKUs and then maybe I have to go wait for it to come back and then I'll have to go hydrate it and then I'll have to go get some image information for it. And I may have to wait like three or four round trips before I can actually explain or show anything on the DOM for the end user. Ugh. Slow. I know people in here have experienced that. Let me know in the chat if you've had a similar situation at work. I know I have. Now, I think it's helpful to show the some of the difficult parts about REST and explaining the problems that GraphQL is solving. So GraphQL works a little bit differently. So instead of having to hit several different services using a RESTful API, what you're doing is hitting a single GraphQL endpoint, and GraphQL is responsible for hitting up those services for you. It's one unified standard for all these different services. It could be tons of different parts of your product domain, right? Different parts. It's responsible for getting what you need from a single endpoint. You just say, I want this, and it gives it back to you. One round trip, that's it. Anyone intrigued yet? Mm -hmm. I would be if I were you. This is pretty damn cool. Okay. So. Why would you want to use this? Let's jump in, baby. Let's jump in. First of all, it's declarative, right? Just like with SQL, right? You're declaring what you want, just like how Michael Scott declared bankruptcy. He didn't know how it worked. All he's doing is just saying, I declare this thing, I want it done, and he expects it to be done. In GraphQL, it actually works that way. So with GraphQL, you're sending over an object structured in the way that you want the information back. You can change or update modify anything back and you will receive it in the way that you are structuring your request. So if we had those hydrated numbers or those hydrated SKUs from before, all we do is just say like, give me these hydrated ones and the endpoint, structure the data we want back from that endpoint and GraphQL returns exactly what we need. How dope is that? That's dope, right? You can use multiple collections of data. Not You're not limited to one data set, not one service. Another cool thing about GraphQL, it is validated and structured. What do I mean by that? So typically with a RESTful API, you have no control over the data and structure of what comes back. But if you're, if you're writing a GraphQL endpoint, um, you get to control the data types that come through on the request, but also get sent back. 
And with JSON, typically there's a, it's hard to do because you're just getting strings. But now we have control over invalidating the type of data that's being requested from the front end. Um, oh, also, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Um, good time to mention this. So MongoDB, actually, we just released this. Um, it's a GraphQL endpoint that sits on top of your MongoDB Atlas cluster. And since we know the structure of your data and MongoDB documents are objects, we can automatically generate a GraphQL endpoint for you based on your data. How amazing is this, right? And it knows the exact data types of what you're doing when you generate that request. It generates all of the query and mutations, all the git posts, puts, and deletes you might need with a typical REST API for you automatically. I'm, what I'm showing you right now is exactly what happens, right? If you look in the upper or the, the right-hand corner there, it says generate schema. All you're doing is making a query and it hits generate schema and boom, you got a GraphQL endpoint made for you from scratch. If you're using MongoDB, it's so easy. Okay, so it can structure your data. MongoDB does this for you automatically. Amazing, cool, right, y'all? Um, it also facilitates collaboration. I've worked in large projects before. And what typically happens when you're doing a large project is, um, right, like with, with the example of the REST APIs, like my front end teams, they all needed different kinds of data. All, all the back engineers are always trying to keep up with their quests for changing requirements in the front end. But if it's all unified, you don't have to worry about that. All the teams are requesting all the data from all the services all in the same way. And they can exactly ask from the back end exactly what they need. So even if it slightly modifies what they need, it's super easy, right? You're just modifying that GraphQL request and bada bing, bada boom, baby, it works. You're done. Unifying all your endpoints, especially if you work for a large company and you have tons of different services managed by a bunch of different teams, they're going to have a bunch of different APIs. They're going to have a bunch of different documentation. If it's even up to date at all, who knows? But it unifies that under a single place. Amazing. Also, did you know API versioning is an anti-pattern in GraphQL? You can phase out old data, but um, what is actually recommended is just leaving the old data there and leave just and like expanding what it, you, is possible to be requested from GraphQL. API versioning, no more. We don't care, right? It's a layer on top of your API that makes accessing that data so much easier. Also, fun fact, did you know you don't have to write documentation anymore with GraphQL. What? Right? No more Swagger docs. What's cool about GraphQL is actually, this is one of my favorite features of it. It's something called graphical. Everyone mispronounces this. It's graphical, not GraphEQL. Like a graphical interface. Get it, y'all? Um, but you no longer need to write documentation. And the reason for that is because there is now a, uh, I'm showing you MongoDB generates this for you automatically. But with graphical, it shows you sample queries and you can make query requests in the browser. And if you look on the right side of the page, it has a documentation explorer. Over here, it shows you what you're writing and how to structure it and what it is and what it means, right? So the documentation is always up to date. You no longer have to do it and it self documents when you write a description for each of the endpoints and data types. Amazing, no more documentation. It's always live, it's always up to date and you can always access it. It's incredible, it's a super way, great way to use it. So that being said, it facilitates collaboration and makes documentation writing obsolete, but a common misconception is that it makes communication obsolete, it does not. You still have to communicate with teams, you still have to work with the backend teams, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but okay. Uh, also, it's super fast. Um, this comes with an asterisk, which I'll be getting to in just a moment, but it will speed up your development time, and also a customer's experience. So you will no longer be overfetching data. I know all the time I make API requests and I'm using maybe only a little bit of the data, right? I'm only using just an eensy beensy tiny piece of that data, but I'm getting sent just a massive amount of data. And the, the smaller you can keep your requests over the wire, the faster it's gonna get sent to a client, right? Like if you have a 10th of a megabyte versus a gigabyte, requests being sent over. It's obviously gonna be faster for that data to be sent over the wire to you. The other thing to consider too, with speed from a customer's perspective is no more round trips. Again, I've had this happen so many times to me, but I have to make multiple 
API calls, maybe they're dependent on each other, right? I gave that example of those, the hydrated SKUs. We have to get that SKU numbers. Then we have to make another request to hydrate them. And then we can come back and we get those images. And then we come back and then we can actually display that to the DOM. You don't have to do that anymore. You just ask for what you need for the single GraphQL request and it gets it back to you. Hmm? You got anyone's attention yet? I think, I hope so. This is pretty fucking cool. All right, so back to the asterisks. Abstraction always adds a performance cost at a compile or at like a at like a server level. So it's additional code your thing has to run through. It can make additional startup costs and it's additional maintenance costs. But if you're willing to deal with that, which it's honestly not that bad, and with MongoDB Atlas and GraphQL, you're just hitting a button. There's no maintenance, right? But like you do if you're that that is a concern you should take into account when adding additional piece of code to your servers. Okay. Bottom line is GraphQL makes working with your data ridiculously easy. It's so easy. All right, let's do a quick recap here. So what is GraphQL? Well, the first thing we discussed here today was we compared uh, REST versus GraphQL, right? We had REST, we talked about SKUs and changing those and those round trips and GraphQL being a unified way to access that data. Next thing we talked about is some of the pros of using GraphQL. And the first one was declarative, right? We're just declaring what you want. You don't care where it comes from or who gives it to you, but I just want this data. I want it in this way. And it's super easy to get that back. It's validated and structured, right? You can structure the data the way you want it to. Unifies all of your endpoints by facilitating collaboration. You don't have to write documentation anymore because you can use graphical, amazing. No more API versioning. And bottom line, hey, y'all, GraphQL makes working with your data ridiculously easy. It's incredible. It's a game changer. All right. So GraphQL, we covered basics here. Next up, Apollo. If you never heard of Apollo, that's okay. I'm going to tell you why you should know about it if you're interested in getting into GraphQL. So um, I want to do that by digging into a practical project. So I actually built a project. It's an Instagram clone called InstaPosts. I don't know if that's legal, but hey, I did it. Um, basically, you can upload, um, or it allows you to host images or like host show images on the web and give a little description to it. But it's hosted in a MongoDB database. And uh, it's got all the basic get, post, put, update, delete operations you're used to with a typical RESTful application. But now we're doing it with GraphQL. All the source code is available if you go to the little QR codes. But the stack for this is all in the cloud. The backend is all in the cloud. It's a serverless application. It's hosted at a MongoDB Atlas database in the cloud. And we're using a GraphQL endpoint hosted on top of that database in the cloud on MongoDB. On the client side, all we're using is Apollo with React. All right, so Apollo. We still haven't dug into it yet. So let's jump into just a brief introduction of Apollo. Um, first of all, Apollo was born from the ashes of the Meteor project. So it's the old Meteor team putting it together. I don't know if anyone here has used Meteor. I got burned by it when it fell apart, but Apollo was incredible, right? And what Apollo does is it actually, it's a, a wrapper for your front end components. And it doesn't care what you are. You can use Angular, Vue, React, Ember, Backbone, it does not matter. Um, but it allows, it structures and validates your queries and also does some caching for you on the front end. It just, Bottom line, it makes working with GraphQL and React so much easier, right? It's responsible for kind of sending and receiving that result and then making sure all of your children components in your React application actually get those updates. It can automatically update state. Let me know, has anyone here ever used Meteor or Apollo or GraphQL? I'd love to know. All right, again, makes working with GraphQL so much easier. Just take my word for it. I've tried making this demo without using Apollo and it makes talking about it so much harder. So that's why we're gonna be using it today. And if you're new to GraphQL and you want to try to play around with it with React, I would totally recommend starting with Apollo. It's gonna make your life easier, just trust me. So how do we actually set up Apollo with GraphQL and Atlas and MongoDB Atlas? Well, glad you asked. So first thing we're gonna do is import Apollo from NPM, awesome. And we have some config files here. Uh, and then next thing we want to do is connect to our GraphQL endpoint hosted on the cloud with MongoDB Atlas. All we're doing is basically saying we're passing a token over to authorize it. And we have to pass our stitch ID through it. So it's basically that endpoint that I have there is the GraphQL endpoint, right? 
So that's our single unified endpoint. You're just, you sell Apollo. This is the one place to follow, find GraphQL and send everything to that GraphQL endpoint. And we're doing an HTTP link, just saying it's an HTTP endpoint we're connected to. And then we're instantiating a Apollo client there at the very bottom. Awesome. That's, uh, if you can see my mouse there, there we go. Okay. And we're doing some in-memory caching here too, which is kind of cool. Uh, okay. So this is the interesting part though. So we told Apollo where our GraphQL endpoint was. We had some config files. Next thing we want to do is connect it to React. So we have our React application and Apollo actually has React hooks built in the provider, which is very cool. So we have our GraphQL endpoint. Ah, okay. Oh, this part, we already saw this part, top part. The bottom part here is the interesting part. So we have our React application we're trying to initialize. And if you're used to using Redux, in the in React, you're probably used to seeing this, right? The Apollo provider wraps our React application, so all of our children components have access to the React hooks from Apollo. That's going to allow us to do queries and mutations from any React component and update the work in there, right? Update state. Okay. Whew. Awesome. So we wrapped our React application in a Apollo provider and connected it up to our GraphQL endpoint. But let's do a Quick recap here of what we just discussed. What is Apollo? Well, the first thing we discussed was uh, introduce our app that we're going to be working with today, InstaPost. It's going to be using MongoDB Atlas on the back end with a GraphQL endpoint hosted on Atlas as well. And then the front end, it's a static front end. We're using Apollo and React. Next thing we did was we discussed how it works, right? Apollo is a wrapper that works with any front end framework, and it basically makes working with an updating state for those components much easier. Then we set up Apollo with GraphQL and Atlas, right? We just tell it what that GraphQL endpoint is. And then we instantiate a brand new Apollo client. Amazing. And then we connected Apollo to React. And once we've instantiated that Apollo client, all we're doing is we're wrapping our React components in the Apollo provider. So all the children components have access to all of those React hooks that allow us to update state and make queries and mutations for that, for that component. All right, cool. So talked about what is GraphQL. We talked about Apollo. Now for the fun part, let's talk about making queries. Let's talk about mutating data. So, right, there's two ways, like we're used to get post, put an update, get post, put, get post, update, and delete. <laughs> Those are hard to say, um, but with, with REST. But with a GraphQL, the only thing we have is queries and mutations. Queries is basically the equivalent of a get, and mutations would be a put, update, or delete. Anytime we're like changing the data, we just call it a mutation generally. All right, so this is the fun part. MongoDB automatically generates all the queries for you based on your schema by clicking a button. Let's see that again, all right? So you can see the all of the mutations automatically generated for you once you generate your schema. And you can see all your queries, right? It tells you what data you have access to query from your database. So easy, right? Hit a button, it literally does it all for you. Okay, so if you wanna actually construct a query, what does that look like? <laughs> so the first thing you wanna do is define whether it is a query or a mutation. Next thing you want to identify for GraphQL is what are you, what kind of data are you asking or do you want to query? So I have a collection called InstaPost. Each document in that collection is a single image from my InstaPost gallery. And then the next thing you need to define is structure what you actually want to do with that data. So I want to get the unique ID. I want to get a description and my React application needs the image URL because those are the three things I need to display and work with that data correctly, right? So that's pretty easy, right? You're just saying, this is a query. This is what I want. And these are the things I want to do with that data with my application. That's all you need. So if I want to actually make a real query with Apollo and React, how do I do that? Um, so same thing, right? We have our, we're defining a React component here. We're going to bring in our React hooks and we're going to define our GraphQL query. So we just constructed it in the last slide. So I'm just going to copy paste that in there. I'm using a package called GraphQL tag. It basically allows you to just do a string tag, a string literal and copy pasta your GraphQL query in there. Bada bing, bada boom, baby. It just works, right? Next thing we have our React component here. And what we're doing is using that React hook from Apollo 
to make a query for us and we pass through that GraphQL tag that we defined up here. So we're just pasting that into the use query. And what's happening every 500 milliseconds or once every half a second, it's querying to GraphQL using this query. And then Apollo has three states it returns back for you. It's either loading, it aired out, or it returns data. And we can conditionally show data in a React application based on what returns from that GraphQL endpoint. Everyone with me so far? Any questions? Remember, I keep an eye on the chat over here. Let me know if you have any questions, all right? Um, but let's take a look at this in action, huh? Let's, take, let's see what happens. So I have booted up my application here. You can see it's making a post request every second. It's querying every half, of, half a second, every 500 milliseconds. And it's returning a complete list of my Insta posts with the data I requested, right? ID, description, and image URL. Let's see that again. So you can see there every half a second, you see that new network request going out to my GraphQL endpoint. And you can see all the data in there with all of the Insta posts that I'm requesting in the data structure I requested from GraphQL. Amazing. That's it, right? And it's being displayed on the DOM. It's just mapping over, boom, bada bing, bada boom, baby. Just works. All right. That's amazing. Making queries is so easy. It make It's so easy. Okay, so let's do a quick recap here. With GraphQL, how do you make an effective query? Well, um, ah, I think I'm running out of time here too, but uh, uh, MongoDB automatically generates all the queries for you automatically. And if you did want to construct one, right, to hit, hit up your endpoints, you have to know three things. You have to know whether it's a query or mutation. You have to do, say what you want to query, and then you want to say what data you want from that thing that you're querying. And then we showed how to actually make a query with GraphQL, Apollo, and React. Oh, right. We're using the use query Apollo React hook. We're querying every 500 milliseconds. And we're just passing that query over. And Apollo handles all of that for us automatically. So we just pass that query through. Apollo knows where the endpoint is. It sends it over. And it has three different states for us to conditionally show or hide that data, right? Loading, error, and data. Easy. Okay, how to play with error is someone asked. Yeah, error, I mean, you can always use the React or the error boundaries, which is always good with React. You should always have those. Um, but as you can see here, I'm just have a simple React component that shows there. I mean, you just wanna make sure that the user has a good experience if something happens with any anything in flight, right? Either you can go, fall back to caching data, but you just want a friendly error message to pop up. I just have one that says encountered an error and it passed the error through. Probably not super user friendly, um, but for the sake of this demo, it's super easy to whip up, right? All right, last but not least here, mutating data. This is the hard part. Um, making queries is pretty easy. Mutating data is slightly harder, but I do want to show it here today. So if you wanted to actually construct your own GraphQL mutation, same thing applies here, right? You want to say whether this is a query or mutation you're making to this GraphQL endpoint. Today, we're going to be mutating. Next, you can make an operation name. Think of this as a function name like you would have in JavaScript, right? Like it, it describes the mutation that's going to be happening. So you can reuse it. It basically just makes it easier for humans to understand what this query is actually doing or how it's being used. So I have a mutation. I'm calling it create post. It's going to be pretty clear this is going to be creating a brand new Insta post. Okay. Next thing you want to do is pass over arguments. Just like you would with JavaScript functions, you're passing over arguments, right? Once you declare the function name, right? So we're this is the data you want to pass through in order to create a, a brand new post, right? Because you have to supply the image URL and the description at a minimum in order for graph or for your server to know what to do with it, right? And that's what we need to save in our MongoDB database. And a little fun part here too, you can't do this in JavaScript, but the bang at the end of your query determines whether or not it's optional. So the bang means it's required. We absolutely need this because you can't create a post with no argument data being passed through it. It basically helps validate that the data is going through the way that you want it to. So this is the next thing you have to just supply is the mutation type. So this is generated for you by MongoDB Atlas or like on your GraphQL endpoint. You can find out what these are by going into graphical and seeing all the different mutation types. We have one automatically generated called insert one Insta post, and it takes the, the data that we need to pass through to it, which would be a description and image URL. Actually, in this part too, 
this is the data that you actually will be returned back to. This is like the receipt that it went through correctly. So it says like, once I've inserted it into the database, please supply me back with the, Im the ID, the description and the URL. And that's it. That's it. So let's look a quick little recap here. I'll show this later on at the end here. But let's actually do a real, uh, a real ass mutation with the React component. So we have our React components again. We're bringing in React. We're bringing in that Apollo React hook. Instead of using use query React hook, we're using the use mutation. And we're going to bring in that GraphQL project again. So we're going to just be pasting in that GraphQL mutation that we just constructed in the last slide, right? The same one. And then we have our create page here. So this is our React component. I just split it up because I ran out of room. That's the same thing here, right? And we have a little form. And on submit, all it's doing is taking data from the form and submitting that to the add post function. So once we do that, it, we just, it fires off that, um, that add insta post. That's all it does. Super easy. So we're doing that use mutation and we're pulling out an add post in here, right? And then once we invoke that function on submit, React will use that React hook to fire that data off to your GraphQL endpoint and automatically insert that data into the database for you. That's it, baby. That's that's it. All right. Oh, I can't remember. Oh yeah, on submit, then it does the add post. Okay, cool. All right, so let's see here. Let's uh, let's take a look at this in action on the network. So on my new post here, I'm gonna paste an image URL and a description, and I'm gonna post it to a GraphQL endpoint, and I'm gonna try to find that GraphQL endpoint, that post in our network. And you can see here, I found our create post. You can see that data being sent over the wire to our GraphQL endpoint. You can see that, boom, right? It's our request URL to that endpoint that we defined from our Apollo provider. We're saying this is our single endpoint, send this query over. This endpoint will know what to do with this when we structure the data in this way. And in fact, it does. You can see that it shows up on the uh, the thing, the, the main page, the index, right? Pretty cool. Anyone impressed yet? I hope I've impressed at least one person here. I hope at least one person feels impressed. I'm impressed. Okay, so let's do a recap here um, of the whole kit and caboodle. What is GraphQL? The first thing we did was to discuss the difference between REST and GraphQL, right? Next thing we discussed why you should be using GraphQL and some of the things we first discussed was it being declarative. As a front-end engineer, we don't have to care where it's coming from or how it works or what database or service it comes from, all we say is, I want this data in this structure, get it back to me. It's validated and structured. It unifies all API endpoints, amazing for huge teams. You don't want, no longer have to write documentation. Graphical will change your life. No more API versioning. It makes working with data ridiculously easy, everyone. Listen, it makes it so much easier, especially if a huge team with a ton of different backend servers, it will change your life. All right, next thing we did was discuss Apollo. And the first thing we did was open up by talking about my project, InstaPost, and it is a MongoDB database on Atlas. With Atlas, you automatically can click a button that generates all of your GraphQL schema and an endpoint for you and graphical uh, just instantly for you. And we have a static front end that uses Apollo and React. We talked about how Apollo is a wrapper and it doesn't it's agnostic to what framework you're actually using. For this project, we actually used React, duh, this is a React conference, but you can use Vue, Angular, whatever, it doesn't matter. And we set up GraphQL with Atlas, and all you really have to do is just paste in your GraphQL endpoint and instantiate your provider with some additional options in there if you want. And then we connected Apollo to React, and it was super easy. All we did was React wrap our React, our Apollo provider around our React application, so all of the children component have access to the React hooks and can share an update state. Woo! All right, making effective queries. We made our first query here, right? MongoDB automatically generates queries for you. It's incredible. It's a game changer. Click a button. We know the structure of your data, right? If you hit that button, it automatically generates a GraphQL endpoint for you. If you do want to construct a query, all you have to do is discuss whether it is a query or mutation. You have to say what the data you want to query, and then you want tell it what data you want back from that data type. Oh, all these are yellow, who knew? Um, and then we discussed how to query a, with GraphQL and Apollo and React, right? We use the use query Apollo provider React hooks, and we just pass through that query to the use query React hook, 
and it automatically returns data in three different states, which we can conditionally show either loading, error, or data. Woo! All right. Oh yeah, security. Yeah, we can talk about security. MongoDB, so you can totally secure anything. You can do um, like uh, user permission, so only you have access to do certain things, or only certain users can do um, queries. And some people can do mutations, or I can conditionally only update my data, and I can't update your data of the same type. You can totally do that. You can also make it work with multiple MongoDB databases and collections, so it doesn't all have to be in the same MongoDB collection. Okay, and then we talked about mutating data. So we can talk about how to construct a query uh, or a mutation, excuse me. Um, GraphQL mutations with Apollo and React. Yeah, and then we talked about how to do it. So instead of using that use query provider, we're using the use mutation Apollo provider and it creates a React hook for us that we can just create a function and we just pass through the data that we need in order to create that mutation on the back end. Or in this case, it's a post, right? This is a GraphQL equivalent of a post. All right, cool. I'm wrapping up here. I think I got a couple minutes left. Um, so if I've inspired anyone in this audience or watching this talk today to want to learn GraphQL, how do you do it? What do you what what's the best way to become a GraphQL expert? Okay, this is gonna suck. I'm so sorry, but I recommend building it. Like if this talk has inspired you to want to become a GraphQL master, amazing. Um, what I would actually recommend you do is clone the project I built, the Insta clone or the Insta post project, which you can be found here, right? At joecarlson.dev slash GraphQL. Uh, that has linked to the source code. I'd recommend cloning that, setting up your own GraphQL database in the cloud and messing around with it. Um, typically, if I want to learn a new piece of tech, I'll start with something that works and I'll start adapting it based on the needs that I have. Right? So, like, you can just, like, but get it working. Play around with it. Get in there. Get dirty with it. Um, if you want to, totally set, totally get that hooked up. Um, if you want $100 in free Atlas credit, so which is the MongoDB cloud option, um, use Joe or use code JOEK100 or scan that QR code. There's information in the thing about how to get that too. Um, I've never gone over the free credits on MongoDB. It's pretty generous for the free tier. There's always a free tier, but hey, it's always good to have a little bit of buffer room, baby. You know what I mean? Just in case, who knows? Maybe you have a project that blows up and you need it. Then you'll be thanking me, okay? Uh, here's some additional resources. GraphQL docs, Apollo docs, source code, a MongoDB GraphQL docs. You should totally check that out too. Um, lastly too, I'm just gonna do a quick plug. If you want to learn about MongoDB, there's a free university course. You should totally check that out. It's incredible. We have a new, brand new developer hub. It's got blog posts, I Twitch streams, YouTube videos, every language you want, tutorials, whatever. And lastly, if you have questions or things about MongoDB, you want help with your MongoDB project, check out our MongoDB community forums. We'd love to have you there. It's incredible stuff there. Um, okay, let's see here. Any other questions? I'm... Uh, Looking through the thing here, amazing. Been working with GraphQL about a year, impressed. MongoDB security, we talked about that a little bit. Okay, 12 hours, awesome. Favorite talk so far, love it. Um, let's see here, I'm not quite done, Pedro. I'm almost done here. Um, <laughs> and then I'll sign it over to you. But if anyone wants to follow me for more, hit me up on Twitter. These are all my contact information. Again, all the resources are in the little doobly-doo. Um, I, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much, everyone. I love you all so much. Ah! Thank you. Okay. Pedro. Oh, you're still muted. Oh, he's gone. <laughs> he's back. I'm back, baby. He's back. Baby uh, is going to be a favorite for all of this. <laughs> It's new for me. I love doing it. But we're gonna declare the bankruptcy. Yeah, I, I felt so bad actually right now because I wanted to go with. We're gonna declare bankruptcy. I mean, that thing was a blast, man. Oh, love the it. Energy, yeah, the outspokenness, the, <laughs> energy, the style. I the feel look. like a lot of tech people don't bring the energy in their talks, and it sucks. It's kind of it's a dry subject. So I just try to have some fun with it, you know. I think you're a main competitor of late now night show host. Uh, <laughs> any of them will work. <laughs> I'll take I, it. <laughs> I'll 
I'll take it. Hey, oh yeah, by the way, I do Twitch streaming. I'm Twitch streaming tomorrow on the MongoDB Twitch at noon Eastern everyone, time. Everyone, everyone jump in. Um, otherwise, yeah, I, I make funny videos on TikTok and Twitter, so you should totally come check that out there too. I don't know if I can post Definitely it. get those gifts showing up when uh, somebody donated. Yes. Uh, those memes are from the office. I oh, yes. Yes, they are. Yeah, you got that reference. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I was like, a couple, yeah. couple people in the audience got them too, which is always good. Sometimes jokes fall. That's fine. You just <laughs> got a couple more queued up in case something fails. You know what I mean? We're going to tell Vucha baby girl. <laughs> <laughs> this one. Oh, I love it. All right, Joe. So I'm waiting at the Q&A session for you because I feel it's so energetic, so positive. That energy is just over oh. the and, You can't tell uh, by blushing. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm super excited. If anyone wants to ask me more questions too, I will be in the q and I don't think I'm going to be able to answer a lot of the questions here in the chat here, but hit me up on Twitter. I'll be over there. I'd love to help field those if for anything I didn't have time for. I'm going to choose the best questions for you, especially specifically. I'm going to send it out as a screenshot. So you're going to print it. That's right. It. I'll include it in my next talk, yeah. too. <laughs> yeah, love it. Roger. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone. You're so great. I love you all. You're the best. Good luck, everyone. I love you, too. That energy. <laughs> Bye. All right, all right, all right, guys. Yeah, I mean, I'm blown. I'm blown away by the content, by the energy. That was amazing talk. Five talks so far. Great. Super impressive. Best talk ever. Exclamation marks. Guys, I agree with you, but we're also going to have an upcoming skip speaker that goes by the name Colby Fayak. And just a couple of moments. So do you appreciate this time? that we are together on the stream and the Kobe Fake is ready to rock and roll and give you even more energy, even more uh, valuable content. I feel like that at least, but yeah, everyone has its own style. So you can't compare, you can compare for real, but Kobe. Hey, how's it there. going? Can you hear me? Yeah, 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 we can hear you well. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm excited, man. I mean, there's so yeah. much things going on right now, and uh, you just need to speed up with pronunciation of speakers. That's what I'm doing right now. Yeah, you know, it, it can be it can be tough. Yeah, with the following of the content that you guys do, that's great. And, you ready to uh, roll? Yep. Well, I'm not. I might not have the same energy as Joe. I'll bring as much energy as I can. As I said, everyone has its own style, yeah. and everyone finds it for himself. Absolutely. What he enjoyed the most. Cool. Yeah, but that was nice, and I hope you're gonna blow it up. I appreciate it. Appreciate it, sir. Awesome. I'm leaving this scene. All right. Thank you. All right. Hey, everybody, stop what you're doing and put down the JavaScript. We're going to talk about how you can level up by learning the fundamentals of web development. So who am I? I'm Colby Fayok. I'm the one hugging BB-8 and Kylo Ren over there. I work on the UX and front end side of things at LM84. You can find me pretty much anywhere on the web by just Googling my name as I'm the only one in the world. So we're going to start with a story. Here we have two people at the beginning of their career. On the left, we have Mark. He's a jolly fellow. He likes the color red. And we have Luke, Mark's brother, more of a green kind of guy. Both of our friends are switching careers. They're giving coding a try. So they try to find a boot camp to dive right in. First, we have Mark. Mark found this cool boot camp that promises to make you a JavaScript ninja. Better yet, it only takes one month. They make sure to teach you the most popular frameworks available right now. So this will make you super marketable. Then we have Luke. Luke took a little bit different of a route. He found a course that takes a little bit longer, but he'll know how to build a whole website with just HTML and CSS. He'll also learn a little bit of JavaScript, but they didn't promise any specific framework. Both of our friends decide to submit their resumes for a job at 1UP Inc. It's a junior front-end dev position. The description for both of them is a near-perfect fit. Luckily, they both get a callback for a code challenge. Once they get on the call, they find out that their task is to take this mock-up and transform it into a website. They'll have about 45 minutes to do this. After they'll talk a little bit about their work. Not too bad, right? 
First up is Mark. This is easy for Mark. He just got out of a boot camp where he learned how to use React. And the job posting says they want React, so that's perfect. So then he'll build a challenge with React. He can also use some CSS and JS. He recently read a little bit about that. And it should be pretty easy to integrate for a quick win. Then we have Luke. He again decides to take a little bit different of a route. The website looks pretty simple, right? So he thinks he can do it with some just plain old HTML. Layer on a little CSS, and it should do the trick. So let's compare solutions. So Mark didn't get super far. He only got the title. Luke seemed to get pretty far. It's not perfect, some mismatched colors and sizes, but it's a good start. So what happened with Mark? Let's just say that Mark didn't have a great interview. First, Mark tried to get a React app going. He forgot that he needs to configure a package manager to install React. All right, so moving past that, he thinks he figured it out. He was able to quickly look up an example, and he can add some external scripts to load React. Now he can get moving. But dang, that can't load in the browser. That's not native JavaScript. Great. So he figured out that he, he can include Babel. And with that, he can add the Babel type to the script tag. And now he can use JSX. He's in business. But, oh, man, we're still getting an error. Let's check the React docs a bit quick. All right. He needs to wrap it in create element. Awesome. So that should work. And it does. And now we can start getting moving on the website. So Mark adds this header and it renders. We're making progress. But then he realizes he needs to add some styles to make it look right. He can't install it from NPM, so he needs to find an external link again. But oh no, by the time he actually found a solution, he ran out of time. He spent so much time debugging that first setup that he never actually had a lot of time to build the site. On the other hand, Luke broke out his favorite text editor, similar to what Mark did, but instead of trying to deal with packages, he just started with some basic HTML. To create a header, he knew he was able to throw together a few HTML elements. Use the header and nav tags, nice and semantic. For the content, use the main tag, an image tag, and some text. Figured he can use some CSS to position it all correctly. So he did. He added some styles to make it look right. Flexbox makes this nice and easy to do. So he flexed the header, flexed the body, flexed all the things, and he was good to go. And with all that, Luke ended up with a lot more progress than Mark. So of course, Luke lands the job. He had something to talk about in those last 15 minutes. He went over why he chose Flexbox, why he used the header and the nav tags. He talked about what he would have done next to fix some of the styling. On the other hand, Mark was still stuck at the beginning. He didn't have much to talk about. He was stuck fumbling starting the project in the first place with React. And the truth of this, this story is only slightly exaggerated. I didn't use real names or likeness, but this exact situation happens quite often. Of course, someone super experienced with React might not have hit those same roadblocks, but I've personally sat through interviews watching candidates struggle with these exact same types of challenges. And this situation isn't React unique to React. This is pretty much any JavaScript framework, but job seekers come into an interview wanting to impress everyone by using the coolest tools. And I don't, totally don't blame them, but they're really only setting themselves up for failure. So while every company, every candidate, and every in interview are each unique, there's a common thread. It's easy to want to learn the new exciting tools and jump right in. And that's not necessarily even a bad thing. Part of why I love what I do is because this stuff is a lot of fun. It's the kind of thing that keeps me inspired. But dealing with an interview is stressful in the first place. And while not every interview is going to wind up like that, we can set ourselves up with a good foundation, which will help us have a better understanding of the tools we're working with. So we're going to talk about how you can level up. We're going to talk about why these things can actually make a difference and learn some cool tricks along the way. So we'll start with HTML. I would imagine most of us have at least actually heard of HTML. So what exactly is it? If you didn't know, it stands for Hypertext Markup Language. It's the essential building block of all websites. And it has been since probably before most of us even heard of HTML. A lot of us probably don't have to write this much by hand anymore, given the React and other UI libraries kind of do it for us. But this is kind of the basic skeleton of a web page. We have our doc type, HTML tag, head, and body with a simple H1. We're probably more familiar with this, though. The actual skeleton of our page gets abstracted away. We define our page by only the content. So instead of our HTML in the head, we might only see the H1. The cool thing about React and JSX, though, is we can really write any HTML we want. For the most part, it's going to be valid. This isn't groundbreaking, but this is just setting the tone for some of the points ahead. But ultimately, this JSX gets compiled down to HTML, the same HTML that we can write by hand. We just now have tools that can provide us with a way to generate it more efficiently. So that Gatsby app that you're running, yeah, that's just creating a bunch of HTML. Next, we'll talk a little bit about CSS. 
A lot of us probably know this as the magic that the web design team makes. I've actually heard backend developers say they're afraid to touch it. So what exactly is CSS? CSS stands for Cascading Style Sheets. We have a simple example here. We're setting the color to red like Mark's outfit. We change the font size and making all the letters uppercase. And bringing this into React, we have a few different options. Personally, I'm still a fan of writing my CSS outside of my JavaScript. I like to supercharge it with SAS, but I know a lot of people like to write their CSS in their JavaScript, and there's a ton of libraries out there to do it. But similar to the HTML we saw before, this all gets compiled down into our basic CSS. Whether it's SAS or CSS and JS, regardless of the type of tool we use, this is ultimately what we get. The only difference is how it's served, whether it's an external link, embedded, or inline. A lot of this might not be new for people, aside from the gasp I heard when I said that I write my CSS outside of my JavaScript. It's important to understand the foundation and how these basic things work. Like, did you know that browsers actually fix your HTML for you? This can be really helpful, especially if you're starting, but it can also be really confusing if you don't understand what's going on. Like here, you can't nest a div inside of a paragraph tag. Particularly, you can't nest another block-level element inside of a paragraph. So the browser tries to fix this for us, but this actually messes up our intent. We were expecting that div to be purple, but because the browser fixes it, it pulls that div outside of the paragraph tag, and the paragraph style no longer cascades. For that in CSS, the vertical padding is actually relative to the width. Ignore the jankiness while trying to show an animation here, but we can take advantage of this little quirk. Sometimes our best option when we're building things out is to use a background image. But the tricky thing is with this is we can't scale the width and height easily like we can an actual image. Instead, what we can do is set the height to zero. Then we use the width divided by the height in percentage form to set a vertical padding. So this way, no matter the width, the height will always keep the correct ratio. So what's the point I'm trying to make with all this? Well, those are handy to know. Those two things alone won't make you a better developer. But what I'm getting at is understanding your tooling from a more fundamental level will help you level up your game. So how can we do that? The first thing we can apply this to is SEO. Many of us have probably heard of this in one form or another, but might not understand what it is. SEO stands for Search Engine Optimization. It can be super complex with keyword research and strategy, but we're gonna focus on the stuff we can actually control as developers. So our ultimate goal with SEO is to present our content in a way that makes it easy for search engines like Google to understand. The most important thing here is the content, but it also includes the tags you present that the metadata you use to make sure it looks right in the search. Most websites have a healthy mix of different ways for people to get to their websites. Some might be ad traffic, others social media, but there's also people trying to look for something in a search engine who can potentially find your site at the top of the list. This helps bring in more traffic, which could help more could help your website and company grow. Like here, aside from free code camp article traffic, my website pulls in the most from organic search. Of course, my mod modest blog doesn't get the most traffic on the internet, but how you create your pages matter. For example, if your website is a bunch of images with no alt tag or text anywhere, how is Google going to be able to know and understand what your page is about? So what can we do better? Well, we can try to be a little bit more conscious about the HTML we use when creating websites. More often than not, it doesn't take much effort to use a different and more meaningful tag. One thing you can do is try to maintain a logical page outline for your website. You shouldn't have every one of your titles as an H1. That's not helping anybody. Instead, using H1 through H6 to organize your content, similar to what you would see in a book. What this does is cue search engines to the hierarchy of the website. It's helping to answer what information belongs under what title. We have two examples here of image tags. The top one doesn't have any alt value, but our bottom one has a description of what's happening inside of the image. What do you think is more likely to show up in a Google search? By providing our alt value, we're helping Google understand what that image is. It's adding more content value to the page and ultimately helping us in searches. Somewhat similarly, anchor tags are important for how Google reads your page. It might be easy to tack on a read more link after a paragraph, but when search engines crawl your page, they look at the text of that link and try to find out what the context of that link is. And using the same text everywhere, like read more, isn't really helping. Instead, we can add links to the descriptive parts of the text we already have. We can make it easier for Google to understand them. If you go to your website and click around and you look at the words in the browser, does it say the same thing for each page? The tag that controls this is the title tag, and it's more important for just the browser tab. This is also what controls the text that shows up on Google. 
Google's getting smarter about adding more context about the pages, but chances are it's not going to consider your links as valuable if every single one of your pages shows up with your blog name instead of what the page is about. All right, so next we'll talk about accessibility. Accessibility is one of the more meaningful points here. A good high level summary of what accessibility is, is how usable your website or app is for all types of people. This is regardless of any type of disability. So that means can someone with a seeing disability still use your website? Each of us as developers are responsible for how our creations are being used. The World Health Organization estimates 15% of the world has some sort of disability. That's over 1 billion people. All right, so the whole world isn't going to be using my site, but how about those 2,400 people that visited my site so far this year? Just hypothetically, if 15% of those visits were people with disabilities, that's still over 360 people. That's a lot of people. Imagine websites for businesses like e-commerce that make money from their website, or websites that people need to help them live. Those are real people who can't use your website because nobody paid attention to it. For businesses, that's lots of money. But for people's needs, that's a prescription they're having trouble filling. We should all take responsibility for the work that we create. It's just the right thing to do. So what can we do to help our friends and neighbors? We can learn about some of the different types of disabilities that people face when using the web. We can try to be conscious about the decisions that we make. Just like SEO, more often than not, it doesn't take much more effort, if at all, to develop with accessibility in mind. So remember our page outline from before? While optimizing for SEO by using proper semantic HTML, you're also helping screen readers understand the hierarchy of the content. As a screen reader is moving up and down a page, it's able to jump over some sections that a person might not be interested in. Imagine this is going to be very difficult if every single header is an H1. And remember our image alt example? See a thread here? A lot of times when we write our HTML properly, you're going to end up providing valuable and valuable providing value in multiple ways. Here's a screen reader lands on an image, the person will actually be able to hear what the image is showing. It's just another low effort way to help everyone experience our website. Lists are also a practical use of HTML that's used across the web. But far too often, I see code that logically is a list that's, using the, that's not using the HTML list elements. Next time you create a navigation for your app, don't use a bunch of divs. Use the actual HTML list elements. This will help assistive technology actually assist the people that are trying to use it. And they're not much harder to style. Set your list style on your UL to none, and you're practically where you were with a div. Buttons are also another important aspect. While you can get by pretty far with using a div, you have to do a lot more to get it to a place where it becomes usable. And oftentimes, when I see people using a div like that, they don't actually take that into consideration. With a div, you get nothing by default. But with a button, while you typically override some of the styles, you get something that looks like a button. You get a CSS cursor that shows that it's clickable. You get an HTML element that people can use with their keyboard by tapping to it and hitting enter. And did you know that by default, when nested inside of a form, a button will actually submit the form all of an, on its own? This is handy for a variety of reasons, like not worrying about having to set up specific event handlers for submitting your form. The point, though, is along with the rest of the HTML I went over, it's really not much more difficult to use. We just need to become more conscious and get in the habit of doing it from the start. And lastly, we'll talk about simplicity. So what do I actually mean by simplicity? We don't always need extravagant solutions to get our code to work the way we want it to. Sometimes there's a simpler way to do the, what we're struggling to do with JavaScript. This is probably an exaggerated example of the padding top solution. Hopefully I got the math right in there. But it shows the difference on how some CSS can replace all the JavaScript logic. Bonus, at least in this case, it's likely to be more performant and bug-free. Now, there's absolutely some value from learning while doing. If you want to use a bunch of complex tools to build your blog, that's a great low-risk way to learn into the tools. I even encourage it. It's a way to try new things and rapidly learn without worrying about breaking things. I lost count of the amount of times I rebuilt my website before I settled on my current simple one. But from a work perspective, whether for a client or for your company's website, try to think about the, the solutions in terms of what it will solve. Is that extra JavaScript worth the additional load it will take in the browser? How much time am I really going to save with those extra tools? So what are some things we can do to keep it simple? Well, we don't need to rewrite the HTML spec every time we add a new component. More often than not, the JavaScript you write means more JavaScript you ship, which can impact the performance of your app. Use what we already have. It's also less work. Like here with the data list element, while it's not super fancy like some of the JavaScript solutions, we can create a basic autocomplete feature for an input. 
And you don't need JavaScript to create a simple loading animation like you might see on some of your favorite websites. Using some CSS, we can use a gradient and an animation to create this effect. It's just a small snippet here. Better yet, having it as a class, we can extend it to any element we want pretty easily. And while sometimes we need to maintain the state of our components, sometimes we don't. If we're only maintaining that state to style, we can use instead the checked attribute on an input to change how it looks. Here, we're simply showing different text depending on if it's checked using pure CSS. And if I asked you before seeing this how you would make the text responsive, how many of you would jump right into JavaScript? Well, we can actually do this quite nicely with some simple CSS. Here, I'm setting the font size of our H1 to 10 viewport width. It might look a little choppy on the slides between saving this out as a GIF and presenting it, but I promise you it's buttery smooth. That way, it scales nice and evenly with our browser. And bonus, if it gets too small or we want to change it in some way, we can set media query breakpoints and keep it all in CSS. And as much as there are some good practical things about the fundamentals, people are also building some awesome things with some simple HTML and CSS. This is important because it helps us remind us how much there is to do with what's already out there. It's important because it helps us keeping us pushing the boundaries of what we can do with native tools. There is massive work already underway with CSS. If you haven't heard of Houdini yet, you definitely should look it up. And this is beyond the tools that we already have. I believe that progress wouldn't be happening if we didn't have developers constantly pushing the tools. So it can be important to have constraints that promote creativity where you least expect it. Like a trend on CodePen to try to come up with some CSS-only solutions. It's not just challenging, it's fun. And it seems like for a while, people were talking about cake all the time and it was breaking the internet. So Adam set up this pen that turns everything into cake. The only JavaScript in the pen is to just simply upload the image. But once it's uploaded, the rest is HTML and CSS to give that effect. When you hover over the image, it splits it open so you can take a piece. Or this pen from Lynn. It's only CSS for a collector's cabinet. I love all the incredible detail put into it. And you can keep looking around and find new things. The lab made a coronavirus game. You're able to fight the pandemic by clicking each virus. There's no JavaScript in here at all. It's all uh, CSS. The lab uses some inputs similar to all the others, but uses CSS loops to create the different animations. This gives us our virus with the ability to interact with it. And I have to include one of my own, right? I have admittedly haven't picked up a code pen in a while. This thing's about six years old. But the story goes, I was watching the Alien movie for the first time, and I stopped watching it after the title scene. But that's because I ended up spending the rest of the movie remaking the title stream in CSS. And I still actually have yet to rewatch it. But just to clarify, I know there's JavaScript in there, but that's only to provide a little handy restart button at the bottom. But it was fun, and it was challenging. And it might not be practical for every scenario, but I can apply this to other work in my daily job, like micro-interactions or delightful animations in the UI. So now that you all are inevitably inspired, how can we get back to the basics and learn some fundamentals? Free Code Camp is a huge community of learners who are trying to teach themselves to code. They have great courses, free of course, that starts with responsive web design. It's a great place to begin if you want to start digging into an actual course. Egghead has a huge library of lessons and courses, some free, some paid uh, with their pro membership, but you can learn everything from accessibility to full-blown apps. All the instructors I've worked with are super smart and really great at helping others learn. YouTube has a ton of great material ready, ready to watch. Free Code Camp even has their own channel with a ton of great content. But there's a ton of individual content creators, like me, posting amazing stuff every day. Similar to YouTube, Twitch has a ton of great content. It seems like there's another awesome developer starting their own streaming channel every day, like we saw with Joe. You can get a live walkthrough on how to build these things. And bonus, you can hop in a chat and maybe ask a question or two if you're stuck. And CodePen. I feel like CodePen really changed the game when it came to CSS proof of concepts. It's incredible what you can find browsing around. That's not just CSS and HTML. There's a ton of really advanced JavaScript work in there. Best of all, you have the code immediately available to fork and start playing around with. So how are you feeling after that? Like I said, I hope inspired. There's a lot you can do, do and learn without diving headfirst into JavaScript. And if you take all these things into consideration, you're not only going to be better off as a developer, and not only will you help yourself by avoiding over-engineering solutions, which can typically bring on more stress, but you're also going to help bring more traffic to your projects and help others use them. So while this talk was about fundamentals, if you're looking for more opportunities to learn by doing with React, you can also check out my free ebook called 50 React Projects, 50 Projects for React and the Static Web, which includes 50 project ideas, complete with project briefs, layouts, and resources. 
I believe that the best way to learn is by doing. And this will help you avoid asking yourself what to build and just get started building. And that's it. If you want more, you can find me anywhere at Colby Fayok. Uh, if you want more resources, I write weekly tutorials and I put out videos on YouTube. Um, I'll also send out a link with all the stuff you've seen here today. Thanks, everyone. Give it a second here.
Okay, sir. Thank you very much for your speech. Uh, how did that feel? I thought it felt pretty good. I hope uh, everybody felt the same way. It was a Hopefully everybody's super inspired now. Yes, uh, so many positive feedback in the chat section. Accessibility is a must by Oksana Samahwalawa. And you're doing a great job answering those questions. Actually, uh, do you have the access to YouTube chat only or you got the pun too? I just kind of have it open up in uh, another tab. So I was just trying to chat along while I was able to. A little bit of entertainment. <laughs> yeah. You're going to have a Q&A session in 10 minutes. That sounds great. Yeah. Joy is already in the waiting room. Um, the thing is that I want you guys to do right now is, is actually send more questions, especially in the Q&A uh, Q section at Pine everyone who's registered there and has the access. So yes, please send questions for yeah, me because, and, and the other great speakers. Yeah, definitely. We do our job by filtering all the comments that you guys sent to us. Um, and we're trying to put the best ones, even not the best ones, but still we're trying to do our job. But if you put it in the Q and a session, that's going to be highlighted and we get the notification and you also get upvoted so that's how it goes that's how it flows and actually i got a new friend over here i was just thinking what i could do because with those speakers like you colby with those speakers like you mr joe carlson i'm feeling that i'm actually feeling quite pretty good because you guys are rocking the scene and i'm just here with my friends that's going to be our new friend for a Q and A session. I will call him GraphQL, and uh, he did appear by himself here. Like, wow, this is a GraphQL, and actually he's on. You cannot see him. Wow, that's a fail. <laughs> you cannot see him because he's also green, and he's, mm. he's trying to uh, become a background. Uh, We're all trying to become backgrounds. So perfect. <laughs> Sooner or later. <laughs> what time is it at your zone right now? It's currently 722 on the east coast of the United States. Okay. Okay. What is it? How about for? yourself? It's 222 AM in the capital of Ukraine. Have you ever been to Ukraine? I've never been to Ukraine. Ukraine. Have you ever worked with the Ukrainians? Have you got any idea about it? Um, a little bit, like I've talked to people here and there, but I've, I've never had a ton of exposure. You know, I've been working with the Geekle team, um, but nice. yeah. So but that's, I've, I've never been to like the Europe area and it's somewhere I've always wanted to be, uh, you're visit. Invited. You are invited after the lockdown ends. Definitely. We're going to see you. Yeah. I hope so. Yep. And I actually was checking some memes of software development memes. And one of the memes that I found very interesting, it was like one guy says to another guy, uh, that's a lockdown, you don't need to go to work. And the guy answers like, I'm software developer. And that's how do, <laughs> how do you feel about it, sir? I don't <laughs> know. Like, do, do you go to the office? You commute to the office? Or? Uh, no. So uh, before I moved a couple months ago, I was about 90% remote. Um, but now since I moved, I'm full-time remote. And I think a lot of people here are still full-time remote given we can't really get a hold of our, uh, get a hold of everything here. Mm -hmm. Got it, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it, Also, you guys, I want to remind you to check out callbefayag.com slash react global 2020, react global 2020 is a list of, uh, talk resources, a lot of useful information ebook that's coming up learn all the things about the gem stack and there's uh information what you're actually going to learn if you go there you will see by yourself learn by doing with 50 project ideas that's everything that copyfayag.com presents to you when you appear there
Absolutely. Also yeah, I like fall. your NASA shirt, by the way. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that was a sale shirt at H&M. <laughs> that's a, that's a I'm okay with that. <laughs> Dude, I, I, shouldn't, I shouldn't be telling that. I be telling that but anyways, do you, are you a fan of SpaceX or NASA? Um, are you asking me to pick between one or the other? If if you were to pick, what would you oh, pick? I'm not sure. I I really appreciate all the innovation that SpaceX is doing. Not to put off any of the NASA innovation, but you know they're working really hard together. So it's it's hard to choose just one. Um, but yeah, you know, there's a it's interesting. Yeah, but it's also a different style because the that one is governmental and the yeah. other one is private. So. Yeah. It's interesting to see all the private space uh, companies, though, because it's provide. I feel like it's providing more, more things. Yeah, that that Richard Branson, yeah, company, then Bezos company, then Elon's is the biggest yeah. one, right there. It's still my dream to be able to go into low Earth orbit. Hopefully, one day it's cheap enough. Um, I would say, I agree with you. Yeah. Hopefully. I wouldn't say that I do dream about it that much, but I should yeah. be saying because I'm a NASA shirt. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> you got, you got it. it. Yeah, let me present. All right, guys. So we are going to have Q&A session, and that's going to be planned in four minutes. But I think as we flow, uh, what you guys think if we start right now? Because Joe is actually ready. You call me. I'm I'm good whenever I can stop uh, showing my screen. Sure. So I'm adding. Yo! Oh, hey! hey. And okay, I just, I right just got that shirt too, the Black Lives Matter. Oh, nice. The... Uh, it's a brilliant shirt. Yeah, I love it. No, it's been great. And Ladislav. I said that wrong. <laughs> you need to pronounce it tougher. <laughs> What does that mean? I don't know what that means. I'm a soft boy. <laughs> Just maybe with some Latina accent. I was no, I like honestly, you should do it with a Russian style. Accent. Um, that's the secret. Yeah, that's I can't do a Russian accent. I'm gonna embarrass myself here. Well, I just saw another deal. I would say. I don't know. Now I kind of want to hear it. <laughs> oh, no, no, no! <laughs> I'm gonna get canceled if I do it. I don't know. <laughs> I die. <don't know. laughs> no, there's no way. Um, no, this is great. I can't believe I'm on this panel with all y'all. This is awesome. What a fun conference! I think we're like all over the world, right? Oh yeah. Pedro, how how late is it right now? Where where are you right now? I'm in Kia right now, and it's uh, two thirty in the morning. Oh my god! And, and I'm waiting until I just have shoots me some Red Bulls in my face. Yeah, you got the night shift, baby. That's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, because I'm a Red Bull degenerated. That would do it. I don't That's know about you. Lot. I'm I I need sleep. I sleep like forty hours a day, so I, I'm impressed. Yeah. And Kobe, you're on the East Coast, and I assume Vladislav. I tried harder. I didn't. didn't. No, it's it's really good, man. Like it's really how it should be. <laughs> nice you know? love. Yeah, yeah. Oh, in, nice love. In, Ooh, it's yeah, so much nice. better. And everyone in America always call it Ladia. You know, like it's a shorter okay. version, and it's just mm. uh, it's fun. <laughs> I love it. But no, I love Ladislav it. is cool. You know, like <laughs> yeah. Can you guys tell me? I'm curious. What is the tech scene like out in in Russia? Uh, you know that I'm not in, from Russia, right? I'm from Czech Republic. Oh, Czech <laughs> Republic, Prague. Prague. Yeah. I'm from Kyrgyzstan. So, but, but my wife is Russian, so I can, I guess, I can on her behalf to speak about the Russian tech scene no, over about, there. No, no, no. <laughs> I go check. I would, I'd rather hear about where you're from. No, no, no. It's it's a Czech name, you know. Like yeah, it's all the Slovas, uh, Slovenians' names. They're all the same. So like, it sounds Russian. <laughs> I love it. No, You're gonna hear it. that call? You're gonna hear the talk? <laughs> yeah, I just got a call. Sorry, y'all. Uh, if you see, it says scam likely on my phone. So uh, I think I'm not gonna answer it today. <laughs> no answer it. Let's let's, let's let's make fun of it. You know. <laughs> oh, totally. I've been watching this Twitch streamer who's been like posting. He posts like just scam baiting videos, and he just streams like calling. Nice. I love it. It's, I'm cool. a. It's the dumbest video series I've ever been watching. But it's great. Cool. 
Can I, I, think it's exactly, I think it's exactly what the Petro needs in 2.30 a.m., you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> we can scam some, uh, we can bait Shut some cameras. Right. See how long we can keep it on the line for. No, I love that. Let's play Call of Duty, guys. Call of Duty? I'm into it. <laughs> I love that. I love that. It's either Call of Duty or TikTok videos. I mean, we got one here. Yeah, you can. we can make some crappy YouTube. TikTok videos with me if you guys want to. <laughs> I've been thinking about it. <laughs> Sitting in the back room, like, what should I do? I can make a TikTok. Can uh, I can uh, actually suck you off with with my personal question? How how is it important for a developer to have a TikTok account in terms of? <laughs> like, it's regard. a major. It's a major yeah. must thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you look into the future, like five years from now. Could Let me wildly speculate. So I have like. I have like a small following on TikTok, which is like great. I know there's, and I have to say, there's like not many of us. Um, we call ourselves the Tech Talk Crew. Um, there's a small, from I don't know, That's it catchy. feels like the Wild West days of YouTube. Like we're still trying to figure out how to use this medium, and like as a developer advocate, I'm trying to figure out how to like engage people in a new way using TikTok, which is like it's something's working. I like I think something's working with it. I, it's definitely not necessary, and it's definitely like it doesn't feel as like. Twitter, I get more informative information from. I get a little bit from TikTok. Um, I don't know. It's opened way more doors than I ever thought possible with TikTok. I don't know. You don't need one, but it's super fun. I guess I got to get on my tech talk grind. It, exactly. <laughs> it's exhausting, dude. It's exhausting. But uh, sure. I love it. It's super fun. The community is super fun. Like Twitter is just like a toxic dumpster fire nightmare mess. And TikTok is just, like so much nicer. Also, I work for MongoDB, and after you guys heard Oracle, another database company is considering buying it. So if Oracle purchases it, it might be way more relevant, at least for me particularly. So we'll see. <laughs> well, uh, I don't so know. Are we doing the TikTok video right now? Because I never did any, you know? So it's good to be my first one. <laughs> <laughs> Here we do it. Can we do it? Like, who, who's going to run it? I can do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's already done. I posted what you guys, it. What you guys in <laughs> chat think? Can you, can you drop... Is there a TikTok emoji yet? No, there is not. None exists. You you can make one. If there were a TikTok emoji, what it would be look like? Can they drop something that looks like a TikTok <laughs> emoji? So we. Who's they? Is are you just like saying somebody should do this? The people in chat, yeah. So, oh, someone in chat got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's good. <laughs> Uh, yeah, they said yeah. representing us awesome. Americans accurately. I, I appreciate I, that. I have to Google it. So. <laughs> okay, guys, awesome. let's go. Let me ask you some questions because we got. <laughs> sure. This is a Q and A. Minds. Yes, another one. <laughs> I don't know. Good question too. Melissa Murphy asks, "What's one change the new developer could make to come into interviews job stronger?" What's one lesson you learned or wish you would have at the start of your career? I think that was related to COVID talk, but you, three of you could answer this. Yeah, and that's, really like a that's a lifestyle question, actually. So, yeah, let's kick it off with a lifestyle question and then go from there. You all right? What's the question? Like, it's like career advice we wish we had when we first started. You know, like, what's one change the new developers could make to come into, into you jobs stronger? What's one lesson you learn or wish you would have at the start of your career? Before you begin. I feel like I've been talking a lot. Kobe, you want to take this one? And then I'll <laughs> yeah, go I, can, I can start off. Yeah, sure. So one thing that like I've kind of been noticing with the, communi the community is it's very, very, very helpful to learn in public. And uh, Sean Wang Swix um, wrote a book about this. But being able to kind of learn in public by talking about what you're you're working on and the things that you're learning in the process is both helping other people learn those same problems from a different perspective, but also you're kind of revalidating the things you know. But having employers be able to see your body of work and read that shows like your your work ethic and what you're trying to do. And I think that's become a really, really valuable thing. And I think that's one of the things that I would have done differently is from the beginning, just write, write, write and um, share my work. Love that. I think that's awesome advice. Something I've been talking, I just gave, actually gave my first keynote on Sunday, but I think the thesis of my keynote was basically like, try to find a community of people that support you. Um, I hate, I started going to school in 2008 when the 
one of the many times the economy collapsed. Um, but I hated programming and I started doing it out of fear because I wanted money uh, and I hated it. And it wasn't until like I found people who really liked programming that like helped me find the joy in programming. And honestly, that's why I'm here today too. Like I'm just, I'm trying to spread my love of programming with everybody. Um, like if you have a boss that's shitty and like doesn't support you, like go and find some, like finding great people, communities that will build you up. And projects which you will fall in love to, right? It's helping when you when you see the meaning of what you're doing is the most important. I think I have also one advice, and it's like always do the project, like really find something what exists. It means it doesn't do just something what will stay on your table. Like really find a real life project and show it to people. Go out with it. Don't yeah. do it just for yourself. This okay. is the most important thing. When I was starting, I just assigned for job i said i can do it even when i couldn't and i just figured it out on the way you know so like this is exactly what you have to do put their goal go for it show it to people i love that and even as like a senior tech lead i still do that i'm like i don't want to build this i'll figure it out we'll google it together exactly mm -hmm. now when you're senior only thing what you know as a senior is just make the poker face you know that they don't know what you don't know you know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we know how to make google searches yeah. slightly better yeah yeah yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> Well, that's what we get paid for. We don't get paid because we know JavaScript really well. We get paid to solve problems that the business needs. Exactly. You know? Like, and it, the languages might change, but the problems still need to get solved. We need to figure it out. Well said. Yep. Nice, 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 nice. I just want to keep agreeing with you. <laughs> that's <laughs> the best. <laughs> uh, there's another question by Aditya V. What is the best way to authorize the queries and mutations? So that's a technical one. Who's gonna answer that, uh, Ladislav or Colby? Query mutation. That sounds like that a sounds like a Joe thing. thing, right? Yeah. yeah. Wait, what was the question again? I'm trying to find it here. What is the best way to authorize the queries and mutations? Uh, well, it depends on you're building it. Like, you can of course enforce security behind the scenes. Um, with MongoDB, like with Atlas, you can do it on the cloud. You have like user permissions, like access data. That's the easiest way to do it with Atlas. You just say like these users can do this with the data. You can do that all in the GUI or on the command line. Um, but protecting the data is a good way to do that. You can enforce that differently if you're building your own GraphQL endpoint from scratch, though. Nice. Security is like one of those things that's so important and it's so boring to talk about. Uh, again, it's so <laughs> important. It's, it's so hard boring. to like make security cool and sexy. It's like, yeah, it's important. <laughs> you just gotta set user permissions up and whatever, and it's a boring slog, but it's super important to do that. <laughs> There is another question by Hartish when Katish, but you guys need to help me out because there are a lot of short links, just letters, just a couple of letters that you understand for sure. So I see a lot of GD sideline in HTML, CSS, and focusing more on framework. What is your opinion on that, Colby? Is it too confusing looking at GDs where they ask to be versed with all frameworks? So I think JDs, I'm guessing that's uh, junior developers. Um, so I see a lot of junior developers sidelining HTML to focus more on frameworks. Um, so it's interesting. Um, part of the issue is that people over-focus on those frameworks and they get so um, tied up in that that they forget to actually focus on some of the things that matter, like actually building something. Um, but at the same time, like I think there's a lot of value in that because if there's a framework that's going to keep you interested in it and keep you motivated to actually learn these things, then that's incredibly valuable. But I think it's really a balance of trying to figure out what helps drive your motivation, but being able to figure out those fundamentals to have a good solid base. If I can add something, just always question what you're choosing, be open to change. Don't stuck with the framework, otherwise you are killing yourself. Um, and bring something what will make your work easy as possible. And if there is something new and it's easier to do it, just change and be always able to adapt for the changes because if we know the JavaScript and all the world around, it's the place which are changing all the time. So uh, be ready for this. Amazing, guys. Amazing. Amazing, once again. Rustan G asks, when REST API use middleware for security, what GraphQL use for that? I could take this one again, too. There, actually, just the, the vanilla Express GraphQL package, if you're setting up your own GraphQL node server from scratch, Use that. There's a bunch of authentication middle, middleware built into it, um, and logging and all that stuff. Yeah. Okay, that's the one I always use. It's it works great. 
Okay. Anyone else want to reply to that question? Or is it enough? Everyone's all up on security today, which is good. I didn't touch on it at all in my talk. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. Why is, why is it yeah, just need to just need to appreciate our viewers, I would say. I wonder why is it better for accessibility readers to use button element than a deal with an click handler? You should treat it the same, right? So they don't treat it the same. I don't know of the technical details between how like an actual screen reader works, but um, at a browser level and the thing that's that's hosting the website, it sees the functionality in the button differently. So it has native functionality that comes with that button element where div doesn't come with any, with any of that. Okay, nice. Good, 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 good. Guys in the chat, I want to ask you to send more questions so we could uh, ask them. Yeah, yeah, well, if we're like, no, there's no questions, I feel like there's still some, like, something. I would love to, like, to keep talking about career advice. I feel like that's resonating with the audience a little bit here. For sure. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I'm sure all of us have more shit we could say. I also just want to add one more thing here, too. Like, I'm a cis white dude ta talking to all y'all about. Uh, I mean, all of us are white men, uh, or at least like white, uh, everyone, like, we're pure white, right? Um, I don't know. I, I want to just acknowledge too that like a lot of us might not have like the same privileges or experiences that we had too with it. Um, I don't know. Something I found is really useful though is finding sponsors. So sponsors are people who are going to be willing to be able to speak up for you in meetings when you're not there. Um, okay. Like get you, instead of like, I, a lot of people are over mentored, like, and under sponsored. Try not to have people who are gonna just like mansplain at you about what you should be doing to get ahead and like try to find people who are actually gonna like help you get ahead. Mm -hmm. And that may take a while, especially if you're a new developer, but try to find it. I feel like that falls in line with the uh, comment from Barbara there. Um, she had a senior, de senior developer say that shouldn't waste time on writing HTML. I think that's hmm. not the best idea. Um, I mean, a good reason being is HTML practically works as is with inside React. So when you're writing React code, a lot of the times you're just writing HTML. Yeah. Yep. I totally agree. The, the line gets so blurry, dude. It's like, yeah. in my last job, you we were doing server rendered React components. So like we're writing hmm. HTML in, in React on a node server on the back end. You know what I mean? Like the full, like mm. we're, we're doing, you know what I mean? It's the line between front end and back end is blurred. The line between JavaScript and HTML is blurred. Like it's, yeah, fuck that guy. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> whatever. Also like, just do whatever you need to do. Like, but if you're getting pigeonholed cause you're a woman into like only writing HTML and not doing more serious like engineering work or whatever, and you want to do that, that's a problem. Like your boss is probably being a sexist asshole. Um, yeah, you probably want to get out of there. I don't know. It depends on what you want to do, but. I mean, HTML is the fundamental building block of the web. So I mean, yeah. you should yeah. know how to build the with the fundamentals. Yeah, absolutely. And to that help you to change when they'll be needed, you know. So you have to always understand the under the hood. Uh, it will prepare you exactly for to understand the framework if it's good, if it's not good, uh, if you're using it correctly, if you're not attached to it for mm -hmm. too much time, and so on. So fundamentals are are must have. But on the beginning, again, focus. You want to build something, right? Do it whatever you want. Like from outside, it's still the house, you know. No one see what is under the hood. So if you know just HTML or just plain JavaScript or something, just use it, play with it. And after you'll find out the better ways how to do it, how to do it faster. And you will always think how stupid you are. And if you have these feelings, you're doing it correctly. Yeah, I totally agree. Mitch Stewart brought this up too, I think, which is a great segue to Kobe and I's content too with your 50 React project. And you know, me just wanted to build stuff. But he's asking if like, Recreating other people's projects is a good way to learn something. Um, I, was, and I, I said this in my talk that I thought that that's how I learn. I don't learn from watching YouTube videos. I learn from like doing code and like getting something working is a good way for me to learn it. And then I can start adapting it to what I want to do. Um, but I'm curious, what do, how do you guys learn? Or do you guys have any tips on how you pick up new tech? I've been chatting a lot as well. Do you have anything do you want to add or else I can step in? How to learn? I think you can step in. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I'm a huge advocate for learning by doing. Um, and that's really however you learn by doing. Like, yeah. um, I love to learn by just kind of diving into a new tool and figuring it out. You know, otherwise, like maybe I'll, I'll fork a project and 
play around with it, break it and see what makes it tick. Um, but you're going to learn more. You're going to learn more when you're actually playing around with the mm. tool and the technology and building with it. I think I will add one thing. Uh, it's It was always really good when I became the tech lead and when I was after CTO in our company that I learned how to learn from another mistakes, you know, from the people, what they, and not just the mistakes, but even when someone, and this is really the, the honor what you have when you, you're leading the people because they're giving you the inputs, they're giving you what didn't work and what mm -hmm. worked. And if you have the good people which you're choosing by yourself, you basically, it's boots, boosting your career so much, your knowledge, and you don't need to exactly play with everything. You just sucking it from everyone. <laughs> yep. Yeah. But it helped me a lot to like speed up, you know, that it's always going faster and faster, I would say. Yeah. It's okay to make mistakes, just learn from them. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, There's totally a agree. question from Nicholas Jose. Just, um, nice everyone. Uh, why do you query every 500 milliseconds? Wouldn't that waste network bandwidth? What you guys think? About Is that it? for me? I think that may have been mine because I was doing a query on. Are Twitter. you doing querying every 400 milliseconds? I was doing every 500 <laughs> by demo. Yeah, uh, I was. And I wouldn't know if I'd recommend that. Um, well, should, but, should we blame you here? <laughs> <laughs> it totally depends. It totally depends. Like, because I mean, the the I built the app in Supposed and it. I was doing it every 500 milliseconds to show kind of how the, like you could see it going over the network, all the GraphQL requests. Um, that would probably not scale super well. And it's probably, your your users probably don't need a half a second uptime on a crappy demo app. Um, <laughs> and you're probably gonna start paying up the nose for <laughs> server utilization. Um, but uh, it depends, I don't know, test it. Like you wanna obviously try to keep things as low as possible. I did it up as a demo, but yeah, if your servers are blowing up and you can't figure out why, that's a good thing to probably lower down if uh, <laughs> if it's too you high. Took, you took, I think that you took the good approach because you can really easily say, hey, I can I can make the performance change, like I can make it two times better, mm -hmm. and you will just make it, you know, change the constant for one second, you know, full. So. Totally. <laughs> yeah, and even like on Twitter, right? Like you're not always seeing an up-to-date thing and it's not, like it's okay if someone doesn't have up to the millisecond yeah, of course. Latest and greatest. They're probably okay. It depends on your application, of course, what you're building, but for mine, it's okay. Yeah, so it was ridiculous, but <laughs> <laughs> for the sake of a demo, yes, it was ridiculous. People are saying cheers from Brazil. Ah, to the BAME. We're <gasps> going to cheer back from cheer United United States, States, imaginary cup. Czech Republic, Ukraine. Right. I'm just the water. <laughs> yeah, I got a water bottle. Too. I got some too. <laughs> I thought this Steven. one from uh, I thought this one from Sammy was interesting. What was your first project you worked on, and what did you learn from it? Oh, I like that one too. Yeah, you all want to start with that? Vladislav, how about you start, man? Okay, I can take this one. First project, uh, I think I was something like sixteen, so which is like fifteen years ago. <laughs> Fuck, uh, and. Uh, <laughs> The pretty, pretty fancy things were flash in this time, you know. It was really let's let's put back ourselves, you know. This is when JavaScript didn't work on any browser. Uh, the the major was the Internet Explorer. I think five even there was not even six, you know. Uh, so the, the web didn't exist basically. Like uh, everything, what you had to do was like terrible. And I, as a teenager, like in the in the high school, I wanted to build a game. So I applied for the. I pretended I had the company and uh, that I'm building the games. I played a little bit of it by myself. And I won for some big agency here and we did a really worldwide game, uh, which like shared around and it was cluster. I don't know how to say it more politely than uh, than this F word, uh, <laughs> but it did, it really didn't work. But on the end we figured it out, like it was working, but it just took, I don't know, three times more money than we expect, five times more time, but we made it work. And this is exactly that you're choosing the real project, you thinking that you will manage how to do it. And on the end, you will manage how to do it. So it was fun. Love that. You started so young, man. That's amazing. Mm. Kobe, you Not want to anymore. Yeah. Not anymore. Not anymore. Yeah. 
Yeah, I can go. So I, I don't know the exact first project, but my first job was actually as a large format graphic designer. So when I say large format, it was the side of tractor trailers. Like I would make these cool. big giant graphic banners. And I think the thing that I learned the most from that, which, you know, it's not developer related, but I learned how to kind of rethink and solve different problems, which I was able to apply to different things with web design and stuff. Um, so it's, I think it's all about that practical experience of problem solving. Cool. Oh, I, I love that you're coming from graphic, you know, like it's not that usual that the graphic designers are becoming the developers. I loved it. Yeah. I mean, I was doing code kind of just as a hobby the whole time and it just eventually crossed where I became a developer. What was your first paid project? The, the, your first gig that you got, you got some money for it and then you went and spent it, Colby. Oh, um, my first paid project was in high school, uh, creating MySpace profiles. That's right. Um, I would overlay custom graphics on top of MySpace profiles. And yeah, it was a nice little side hustle while I was in high school. Cool. cool. MySpace didn't come to Czech Republic. No, no. <laughs> Dang it. You were missing out. I think a lot of people our age, though, did learn HTML and CSS on MySpace okay. in the US. Yeah. Which I think is kind of sad because Facebook and Instagram, like they didn't allow you to edit your profile page anymore, and a lot of people don't know how to. There were the games, the right, and applications inside of the Facebook. It was pretty popular back then. That's right. Uh, yeah, but it's yeah. true that the customization was not there. But maybe because of that, it, it survived, and MySpace didn't. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. I know. Well, I think it did because it was easier to use. But at, like, at what yeah. cost? To I don't know. I'm just like curious to see what the next generation of programmers is going to be coming from. So I think Kobe, mm -hmm. your story is pretty similar. Like I. That's the way I first started playing around with it. it was just with MySpace to like impress my friends. Yeah. Um, I, I want to share my my career journey like really fast here too because yeah. I think mine's a little bit different. I didn't start programming until I was in college, and again, I started out of fear because I was it was the, the the financial collapse, and I hated programming. Um, yeah, I just really struggled with it. Um, but I learned like Java and stuff like that too in college. I, but I just did it to survive. Even my first job out of school, I hated. It was until like I met some people that really enjoyed it that I really started to like get into programming, particularly like Node and JavaScript. But um, yeah, I, and I guess I um, something I did do too is I uh, I moved to Hawaii for a couple of years, but I no one hired me because I was such a shitty programmer. So I just started freelancing, doing WordPress development to survive. Um, it's like making like websites and friends bands websites or uh, local public speakers or whatever. Um, I was so bad at it and I had like no self-worth. I remember the first website I charged for, I charged 50 bucks and it probably took me like 40 hours to make the thing for him too. Um, I learned quickly to avoid getting uh, exploited massively, but uh, I don't know, you know what I mean? I don't know. It's, it's good learning experiences. It was, it's, it was. Exactly. It's hard to teach other people that too. I'm like, you're worth more than this. And especially when you're first starting programming, you feel like a fucking idiot and like, yeah, it's hard to like be like you're worth more than fifty dollars. Like your this project's probably a couple thousand dollars. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. you, I feel like you have to get burned a couple times to like learn that lesson. And especially seeing other people charge more for lesser quality. That was what kind of opened my totally. eyes. Totally. Yeah, like this numbskull's charging yeah. five thousand US dollars for this. Like, what the hell? I totally agree. And it's like kind of intimidating though. I don't know. You know what's funny though when I was freelancing, every project I would just start charging double what I charge it for, and people just kept saying yes. Keep going until they say no. Exactly. <laughs> it is it kept going. I ended up getting a job eventually. Um but yeah, I, I never hit that ceiling of <laughs> people starting to say no. They're like, I guess this is what a web developer costs. I get they don't know. I didn't know. <laughs> Just play cool. <laughs> exactly. I, like this is what I'm worth. But you know, this like, is exactly great. the place how you said that uh, the people miss mentoring. You know, because this would be really easy to to basically avoid it. And right now, I see a lot of graduates and even or they're still on the on the university in some in the middle. There are some amazing developers. Amazing. Yeah. They can charge themselves like much more and they're coming to us and they have no experience and you're really paying them like almost nothing. You know, and you feel yeah. kind of a little bit guilty. You know. Yeah, no, I totally agree. But, but I, after after you understand that it's lesson learned to them, you know, like yeah. <laughs> I'd recommend all new developers find a mentor because I had that too when I was like mm -hmm. freelancing. I didn't have anyone, and my I felt like my skills had kind of plateaued. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I got my next job and I hired like a really smart team that my skills like exploded up. I don't know, especially when you're new. Even now, I like I 
need mentors to kind of help bring that to the next level. Um, well, at least at least money wise and everything nowadays they're working the the headhunters right and all this basically they're your managers when it's about negotiation of the of the money or they are telling you hey you can charge more and so on so it's a little bit closer to it but yeah yeah hard. No, i totally agree yeah and recruiters are actually your friend you guys both have like recruiters and yeah. you have the same end goal they want yes most money exactly most, much exactly because they get and more money this, the more money you make Yes, and also one one more advice: when you on the beginning of your career, do a lot of interviews. Don't start with one and take it. Totally. Do ten. Mm -hmm. Do ten. Evaluate it. When you have one, sure, ask for more money. You will see. This is the the easiest way how to not to spend years by exactly going for fifty bucks for for project, but how you can <laughs> speak the the career. Oh, is there? A... Yeah. Yep. No, I totally agree. Um, Dawit just asked something about imposter syndrome, if we've ever been impacted by it, and advice for overcoming it. Anyone want to talk on imposter syndrome? I can talk. Uh, love yeah, it. Go for it, yeah. Uh, no, actually, I don't know. So oh. we go. <laughs> <laughs> I had a topic for you, but after that question. Next one. Yeah, you get the next one. I, I get the topic for you. I want to see your opinions. I want to hear your opinions. Great. I mean, I... I I never overcame the imposter syndrome, though. <laughs> Still in it. That's valid too. Yeah. We all, I think we all are. But, uh. No, it's it's a real thing. Like I, I only started writing and doing talks and stuff in December, and like before that, like I was always the kind of person that would question, like, why am I the one who's talking about this kind of thing? But mm -hmm. like after kind of talking to some of the junior developers on my team and just other people who were, I was able to help in the process of my day job, like they kind of helped me realize like maybe your perspective is a little bit different, you know, yeah. maybe somebody will actually learn differently based on the way you say it. And that mm -hmm. helped me kind of open up and start writing more. And mm -hmm. now like seeing everybody being helped by that makes me want to keep going. So I don't know, imposter syndrome is real and it's tough. Yeah, I totally agree. Do, do you know about it? Should I want to add up a little bit about that trait? Uh, characteristic I would say like when you have high in consciousness it's very hard for you to uh, have a higher self-esteem than than you would otherwise have if you had lower consciousness because you evaluate yourself realistically and that's why like you always compare and maybe uh, there are some other people do you do you feel like uh, that just some maybe neurology to it to the imposter syndrome or is it so mental uh, and you, when you stop comparing, everything feels so easy. I mean, there might be a neurolog like a neurological. I mean, we're all computer people. None of us are qualified doctors or psychiatrists here in this room right now. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, it's something I think everyone deals with, and I do like think it's important to normalize it. Um, and again, I, it, it, there might be like medical reasons for having imposter syndrome too. But uh, yeah, Kobe, I liked your point too. I love that. It's something I wanted to add to imposter syndrome too is I feel like. And I love you talked about like your perspective is needed. And I wanna just encourage new developers to understand that their perspective as a new developer is super critical and important. And other new developers love hearing a new developer's perspective on stuff. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. For me, my job is speaking at conferences and I'm frequently speaking on things I learned a week ago. And I feel like I'm. it's always okay for me to say, I don't know. And it's always okay for me to be honest about where I'm at. Like I'm usually, if I'm just learned something, I'll be honest with the audience. Like I learned this a week ago. These are my thoughts on it. And that's still a valid perspective. I'm one week ahead of most of the people in the audience. Yeah, you know I, mean? I agree. Yeah, I'm going to interrupt you like abruptly. I'm going to do it very rude because my team is running back and forth and they ask me to do this. Look. Yeah. Love it. Oh, nice. Oh, I gotcha. So we can do the, the first one. Okay, the second one. Oh. These are, are the best. Nice you guys are the best. best. Please write there nice someone that right there's someone that we should do the Stir TikTok off. video, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's if it will if it will come on the screen, we'll do it. <laughs> I don't know what, what does it mean even, but we'll do it. <laughs> one thing I wanted to add to Joe, your comment though, is the perspective thing. Like it's incredibly important for beginners because the way that a beginner might talk about a particular technology as they're learning it might be completely different from what somebody extremely experienced in it because they forget some of those things that they had to learn through themselves and might skip over the individual things that beginners might lose yes yeah like that you forget what is hard when you're first learning things as like an expert yeah i totally agree i love that 
Yeah, everyone, write like a write a blog post tomorrow about something you just learned or, or reflection on any of our talks we did today. You know what I mean? Like that's that's everybody's people. homework. Yeah, and like and share it with us. We'll retweet it. Well, I will. Exactly. <laughs> for real though. And I, and Kobe, I know you just started too. I started like a year or two ago doing talks and writing and stuff like that. And I feel like like everyone starts you, like you're not great. It takes a while to like get an audience and get people to listen to you. Like mm -hmm. and it, you know, I think the best thing you could do is just be consistent with it. Yep. If you want to like actually advance it, and even if you don't, like writing a blog post once a year, like cool, go like do it. Like anything's better than nothing. Yeah. Absolutely. And like the community is so supportive. It's, yes. it's incredible. Yeah. Especially JavaScript. Yeah. It's yeah. It's such a supportive community, especially for newbies. Yeah. Nice, nice, nice. Meanwhile, if you got anything to talk, okay. I actually uh, recall that I want to ask you a question about. Uh, Guys, I just forgot what I want to ask you, so we need to move forward <laughs> with it. Like, so freaked, so freaking. I mean, how that do you happens. speak English? Okay. <laughs> Good one. It's hard. <laughs> That's the question. That's a junior track question. How do you, okay, how English, how communication is important? All right, all right. Now I got it, finally. Soft skills for software developer. Mm. What's the difference between a guy who earns 50k and 500k? If we're not, we're not talking about Google, Facebook, yeah. all those billion dollar baby companies, uh, soft skills, how is that important? Like, if you ask a question with a number or a date, should you start answering with a number or a date, or you should start telling about how your project were doing? Are we talking about negotiation or are we talking about like importance of soft skills? Importance oh. of soft skills. Yes. Oh. Sir. Yes. I love sir. You know what? I think they're so important. I don't even call them soft skills. I call them core skills. I think soft, That's like fair. hard sounds technical and like soft sounds like weak and flabby and like, but they're so important. It's a, it should be a core skill. And I think it's something that a lot of us have in the industry. I think all of us in this Q and A session are probably biased since we're doing public speaking here. <laughs> oh, no. Dude, if you see me at a conference, I have so much social anxiety. I'll tell you. But seriously, like yeah. communication is so important because like even if it's just with your manager or something, like it's the difference between letting them know that you're unhappy or not. And who knows, yeah. maybe that extra question will help you get into a better situation. Um, but even with your teammates and your developers, like you have to communicate. Otherwise, those problems will fester and just yeah. get worse. Yeah. And it's a, it's a roller coaster, right? If you're really, and it's so easy, you know, you have to speak about it. You, it's, it sounds so easy, but it's not. So many people are leaving their jobs because they're unhappy and it's solvable. And it's solvable not that every time you have to leave. I'm always telling myself because I was also experienced it that I was not happy in the place where I've been. But after I was always asking myself that I don't want to give up because someone makes me hell, you know, I will not mm -hmm. give up. You know, this was the main question where I always repeated, even when I really hate some people and couldn't be there anymore. So mm -hmm. just go for it yeah. because there's no, the running, yeah. running is not the way it's, it should be always crossed. You know, you have to solve it because otherwise you will keep running everywhere. And I think too, there's like this myth in programming that communication is like, like that we just sit in front of our computer and program all day long, which isn't yeah. true. I think even at all levels, and I find it even the more senior I get in a company, the more I'm just communicating um, or writing or mm -hmm. making sure everyone understands our architecture or patterns that we're following. Um, yep. Writing documentation, it's it's nice. key. We're I, writing, we're human I, beings writing software for other human beings. And that involves having strong empathy and communication skills. I got a bigger team when you're growing, you basically not programming at all. You're just communicating. This is everything what you do. You yeah. and you exactly you have to help the people grow. You have to give them space, you have to give them feedback. You cannot behave like a jerk. Your, your opinion is not the, the right one. You know, it's always there is multiple ways. So um, I call jerk programmers uh Ricks, like from Rick and Morty. Like genius <laughs> assholes. I fucking I hate them. I don't know. <laughs> I would rather have a Morty on my team than a Rick. Um, I think that's a fair assessment. I'd rather have yeah. a like someone who's average but smart and empathetic than a genius mm. asshole any day. Mm. Nice. Yeah. I, I got a follow up question to Ladislav. Should I wonder what you're thinking? I want to see the reaction of you guys. Uh, why specifically Ladislav? Because that's of uh, location based question. I would say. 
uh, mm -hmm. don't you feel like those developers from the United States they live slightly in a different world? What I mean is, isn't it, um, isn't it like the the reality is harsher? I would say when you do suffer, when you do living in Europe and when you're trying to climb that ladder of success. Uh, compared to the United States, when the ecosystem, oh. we see funding a lot of stuff. If we it, like, if we talk about even outsourcing uh, business, which is very popular to have engineers in Kiev, in Kharkiv, in Prague, in uh, in Warsaw, uh, like, what do you think about this business model, and what do you think becoming mm. an engineer in Europe instead of United States? in terms of the reality first, I understand. The uh, first of all of course it's the different world like not different world but different part of the world so there are different conditions different mindset on which we are grew up especially still us we grew up in the you know almost totality regimes you know so of course it's the mindset and it's especially the self-esteem and all these questions they're completely yeah. different like you you was always taught to don't believe yourself and everything and not even <laughs> You know, uh, for example, I was born after revolution already here, but you have it in your parents and the parents of the parents is not leaving the society. It will be here another two, three generations, but you cannot self pity yourself or something. This is normal. Everyone has their issue. I'm sorry. We again in Europe, we don't have the issues what they have in America, like uh, the Kobe has on the T-shirt, right? Uh, I don't even understand this problematic deep enough, you know, that I would be able even to, to, talk, to talk about it because everyone has something. No one has something better or something worse. Mm -hmm. uh, America is super open. Uh, they believe that everyone can do everything. I think it's amazing. Uh, and the whole world, I think it's uh, it's shifting there, you know, because you see where Europe was, where Europe is now, and go to China, you know, it's, it's all, everyone has the condition, but you have to just live with it and mm -hmm. be open and try new stuff. It's the same like with the frameworks, you know? <laughs> don't uh, don't don't live in the box. Nothing is perfect. Sure. Uh, I of course can't speak from experience, but like the the good news is like it seems like the companies in the world is becoming more globalized. Meaning like the, the companies exactly. support a lot more remote work, so people have more opportunities that they didn't have before. Yeah, and right now, especially with the coronavirus, right, it's mm -hmm. it's opening completely. Uh, Atlassian, you know, from Jar, they're never coming back uh, to other offices. They can stay for mm -hmm. forever uh, in the home office. It means because for the companies, it's a clever to do it, right? Because you can, of course, balance the the costs of your engineering work. But what it will do, it's not that something that right now the U.S. engineers will not be paid enough. It will just balance a little bit and will grow again. Like it will be more more balanced. Uh, I think it's all right. I still don't believe that like full remote work is the way. Like to work all the time from the living room. I'm here two months and I don't want to be here anymore. But <laughs> <laughs> something, something like some mixture, you know. Like you need to see people. You need to drink beer with someone. So uh, <laughs> it's important. And what is your take, guys? Joe and Colby on European developers. What would you advise them if you see? I mean, definitely have your yeah. own perspective and you see the difference. Obviously, you feel it in work ethic, maybe in communication, um, in technical. I don't believe that in technical there is a big gap. But from your perspective, what 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 the major difference, and what would you advise maybe to overcome to become more successful in Western world if they decide to immigrate, for example, or they want to work at Google or something like that? Oh, you mean immigrate know. into the U.S.? Yeah, either immigrate into the U.S. or work with American customers, Canadian. I don't think I can like ethically answer this. I just like don't know. I have no idea. I don't know. I've never immigrated. I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you can come to Czech Republic if you want to. I can manage the papers, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> After COVID, I'll, I'll I'll come over. Yeah, taking you up yeah, on yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I I don't. I I'm kind of in the same boat as Joe, but like I'd like to say, kind of you know, be yourself and work hard. Um, yeah. And I would, I would maybe highlight one thing, and it's that everyone thinks that who's working in the Google is somehow so better or something, you know. Mm -hmm. They're just the people who tried it and who wanted to apply it. They're the same people like everyone else. It's, I would not see there's such a difference that this is some major league and this is the second year. There's so many good, good people around who just didn't choose to be in the huge, big, uh, multinational company, you know. And it's fine and it's correct and for everyone is something. But don't, don't have this idea that 
you never can be there. Always try it. It's so easy. Sure. Two clicks and you can have interview. So try it. 100%. Um, guys, Kathleen Lien, what are some advice you can give to someone who's slow on problem solving, who takes longer to complete a task, especially during an interview? Do you, do you time yourself or there is a better approach? That's me, baby. Sure, go <laughs> ahead. Forever to do so. I'm like, I'm not a genius. I'm just, I think I'm diligent and can work through stuff, but it takes me a long time to do it. I, I think also, so if we're talking specifically about an interview type situation, always be clear about it. I mean, you're going to be on a tight time constraint. I think typically though, I think in, at least in the US, you legally have to accommodate for disabilities. So if you have like a learning disability or something, um, I think they have to accommodate you and they usually will do time accommodations for that. Um, you just need to make that clear to your hiring manager early. Um, but make sure you're just communicating that. Like if I had more time, I would do X, Y, Z, or you know what I mean? Or like make sure you're communicating and like doing what your interviewer wants, even if you don't have the time for it. I think also I, another kind of nice one is um, just like try to, try to like take a deep breath and tackle one thing at a time. You don't want to mm -hmm. get overwhelmed by a big problem and show little to no progress just because you're trying to solve the entire world at once rather than trying to take it slow going step by step. At least you're making some progress and you'll have something to talk about. And set up the correct expectations because when the expectations are correct, no one will be mad or me or something. You know, It's always just about wrong communication, wrong setting of the expectations after you will just collect the misunderstanding. So if you're open, uh -huh. if you speak about it, or if I can answer more lightly and with joke, become the project manager and you will tell other people that they're slow, you know? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you got them with the good one, sir. No, and I've hired people who haven't solved problems. If they like communicating quickly, like, like well, and I'm like, I don't know. I, like if I understand that they know how to solve the problem, even if they haven't done it yet, I don't know, yep. that, that can be enough too. Um, all is not lost if you don't have the correct answer at the end of the board at the end of the interview. And there's something to be said, like there's a lot of times those code challenges, they might not expect you to finish the entire thing. So kind of like point. realizing just do what you can. Yeah. But it's terrible, right? <laughs> yes. I hate it. When, <laughs> they really do stuck. When someone will tell yeah. you in the middle, you know, like, hey, it's enough for us. You know, it's like, what? <laughs> what do you mean? It's enough. It's you like, know? Oh, it's not bad. <laughs> You guys flowing, glowing. You rock. You like Michael Jackson, bad guys. You know. <laughs> totally. Um, someone's oh, asking right. about tips for people um, with no experience and how to break into the in industry. So, like a lot of boot camp students or self-taught people. Um, does anyone have any tips or tricks there? I always I point nowadays. people. Yeah, I always point people towards Free Code Camp. Um, they have yep. a free curriculum. Like you can jump right in and like. Find out if you like it, you know. Exactly. Don't like yes. don't spend a bunch of money on a boot camp if you don't know. If you even like it. It's so it's so amazing. Like what kind of possibilities are nowadays? You know, like when I le had to learn, I had to book one only book, which was translated to Czech language, right? And even when after I learned the English properly, oh, kind of properly, that I could understand, it's still like how long it takes from the books and everything. Nowadays, you don't need mm -hmm. to read books. You no. have video for everything you know like mm -hmm. <laughs> you, and a lot of like wisdom which you can really really yeah. fast like absorb uh, amazing community um, about every language you know like wow yeah so I, time I, to learn nowadays it is and there's so many free resources i think that's something so cool about tech is that like the open source stuff it's open there's a ton of like our industry is all about sharing information conferences like this right so I still, I, I, I have a computer science degree, but I still consider myself self-taught because everything I've learned today is because of things I had to teach myself. And the other thing, the other perspective I bring here too is I worked at one of the top 10 best developer boot camps um, as a lead technical instructor. I did that for four years. Um, so I worked with a lot of non-traditional CS students and getting them jobs. But I've, and I've hired people, I've been hired, and I have found that no one really gives a shit about your education. They only care about like what you've done and can you, solve the problem that they're working on at their company at that time. Um, so if you can demonstrate you have projects related to the problems they're working on, that's going to help you. If you're networking and you're working at a hackathon with a hiring manager, that's going to help you. Um, if you're really good at interviewing, that's going to help you. You know what I mean? Like no one cares what what you, what your past is. They just care about what you can do. And it's, you have to be able to highlight and show everyone what you can do well. And everyone does it in different ways. Speaking at conferences, writing blog posts, whatever. Build things. Build things, exactly, yes. <laughs> Bake shit, yes. If you have a GitHub repo. Go do something. Do something, yeah, do, do, do something. 
It's work. I give this analogy all the time. Like, like NBA players don't get better at playing basketball by watching YouTube videos of other people playing basketball. They're out there on the court practicing. You know what I mean? And like for us, I get asked like, what's the best YouTube video to learn this thing? And like, dude, there's this, but you're not going to learn it by watching this. You're going to learn it by building it. Yep. Yeah. Agree, agree, agree. Love it. Absolutely. Love it, love it, love it. I want to say, guys, we got six minutes. Did I say sex? Did I just say sex? I don't know. Uh, so we got six minutes left before our next speakers. Uh, what I want to suggest is to have a quick recap of what we talked about. Just maybe have a couple of jokes. I, I can't or, remember. <laughs> what did we talk about? Def 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 about TikTok. Definitely. I have meeting in six hours. I didn't sleep for how many days, and I don't even know what we are speaking about. So. <laughs> You're doing pretty good for a man who hasn't slept. I don't know. I think we just we talked about like we talked to some specifics of some of our talks, which has been awesome. I think all of our talks kind of inspired people in different ways. Mm -hmm. And I think we've been obviously focusing a lot on just like career development. Let me try to distill it down. I feel like the thing that keeps popping up in our conversations is just like build some shit that you like. Just build just build yeah. anything. Like make a portfolio and don't be an asshole. Does that make sense? Build <laughs> shit and don't be an that's, asshole. That's I think that's a great yeah. Conference. We should make a t-shirt, you know, like <laughs> I feel uh, like that's pretty spot on. <laughs> Yeah, this whole hour-long conversation, you could just you could tweet that out now. Yeah, <laughs> and we'll sure to go by the domain. <laughs> exactly. No, I don't know. Yeah, build shit and don't be an asshole. I don't know. Make stuff, learn stuff, okay. and have fun. Nice. And have fun. You have to like yes. it. You know, enjoy. Yeah. Be open. And and show it to people. Don't do it for yourself. Show it. Go out. Yeah. Show it what you built. You know, on the end, you're not building it for yourself. If yes, you're lucky. Most probably you're not. Uh, so show it to users. You're building it for the users. So yeah, give it to totally. people. One hundred percent, guys. I'm gonna kick you out. Okay. Follow me on Twitter <laughs> at Joe Carlson One. I love you all. Everyone, follow. Thanks call. everybody. Really follow appreciate it. Twitter. Thank you guys. Ciao. Take care, guys. Bye. See you. See you. Damn, I mean, no words can describe my emotion, guys. And you felt that with me in the chat too. I was speechless. I was amazed. I was, it was so friends-like. We just had a friendly chat. We didn't drink, but it was feeling like that. Uh, all right, so what are we going to have next is uh, the masterpiece by Milad Hidari, Modern Servant Side, Rendering, Elaboration, Next Gen, and as such. At 220. I'm thinking to have a quick break right now. Uh, just a coffee, a couple of exercises. I'm gonna chat with me a lot and we're gonna get back to you very, very soon. Stay connected, <laughs> stay healthy, stay hydrated, stay smart, stay calm, stay appreciative of the moment that you're having right now. Uh, stay with us.
and we are back live ladies and gentlemen it's been halfway through almost and the next speaker is milad hidari with the topic modern server side rendering elaboration in next years waiting for the speaker right now as he is preparing with his presentation and my name is Petro. I'm your moderator, Extravaganza. Actually, the last QA session and the last block of guys was so out of this world that I started feeling for NASA because I want to reach for this outer world. And we are waiting for Milad. How do you guys feel right now? How many of you? could drop fire emoji i want everyone to drop fire emoji to continue this festival to continue this party to continue this rock concert how you guys feel okay right now i'm gonna contact me a lot one more time and i'm sure it's gonna answer for the call <laughs> Doing my stuff, <laughs> doing my things. Do, 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 do. Yeah, it was so inspiring. I see all the last session texted. I was playing all weekend, so this is really inspiring. I was partying all weekend. Yeah, especially after the weekend, you have that free energy that appears somehow because. If you look at it not as a party but as a refreshment as something that adds up to your productive next week that's definitely a mindset shift and uh, i'm trying to use it as i can as i can i said it can i ask my technical team where is my lot This is some fire emojis coming up. I want to see fire emojis from you guys. Drop some fire emojis from you guys. Are you still alive? If you enjoyed the stream, if you got used to me and uh, nothing worries you about my accent, my appearance, my air, I would say jokes, but I'm trying hard, guys. I mean, you see, you see the progress, you see the evolution. Just Imagine that I was a young boy. I was a young boy, a little boy somewhere out of Ukraine, with the northern Ukraine. That's actually a lot of my city where I come from, the hometown that's called Chernigov town. You can Google Chernigov. It's C H E R N I V. And uh, for the last five years, it experienced major major transformation because we got a new mayor you know guys think about what okay all right let me be serious with you guys um what what do you know about ukraine like in terms of biases what biases you got how biased are you towards ukraine Drop some fire emoji. Keep doing it. Drop it, drop it, drop it low. Sure. Great, Kian. Thanks for being so positive and helpful. Thank you, Laurie Schroeder. Thank you for being with me. Thank you, Matthias Dos Santos. Thank you, Thami. And we got our speaker in the lobby. I'm going to connect him and he's gonna welcome you all all right hello everyone hello, hello a lot. how you feel sir everything is okay how is going nice man i mean that was fire and i expect nothing less from you yes i think you're tired i, I don't know <laughs> yes sir i mean this conference being a huge huge accomplishment personally for me for the team we so appreciate it for everyone to everyone who appeared here uh that you took your time i don't know how much time did it take for you to prepare to give that information 
to clear out all the useless information to put the best stuff in there yeah. to prepare mentally i mean that's a work so okay. that's a lot of work you ready to roll yes yes okay uh can you share your presentation yeah, share so screen. i ended up to the stream yeah. here we go all right at the stream okay you go roll and i'll leave right now and then we join later guys thank you Pedro. hello everyone my name is milad uh today i'm a software developer and uh especially front-end developer and in the next few minutes i'm going to talk about how to using next.js and making react universal applications in this presentation is not supposed to do uh, to teach the whole of Next.js, just each, which includes uh, useful tips and tricks based on my experience. Okay, let's get started. In this talk, I will talk about what is different between client-side rendering and server-side rendering. And after that, I will talk about, about routing and installing in Next.js and the interesting part, fetching data and error handling between client and server in the SSR mode. And after that, I made a simple authentication with using cookie and inceptors AJS request and uh, setting a config to better optimization build and deployment on the server. Okay, here we go. First of all, we need to know what is the difference between server-side rendering and client-side rendering. Before the SSR technology, applications fully generated by JavaScript in the browser. After, when the page got loaded, the browser will fetch app.js file or something like, so something named like that, the virtual DOM moves to the browser DOM and our page is loaded completely. Let's take a look at, at this code. When your browser loads index.html codes from your server, your CSS files and your CSS uh, on your JS codes run. And right now, you can use browser inspector to view complete rendered html on fault when we view the actual source code and the browser we are not able to see anything more than this html code and that's it this process name client side rendering but client side rendering has two major issue on some specific situations. Number one, JavaScript codes cannot run on all devices or all browsers because the browser needs to read your JS code files. Maybe your codes are new or is not compatible with your browser or relative problems. And the another one, the bigger issue is search engines and social networks cannot read, index, and curl your website. Your website. For instance, Google search engines has uh, some limited capabilities to rendering JS files before indexing them, but the other search engines and social networks cannot read and run your JS code. They maybe can, uh, your website, which depends on your JS code or versioning of your JS code, ES6, ES7, or more than. But if SEO is important to us or something features uh, like that, we need to use server side rendering solution. Server-side rendering is a popular technique to rendering client-side uh, single-page application on the server and then sending fully rendered page to client. 
Next.js framework can do this for us. Next.js is a simple, powerful framework to making React application and universal React applications. Okay. The authors of Next.js wrote on their website, Next.js gives you the best developer experience with all the features and you need for productions. Hybrid statics, server rendering, TypeScript support, smart bundling, road prefetching, lazy loading, and finally, no conflict needed. Okay, the first thing I will talk about about routing in Next.js. If you want routing in Next.js, you have two ways, file system-based routing and custom routing. First of all, we need to know what is exactly file system-based routing in Next.js. Inside the pages folder, if you make a file or folder with a name and export it as a React component, it will accessible by uh, a name like contact us. In this example, I make a profile page and uh, it have an index.js file and I export it as a React component and it will accessible by a slash profile like ebay.com slash profile and just it. And also, we can use it by nestable. Nestable means you can make a folder and uh, that folder have a subfolders and, and that subfolders have another subfolders and blah, 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 blah. Using file system role based routing, it's very simple, but there is another way to routing in Next.js. It's called custom server routing. If you want to using custom server routing, you should disable file system routing. And uh, for using it, just you need to go server the JS file and define your route and define your component. And if the route match it, then your components will be shown. Let's take a look at this code. I'm going to server the JS file. And uh, I define many of routes. I define my routes and my components and uh, defining uh, the custom routing in Next.js, it's very simple and easy to use. But I prefer you to use file system based routing because it's very simple and has many features. And in the next slides, I will using file system routing for examples. Okay, let's get back to the slides. The next question would be, how can we make dynamic routing in Next.js? Let's see the example. We need to make uh, this URL, like ebay.com slash products slash Nike React. Nike React is a dynamic routing. If you want you to use dynamic routing feature in Next.js, we should make a file inside pages folder like this pattern. A start bracket, triple dots, a spread ID or something uh, named like that, end bracket.js. Or a start bracket, id.js, end bracket.js. Let's see this example. We want to make ebay.com slash profile slash dashboard and uh, let's take a see. We have a profile folder, and then we have a dashboard, dashboard subfolder, and, and it have index.js, and it will accessible by ebay.com slash profile slash dashboard. But we want to make dynamic routing. We just need to create a file with this pattern, a sort bracket, id.js and it will be accessible ebay.com slash profile slash messages slash conversation and dynamic growth. If we want to have two single dynamic routing, we need to make a file without triple dots in our pattern. And if we want to have multiple dynamic parameters in dynamic routing, 
just remake your file with s spread id and brackets dot js and then we can access as a props in our components let's take a seat it is a slide of, uh, i will talk about how can we handle a dynamic routine in our component if you want to uh, get dynamic routing dynamic parameters in your get server side props or get initial props just you need to get them by prompts parameter and return it by props and pass it to the children components and the, another way to getting dynamic parameters in our components using a uh, read router high order components and it will accessible by router props and then you can pass them to the children components. Okay, it's very, very simple. But next question, how can we routing between pages and dynamic pages? For routing pages, uh, without losing a state of application, we should use link components in Next.js. Link component have a href prop and we should pass the address of located folder component in the inside the pages folder like this in previous slide i have a profile folder and it have index uh, the js file and if you want to navigate your app to profile just we need to pass a slash profile string to href prop but how about routing, routing between dynamic pages? If we want to do this, we also should link components with a little adjustment. The link components gets two props, href and s. We should pass the physical address of our component to href prop like this s slash profile, s slash id or triple id, the js. And we should pass the output URL address and we'll be showing the browser to the as prop, like this, s slash prop, s slash user id, and uh, we get the user id from dynamic parameter in our components. I'll repeat again, in each of props, we should pass physical component address in pages and as props, the URL that will be shown in the browser. Okay, I have some tips about routing in Next.js. I prefer you to make your other components uh, the outside of pages folder because Next.js works based on file mapping. And if you make your other components inside pages folder, maybe your production builds becomes very slow. Try to make your other components uh, outside the pages folder. Let's take a see. I'm going to my codes, I'm going to pages, index.js inside this component i have multiple components like the slideshow events host blog groups and the other ones i imported them by outside the pages folder i make a folder like partials a slash home and a slash i'm going to src going to partials going to home and we can see these components like a slideshow, newsletter, and host. Okay. And the another one, uh, normally I divided my components folder in three different types file. Index.js, style.js, and constants.js. Let's take a look. I'm going to partials and home folder and newsletter which includes constants.js, index.js, install.js. Inside the index.js, my base code inside this file 
and inside the SL, the JS between clause, my SL components and constants that JS between clause, constants variable or variable we want to use our components like uh, API URL address and something like that. Inside the index.js file, uh, I import constants uh, and using in all five variables. That's it. Okay, let's go. In this slide, I want to talk about styling in the Next.js. You can styling in the Next.js easily and by using CSS, less SAS, CSS, and JS and styled components. If you use the latest version of Next.js, you don't need to config anything uh, about CSS and SAS because it supports CSS and SAS in building. And there is no need to install the legacy package. But for using the styled components, just you need install a uh, Babel styled components plugin uh, and yeah, Milad, I'm so sorry for joining live once again, guys. Asking in the chat session to Zoom when you show up the uh, the code. So if it's going to be possible for you to Zoom in because... Uh, yes, the, yes, sure, but, sure, sure, sure. I think, I think that's right. going to be friendly. <laughs> that's going to okay. be useful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. I'm going to my codes. I'm going to Babel RC file. Uh, I installed the Babel plugin installed component and set SSL config to true. And I config it to pages, document the JS, and use this code. This code wrote in uh, the repo of installed components. You can see this. And after that, we can use installed components in all components. I'm going to partials, home folder, like newsletter, install.js, and we use install components in all components. And that's very, very easy. Let's get back to the my slides. In the next interesting part is fetching data. The default way to fetching data from the server inside the React by using component did mount or user fate. But if you want active server side rendering mode and run fetching inside Node.js plus passing them to the browser, you should use get server side props or get initial props. If you use this function, your page would be pre-rendered on each request. Let's take a look at this code. In this example, I use get server side props, and inside that, I have a two requests to the server with promise of all. Uh, I want to send the request concurrently, and after that. I return the response of our API as a props with name, relevant data, category data, and query. And then we can access these props, region data, category data, and query as a props in our components. And we can pass props to our children components. Let's take a look. We return the props like region data, category data, and query. And after that, we can use them as a props in our main components, and we can pass them to the children components. In this, in this example, I have a tool list component and pass region data and category data to these components. And that's very simple. But, how can we handle errors between server and client? In this example, I'm using APSS library to fetching data. I'm going to show you the GitHub package URL, 
API SaaS library to fishing data and add response transform as an inceptor to handling API status of the server. So handling uh, like API status 404 or 500 a status core or the other hand, or there are other FBA statuses, status. If we use this function, we can handle failure and success in response statuses. And when our response status is not equal by 200 range of error, we throw the response and the other words, we, re we return the response. If we using throw, we can use try cache easily and handling the errors. Okay, let's take a see. In the previous slides, I'm using uh, inside the cache section error in server functions. Let's get what do exactly inside errors in server. Inside errors in server. We return a status code of all results of API and pass it to parent components. Keep in mind, we should use get initial props or server side props inside the root components. In this situation, all root components is app.js or document file.js. Inside the app.js, right now inside the app.js, we have a status code. If a status code is not empty, we can handle the errors with components, something like that, error page or anything. And the otherwise current component will be shown. This is a simple trick to handle API status and handling error page components uh, or showing current page components. That's it. But keep in mind, we should use get initial props and get server side props in root components. Uh, I will talk about in the next slide. In this slide, I want to make a simple authentication with Next.js. We have five methods to request into the server. Get method, post method, put method, delete method, and patch method. In these examples, I define the headers and I define the create request headers. We should uh, save the user authentication detail to the cookie and inside the create request, we get the detail from user cookie and send them to the server on the request. It means we send user uh, authentication detail uh, to server on each request. In this way, you can send cookie and other authentication detail to server, and uh, you can, the user's token would be sent with the then if uh, exists in the user's cookie. It's a very, very simple trick. Okay, the final topic about fetching data inside the Next.js what is the difference between get initial props and get server side props? Okay. Get initial props runs in server and the browser. It means when you refresh your page, your, your codes uh, runs, in this, uh, runs, in, runs in the server. And if you routing by using the components, your codes run in the browser. But Inside get server side props, your code every time runs in the server and do not run in your browser. Working with get server side props is better than get initial props because sometimes you need to handle uh, runtime between server and error, server and client and writing code uh, to handle server and clients, and maybe it's difficult. I prefer you to use uh, get server side props uh, to sending requests to the server and activating SSR mode. I'll repeat again, 
an important tip using get initial props and get server side props just in your root components like page slash events.js. And you should pass result as a props to the children components. Let's take a look. Okay, I am going to pages, I am going to index file. In this component, we use get server side props and pass the response of the our request as a prop to children components. But we cannot use get server side props inside the children components. Slideshow components we didn't use, events components we didn't use. Sorry, it's very small activities we didn't use and the others. Okay. Let's talk about the final topic about optimized build and development. Hey, well, just a quick, uh, quick notice uh, that's going to be next speaker, speaker in a couple of minutes. And uh, what do you think about quick recap yes. of what material that you got? So it's mostly done. With the next speaker, because I have some great news for you. We're going to be together on Q&A session. It's going to be me and you. So we could actually continue and pick up on the material slightly later together one on one so there's no need to worry about that we don't okay get thank you time. you feel good about it thank you okay yeah the following thing in this part i'm going to show you something some tricks about uh getting the best production uh getting the best production uh, ready code and deployment flow in this topic I uh, I want to talk about analyze the bundle pack, uglify and minify JS bundles, minify CSS bundles, remove source map and comments, and then set environment variables and manage and keep your application online on the server. Okay, first of all, we need to analyze our bundle package. For do this, we can use bundle analyzer package and uh, we can find out what module has most capacity and which one of them got there by mistake. And then uh, we can optimize it. Let's get started. I'm going to next.config.file. I imported next bundle analyzer, analyzer and uh, I configured that with this code and one is the browser and server. And I wrote the scripts in the package JSON, analyze and set bundle analyze npm bundle build. And let me run the npm run analyze. Okay. You know one thing I want to tell you about one more time. Let's finish it up right now because we're going to have time together in Q&A session and when we pick up from there and you continue your conversation because we have a uh, next speaker coming up and uh, I'm appreciative of your talk and I hope you understand me too. Thank you. How do you feel about it? Yeah, sure. Sure. So, uh, yeah, I'm continuing with moderating then uh, and we we'll see you in a I just, 40. I want sure. one minute yeah. or two minutes. That's okay. Uh, sure. That's that's all right. One minute is okay. One minute. Okay. Sure. And after that, we need to optimize our CSS codes, our JS codes, or using tertiary plugins, uh, Webpack version five, and optimize CSS assets to minify and uglify JS codes. And after that, I prefer to use environment variable. Uh, make a .in file and setting your environment variables. And then I prefer you to use PM2 package to keep your applications online on the server with this code. Okay, thank you all. Thank you for attention. 
I hope it was useful. After a couple of minutes, the QA panel is open. You can reach me anytime at milanhider.workatsandgmail.com. Thank you all. Thank you, Pedro, and sorry. Uh, yeah, Milan, that was, that was strong. That was confident. That was convincing. That was your pace. I think you're muted. You, no, I'm not muted actually right now. Guys, can you hear me? Do you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. everyone can hear me. Yeah, you did it your own pace, your style. Uh, thank you, sir, very much for this speech. Hope to see you thank soon. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, I will. Sorry, yeah. It's, it's, no, it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> thank you. Absolutely understandable. Thank you, sir. See you. Okay, and now we are on to the next one. How do you guys feel about the topic of navigating front-end technical interviews by Shruti Kapoor? I'm going to present you just right now. Incredible. Hi, Shruti. Hey, Petro, how are you? Uh, I don't know how to answer that question, honestly. <laughs> because after all this time, I'm thinking that it drives me mad, but I still enjoy it. And uh, <laughs> I'm pumped because so many beautiful, smart people uh, I never seen in my life. <laughs> okay, I'm slightly lying, but um, I mean, we're gonna go get it with your talk. Let's get it. Yes. You ready? You wanna say a couple of words before? For um, start, sure. Um, I am actually really excited to be here. I'm glad that I'm on the junior track, so my talk is free for everybody. And I can also see the YouTube chat right here. So if you guys have something to say, please say hi. Tell me where you're from, what country Yay. you're from, and what time it is where you are. Yay! Waiting, waiting for countries and emojis and fire emojis as usual. Go there. I'm gonna leave you, Shruti take the step all right to the thank step. you i'm gonna share my screen just making sure i'm visible all right hey guys thank you so much for coming to my virtual talk today i'm going to be talking about navigating technical interviews i'm going to be talking about some stories that I had on either side of the table. I've been interviewing people for front-end roles, and I've also interviewed a lot of jobs for front-end roles. So I'm going to be sharing my personal experiences. Uh, these are all my personal opinions and experience. My employer doesn't know anything about it. So brief introduction about me. I'm Shruti Kapoor. I'm a senior software engineer at PayPal. Um, the three technologies that I work most commonly with are JavaScript, React, GraphQL, and at PayPal, I love building user experiences to make people's financial lives easier. And if there's one thing that is that I feel more passionate about, it would be dev jokes. So I'm going to be asking you questions, and you can leave the answer in the chat, and I will be monitoring the chat here. So the first question for you is, why did the JavaScript developer leave? I'm going to open the chat right here. Hello, John. Hello, Barbara. Hello, Ruben, Wilson, Akriti, Ayyub, Kara. OK, so the question is, why did the JavaScript developer leave? The JavaScript developer left because they didn't get a raise. Next one. Why did the develop developer die in the shower? Too many tech that we need to learn. I feel ya, Rustan. I feel ya. Why did the developer die in the shower? 
You have to leave first before you can return. Oh my God, that's good. Ryan, that's really good. I'm going to give two more seconds. By the framework. <laughs> I like it. The developer read the instructions. Lather, rinse, repeat. Next one. How did HTML get drunk? <laughs> How did HTML get drunk? round. I like that. I'm going to give five more seconds for this. CSS and JS. <laughs> oh, my voice is unclear. Let me quickly check my settings. Hmm. It should be okay. Drunk because of Dom? I love that. Rustin, you are the winner. HTML got drunk because it had too many beer. All right. So if you want to learn more dev jokes, you can go to my GitHub at shrutikapoor08 slash dev joke. Also, if you do know a dev joke, please send a pull request. You can also follow me on Twitter where I also tweet dev jokes in addition to JavaScript and React and GraphQL tips. So let's come back to the topic. Today, we're going to be talking about navigating technical interviews. Check the link with you here, bit.ly sla uh, sla bit slash React Online Summit, if you want to follow along. So here's the outline of what we're going to be talking about today. We'll first talk about how to get the interview, how to talk to recruiters, managers, what are some places you can reach out to to get the interview that you want for the job that you want, how to prepare for the interview once you have the interview, and what to do after the interview. So the first step is getting the interview. In my experience, um, I have found most success reaching out to people, which could be engineers on the team that I'm interested in, or it could be recruiters that usually on LinkedIn have a message that they are hiring for a particular role. So um, recruiters and hiring managers are the most common places that I would reach out to if I'm interested in a job. Um, I've also reached out to friends and families for personal referrals for job postings. Another common way that a lot of people are able to find jobs is also through Twitter, because a lot of engineers or hiring managers would tweet about the job on their Twitter websites. Um, job websites or job portals are also a good place to find out about job roles. Although in my experience, I kind of feel that once I'm submitting a resume, it kind of goes down the void and I never hear back. But that's another place. I have some resume tips for you. The first thing that is more important, most important, I feel, is to get your resume proofread by somebody. It could be a friend, could be a mentor, could be a partner. Make sure that there are no typos in the resume. Try to reduce the length of the resume to one page or keep it very concise if possible. And one thing that as an interviewer or as an HR likes to read is to have quantitative analysis. So for example, if you worked on a project and you've developed or implemented something, you could say, I developed a project that uses that used GraphQL, React, JavaScript. So try to uh, relate the technologies that you use to the technologies that are asked for in the job position and give quantitative analysis. So you could say something like, I reduced the, the size of the package or I reduced the, or I increased the performance by two seconds. So those quantitative analysis are really cool in quantifying the work that you have done. So once you have the interview, once you have um, the, I guess the interview rounds can be kind of broken down into three categories. There would be an initial screening call with the recruiter or the manager. Um, usually these are 
Usually these are kind of like trying to get to know you, what you have worked on. We'll talk about this in a minute. They, in, um, in programming interviews, there's also a phone screen that depends from companies to companies. There could be one phone screen or two phone screens. And then there are on-site interviews, which may be four to five, depending on the company. So let's first talk about the initial screening call. Uh, the initial screening call usually is with the recruiter or with the hiring manager. The hiring manager may be technical. So usually the questions would be behavioral, try to understand your, uh, try to, uh, the, the hiring manager will try to explain the culture of the company, the project. They will also try to get to know you better, uh, try to see if you are a good culture fit. Um, typically what they'll ask about is your past experience. And they might also ask you why you're looking for a new role. So it's very important here to be very positive about where you're coming from. So for example, if you really hate your job, don't say that I hate my job, so I'm looking for a new role. But you could say something for like, I'm looking for new challenges, or I'm looking for new opportunities, or I'm looking for a new domain. The next step is the technical screening round. Um, and these usually happen over a phone call or a video call. Um, and they happen on a collaborative tool like CollabEdit. If you have never used CollabEdit before the interview, I would highly suggest, I would highly encourage that you go and try it out once before so you have an idea of what you're dealing with. The questions would be whiteboard style questions. We'll dive into uh, what kind of questions they ask in a little bit. But typically a screening round would be 45 minutes to one hour. Um, in the end of the interview, the interviewer will give you time to ask questions. So make sure you have prepared some questions to ask the interviewer. After the technical screening round, if that goes well, there would probably be an on-site interview round. Uh, and these are also kind of the similar format these days because of COVID, everything is online. So this would also be on CollabEdit and would be around one hour. Uh, you may have on-site interview rounds with people from the entire team. There might be somebody from an external team. Um, there might be product folks. There might be the actual manager that you would be reporting to. So these are varied. Depends on company to company. But typically, from the technical perspective, you can expect whiteboard style questions. And again, in this rounds, because you'll be having five rounds, so make sure that you have prepared unique questions for each interviewer. Some questions, some sample questions that you can ask the interviewer could be, um, what part of your job do you find the most exciting? This gives a chance for the interviewer to talk about their job and what they find exciting. So you can kind of gauge on how interested people are in the work that they're doing and if this would be a good fit for you. Some things you can also, also ask are, what are some challenges someone in this role would encounter? And that kind of helps you prepare for the challenges that you might encounter, um, or if those are challenges you want to work with or deal with. And what has been your most significant contribution since you joined? I really like asking this question because I've always found that people get really excited about the, the work that they've been doing. And it gives me a good idea on like what my first few months could have been, especially if somebody is really new to the company and has only been there for less than a year. If they're able to work on some really solid products that are already out in production, it gives me a good idea of what my product or what project that I would be working on may look like. So I love that third question. So once you have that interview, how can you prepare yourself on the interview? The first and foremost tip that I would give is give yourself sufficient time to prepare. We may feel scared or we may feel nervous to give like two to three weeks advance notice, but it's perfectly OK. If you want to prepare for an interview and you don't feel completely confident just yet, take your time. Don't worry about it. Just take two to three weeks. It's totally fine. The next step is for any interview to prepare your fundamentals, to nail your fundamentals, whether it is JavaScript, whether you're preparing for a React role, whether you're preparing for a backend role. Make sure you know the fundamentals. And more often than not, data structures and algorithms also gets asked pretty often, especially in on-site interviews. So make sure you give some time to data structures and algorithms as well. For front, the, the I guess a, a good list of data structures and algorithms that you can follow is this. Um, arrays, queues, linked list, strings, stacks, heaps, trees, graphs, and hash maps. If any of these data structures um, seem like a little bit that you're not comfortable with it, make sure you go and review these before the interview. Um, 
from a front end perspective, I found these topics get asked very frequently. Arrays, queues, strings and stacks, and trees. And especially in these, the algorithms that I have experienced have been mostly about searching and sorting. There's been tree traversals, DFS and BFS, and there's always a question on time and space complexity. So those are your most important topics. In terms of front-end concepts, the main concepts that get asked are on DOM manipulation could be around query selector or could be around get element by ID. Um, the semantic markups in HTML is also very important, so be sure to review that. Uh, for front-end concepts, four main component, four main uh, topics that I found have been asked for me, which is animations, pseudo classes, naming conventions, and styling components. Animations was something that I was kind of iffy on. I wasn't completely clear on. So uh, make sure you give enough time to these concepts. For JavaScript, the most common uh, technique, the most common concepts that could be asked would be prototypal inheritance, scoping. Uh, for scoping, I've usually noticed that the questions would be about, here's a line of code, what is uh, what is the bug here? And there might be some scoping issue there with a the let or a const or a var. So that's a good topic to check out. Closures, super important. Um, the event loop and event bubbling gets asked almost every time in every interview that I've been to. Uh, there might be some conceptual questions on apply, call, and bind, or again, like, try to find the bug in the following code and apply call and bind would be used. Or like what would happen if you use the following code and there might be an instance of apply call or bind. Callbacks and promises, again, a very important topic, variable and function hoisting along with currying. With currying, I've noticed like fun questions get asked, like how would you implement adder with just one variable? And that would use currying in, in the implementation. So that's how these questions get asked. For web, the most important concepts that I found that have been asked were around cores. Um, and I found like that's a different, difficult con uh, topic, but it gets asked pretty often. How do browsers work? I feel like that's a one-on-one. You definitely should know the answer to how do browsers work and HTTP status. <laughs> questions could be on critical rendering path and image optimization. So for example, the question may be, uh, we have a website that's really slow, and you are tasked to increase the performance of the website. What would you do? So you are asked to present some ideas on what are some measures you could take. So that would be a good topic to revise. And then security gets asked multiple times and prefetching and preloading resources. This all comes back to like uh, uh, maybe a little bit of senior positions, but still good topics to review. Um, if you're looking to practice questions, lead code is a really good resource for data structure and algorithm type questions. Interview cake is really good for JavaScript, specifically JavaScript questions. I found questions on HackerRack very useful as well. Um, and before you have an interview with the company, make sure you look it up on Glassdoor. Make sure you look up the recent interviews on Glassdoor to see if there are any um, hints or topics that you can find. When it comes to lead code, I found that the when I was when I was just starting out preparing for interviews, I was actually really scared of lead code. I was really intimidated by the number of questions and the difficulty over it. So here's my tip for you: there is a difficulty uh, filter on the on in the right column. Um, if you're just starting out and you're not super familiar with it, use that filter and set it to the easy level. Set the acceptance to uh, one of the higher percentages and start with the easy questions. So you're building up your confidence. As you've built up your confidence, you've done like 10, 20 questions. Then you can move on to the medium and harder questions. Um, when it comes to lead code, I feel that quality is greater than quantity. So here they also have a, um, a a filter where you can choose which kind of data structures you're targeting. So make sure that you address at least five questions from each of those data structure topics. Another uh, resource that I found really helpful for 
preparing especially for front end interviews is prep.com which is actually uh, a mock interview tool so you are paired with another engineer who's also practicing so you get to interview them and they get to interview you and they give you feedback on how you did and they you give them feedback so it's kind of very nice like peer to peer interview system and i found it really helpful it also helps me build my confidence in terms of resources these are some really good resources that I found when I was interviewing. I'll pause here for a minute in case you want to take a screenshot. Again, the slides are also available at bit.ly slash React Online Summit if you want to get the slides itself. OK, so in my personal experience, these are the topics that I have most commonly encountered. Every time I go for a front-end interview questions, I feel like DOM manipulation would definitely be asked, and it gets asked all the time. So this is like, uh, I'll go over the cheat sheet in a, in a second, but this is like query selector and get document by get element by ID, get element by class, get element by tag name. So those are really cool concepts to re revise. Animating objects, like I was saying in CSS concepts, is something that gets asked if CSS is asked. Almost in every front-end interview question, I've always experienced uh, a question where it says, call an API um, and build a small app with it. So the API may be having like JSON format data, and you have to call that API. So it tests whether you can use fetch, uh, whether you can J uh, parse a data from JSON to string or string to JSON, and how you can render that data on your UI app. Uh, UI app. Especially if you're going for a React um, front-end interview question, This I feel like this always gets asked. Um, it also shows if you can use React hooks and how you can manage state on your React app. So that's a very important topic to cover. Um, for event, I, I've, I've also noticed a lot of interviews have asked event emitters, which uh, is really cool because it tests your JavaScript skills um, and inheritance skills in JavaScript. So that's a really cool topic to cover as well. And again, implementing counter, which tests your JavaScript fundamentals as well. These are not very data structure questions, so that's why I want to point these out. Um, string manipulation gets asked pretty much every time. And searching for items in a matrix. I feel like the string manipulation and searching for items in a matrix can kind of get into data structure and algorithms. So those are some common, those are some important topics to cover when you're doing lead code. Now, um, Here's the cheat sheet that I use. I just created this myself. So this is basically some common uh, methods that I have found that gets asked. There are DOM selectors. There are array methods. Uh, there are JavaScript uh, methods that gets asked. If you are uh, interviewing, I, I'm sharing this cheat sheet so you can hopefully find this useful. All right. So let's say you're prepared for the interview, and now you're during the interview. Let's see how what to do when you're in the interview. The first part of your technical interview would be a non-coding part. Um, in every interview, the interviewer would give you like maybe five to 10 minutes of trying to get to know you. And here as well, they'll ask about your past experience. So a question they may ask is, tell me about your previous project and what was your role in it? Couple of things to keep in mind when giving an answer for that is to talk about the technical details. Your interviewer is highly technical, most likely a software engineer on the team. So they're also looking to hear a technical answer from you. So talk about the technical details. Give a detailed example of your contribution. So instead of saying like, my team did this, my team did that, you can say my team did this and I was part of ABC. And they're also testing for your communication skills because once you join the team, they want to see if they can communicate with you, if you can communicate the ideas, if you're receptive to feedback, how you talk to each other. Um, so a sample example for this question could be uh, the project I was involved in was about XYZ, and I helped design and implement ABC with technologies, JavaScript, React, and GraphQL, and this project should be relevant to the job uh, responsibilities that they're looking for. And during this experience, I learned MNO. So a couple of things that this example shows is that you can communicate in technical details because you said ABC. And you can understand the project goals and scope because you said XYZ. And it shows you can learn and implement because you said I learned MNO. 
One important thing to keep in mind when you're talking about this project is to never badmouth your teammates or your boss or your company or your technology. Almost any time you badmouth your teammates, you can be sure that that would be a very negative point against you. So never say bad things about anybody. Now, here's an example of a technical question that could be asked. We're going to design a tic-tac-toe game. Let's consider this is a real world scenario where you and I are teammates. What I'm looking to see here is how you think and how you break down a problem. So if you can see, this question is pretty ambiguous. If you just look at it, you might think this is a design, design system question, or I've never uh, really worked with a tic-tac-toe game. I am not really a game designer. I'm not too sure what to do, but it's pretty ambiguous. So some things you can do before you start implementing is to ask your interviewer if you're looking for if they are looking for a microscopic vision which is implementation of functions and what the function may look like or if they're looking for a 10000 feet view which is a system design so there you would be talking about what the system may look like uh, what are some um, interfaces this may use what are what what does the data look like so make sure you specify you clarify the scope of the problem if it's a vague problem Reiterate the problem statement uh, in your words so the so you understand what the problem is about. And this is very important. Break the problem down into smaller components that can be implemented or talked about. One of the things that your interviewer is looking to see if you can take an ambiguous problem and break it down so that that problem can maybe given to other engineers so that you can work on the hardest problem or the meatiest problem. And out of those broken down problems, take the one that is the hardest to implement. Or ask the interviewer, which part of this problem would you like to go on first? Once you're starting to implement the problem, always ask clarifying questions if you have any questions, any ambiguity, and state assumptions early on. For example, in the tic-tac game, if you are expecting that there would only be two players, ask that. If you're expecting that it would be a three by three matrix, ask that. So always state assumptions and always ask clarifying questions. Before you start implementing, make sure you walk through your algorithm and ask if brute force is okay before optimizing. Any code written on the screen is better than no code on the screen or an optimized idea. Because at the end of the call, the interviewer has to copy paste your code and share it with their team. So if there is no code on the screen, they have nothing to show for the interview. So make sure you write some code down instead of thinking about an optimized idea before writing any code down. All right, let's say that your interview went well. What to do next? So you thank the interviewer, thank them for their time. Um, what I've done in the past is that if I'm really passionate about a job role and if I felt that the interview went well, I'll also send an email to the recruiter or to the manager or to the interviewer itself, but not for all. And apply for more. It's a journey. Don't let any hurdles or any rejection stop you. Um, finding a job is about luck and it's about right timing. And just because you didn't get the job this time doesn't mean that you're any less of a developer. It just takes time and luck and efforts. It just means that this is not the right that this is not the right time or this is not the right opportunity for you. Just keep applying. Um, if you are looking for a job, I also have a GitHub which is Talent for Hire, which I am sharing with my network of uh, LinkedIn recruiters and hiring managers inside and outside my company. So if you're interested and looking for a job, please, uh, you can fill out this readme file, put, make a pull request. You just have to submit your name, role, location, and skill set you're looking for. And I've been sharing this active, actively with my network. So once again, the slides are at bit.ly slash React Online Summit. Before I leave, I want to give one last dev joke. Thank you, everybody. You have been amazing audience. Thank you so much. Okay, we see you.
Really, yeah, I mean, thank you a lot. There's so many positive feedback right now. Everyone was uh, having fun, I guess. That's the right word. So many yes. jokes, so many <laughs> things. Yeah, and unfortunately, I've been told that you said that you said that you couldn't make it to Q and A session. Yeah, that's true. That's a sad yeah. truth. I know. I'll be I'll be monitoring the live chat for a little bit, and if you have any questions, um, I'll leave my Twitter link as well. So feel free to send me a DM or an email. Sure, you can actually send it to me, or can you paste the Twitter link into your live chat sure. right now at YouTube? Yeah, so we get some entertainment with our people. I change the angle. I'm actually more confident changing angles right now. Sixth, yeah, yeah. Ruben Dario says, I have a question. Which question you have, buddy? What information do you need to absorb right now from such great speaker, Shruti Kapoor <laughs> and PayPal? Rachel Fisher says, This was incredible. Thank you, thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel, for giving all that kindness and love. Send it back. Uh, so yeah i was reading the the chat and do you do you think that there is some question that's appealing to you right now and uh caught your eye and maybe you would wa want to answer sure let me see let me read the chat sure oh links sure. to the slide let me share this right now i'll share it in the youtube chat Understand. Follow, subscribe, engage at Twitter, uh, learn new stuff, jump in, into threads, just be more positive about this world, uh, bring some good energy, good vibes, uh, be in frequencies, you know. Okay, I guess regarding the links, uh, our team gonna put the videos together and the links to the presentations i'm not sure if I, i'd like to send it to you guys right now but i'm not sure if it's if it's the correct way to interact with you somebody asked how to get a job at f-a-n-n-g um, how did you get a job at, at paypal it wasn't the first attempt it was the second the third was it the referral that invited you and how many interview cycles you you had for paypal i think i had three interviews going on with other companies um, paypal i got the interview from hire.com which is a recruiting company uh, amazing company if you're in the us i really i really recommend that company i think they have offices like i think they work outside of us as well but hire.com is where i got to know but i, I feel like if you want to get a job at fang um, look for somebody who works at Fang and maybe they can refer you. Sure. So LinkedIn is a proper way. Just connect with the guy, tell who you are, yeah. what you represent, why you deserve it, and then go through a series of six, four, five rounds of interviews, I think, at least. Yeah. Do you feel, do you feel like you are above other people? I mean, that's aggressive what? to you feel like you're about other people. I understand that's very aggressive to ask like that. You work in a paper, <laughs> yeah. you look like from 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 uh, about on those developers that didn't get there because before in the Q&A session, we had a very informative, very, uh, I, it's lack of words to describe what kind of conversation that was with uh, uh, Joe Colby and uh, Ladislav and uh, Ladislav pointed out that it's not necessary those people who work at, at fan companies are better or yeah. more technically it's just some people don't want to work at such companies they maybe totally. prefer yeah something. totally like yeah so, I feel like getting job at Fang or like any big company is not about like how smart you are or like I don't know, like how much open source contributions you've given. I think it's all about like luck and finding the right opportunity at the right time. 
getting the right interviewer to be honest like at the right time somebody's in a good mood and they pass you somebody's in a bad mood and they don't pass you it's, it's a lot of like coincidences to be honest so are you friends with the hr department and then maybe you got some insights from those people at operations if you can um, share it uh what kind of insights yeah maybe you had a friendly coffee talk and uh the girl jennifer or uh, any girl with the name that she's got she said to you know like i heard you because of this that and that and i understand this is a process you go through series of interviews different people but maybe some some must house that you gonna have on your interview or on your resume maybe some the the phrase the construction of the of the language when you when you speak like that people say yeah that dude deserves to be here or that girl yeah i i i feel like uh, the resume tips that i was giving kind of like i i tried to explain some things that might be helpful so like giving quantitative analysis talking about the like tailoring to each job is really important for example like some jobs may say we need java and javascript and if the resume only talks about java and not javascript so that can kind of be difficult um so i feel like um tailoring according to the right tailoring according to the job that you're applying for picking up keywords from the job uh, description and making sure that your resume reflects that so that the recruiter knows that you uh, are well versed in those skills um and then specifying in terms of like numbers um is really helpful no it's not sure totally totally understand it yeah that's good how much time you still got have you got moment for a couple more questions so you need to go yeah let's do it i think i had until 6 40 let's do it four more minutes okay you can cut me off anytime and just uh, tell me if i try need to leave is it so volunteer base so there is a uh, as you have a question specifically to the material that uh shuri was presenting because i understand it's always nice to Okay, Will Bosfield said, do you mind sharing your GitHub link to the jobs again? Oh, sure. Let me do that right now. Yeah. yeah, okay. Uh, Will, I'm going to shoot it back in chat. Did you? Okay, I thought you were posting it in the, uh, in the public chat. You can okay. send me in private. Yeah, I'll, sure. I'll okay. send it to you as well. In a blink. That's going to be completed in a blink. Uh, forwarding it to everyone. Check it out. Subscribe. Follow. Enjoy. Will the link it there on YouTube? Oh, uh, will I'm gonna duplicate it in another chat? All right. Uh, do you see any questions? that you would be interested to answer. Let's do this from Ben. How do you explain about your past projects if you are under NDA? I yeah, think what's the big on this? Yeah, that's a tricky part. Um, I would say talk about the engineering challenge it had, not exactly about the product. Uh, so for example, let's say you are fetching a list of contacts talk about like um, like try to like basically uh, remove the product from the engineering challenge so you can say i had a huge list of 20000 data points instead of saying like what the actual product was if that make if that helps ben i hope that helps the person who asked that question so basically sure. abstract the company out of the engineering challenge mm -hmm. How many college projects, diamond projects, should we list on our CV? How many? Uh, is it correct to ask how many? What? What's? What's? Okay. Can if I paraphrase it, I would ask you uh, quality, quantity of the project matters. But I think it's yeah. quantity, isn't it? Because um, you're junior, you're just starting. Yeah, like with college projects. So for. Ex 
uh, again, like try to make it relevant to uh, the job that you're applying to. I would say like reduce your experience to one page. And if that means like five projects, sure. If that means like one project, sure. OK. Uh, Shruti, there is one minute left. And uh, I don't want you to be late. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Petro. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, thank you, guys. It was nice company. And thank you, Shruti. Uh, see you later. And right now we're gonna start Q and A session with our previous speaker, uh, the majestic Milad Hidari. Hey, Milad. Hello again. He was waiting patiently. I'm so sorry for those. Yeah, for those uh, jumps that I did. Yes. <laughs> without hesitation. Yes. And uh, yes. how you handled it? It was like Honestly. a ball. Yeah, like a boss. Yes. Thanks. Like yeah, it. thanks, Trudy. Everyone is a fan of Trudy right now. And uh, I understand, guys, I get you. I understand that the reason because of uh, the smart and uh, valuable information. But yeah, let's switch the gear slightly. No, I how are you, sir? Um, I don't know, but if you experience any lag or delay, no doubt your internet connection because uh, here right it. now it's 6 a.m. Yeah, it's 4.40 a.m. right now. Where are you at? <laughs> but I just want to sleep. Where are you at right now? <laughs> it's you. Yeah. Uh, I just want to tell you that you would need to help me because it's one on one. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. All yes, right. Yes, yeah, one to one to mic check. Reload time. You hear me well now? Yeah, what I was saying is, Milad, um, did you do you feel like you finished it properly? Do you feel like you have something to to add? regarding your presentation? Uh, I keep going with my presentation. Uh, if you finish <laughs> it. <laughs> yes, I finish it, but I can uh, say uh, recent slides. Yeah, because the last three slides okay. was in uh, sped, sped up uh, frequency, yeah, I would say. So that's why I'm uh, worried about it if everyone got it but anyways guys what questions you got to Milad Hidari your speaker your man Milad Hidari live here uh, making time to show up at 6 40 a.m. and in a couple of hours he need to go to work right aren't you when I do need to use next day as your Gatsby Okay. Next is a static generator, but uh, Gatsby is a static generator. But if you want uh, a static generator beside the server side rendering, you need to use Next.js. In the latest version of Next.js, uh, you can use a uh, function get static props. Uh, and you can, and your JS, HTML, and CSS files mm, can make it build time. But in Gatsby, uh, the JS, uh, you don't need uh, any server, no JS, and just you offload your HTML files. On to the next one. Are we going there? Who's next with the champion question to Milad Hidari? And meanwhile, yeah, there is already a question by Seb. So is Next.js compatible with React and Electron? There is, mm, there is no need using Electron uh, even Next.js because uh, you can make Electron uh, desktop application or all of it, something like that. Yes. You can uh, using Next.js and uh, Relay, Apollo, 
clients and the other state managers like Redux, Mobix, and the site like that. It's easily. There's a something package and you can use them for handling the states. Got it, got it. On to the next one. Next, it really works. I, uh, if you I get the question. question. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that was my bad. You got me really good with that question <laughs> and that reaction. I was, you know, what I'm doing right now, everyone's why who's wondering, maybe by chance, guy, what your guy Patrick doing right here. I'm just crawling up to the questions uh, that you dropped previously because I don't want to miss any any anything that you wanted to ask and uh which looks quite cool to ask a speaker in our case that's Milad Hey Diary. And uh I don't know, I couldn't find it. Just a lot of nice reactions, nice kind words. Mm, I and have some topics, uh, Pedro. Uh, one of the most important things for marketing teams uh, in the project and uh, business teams in projects is SEO, search engine optimization. Okay. Therefore, it is essential for developers to take care of it properly. Okay. Can you elaborate on that a little you, bit? I think use a Stripey, Nix, and Relay. Yes, you can uh, make your API with a Stripey and using them by Nix and Relay. Relay uh, and uh, GraphQL we can use and best application we can make it with this complex challenge. God, can I ask you uh, if you could elaborate on CEO said about search engine optimization? How um, proficient a developer should be in that in organizing the the page structure? Yes. What what is it? What is it about the meta tags? What else there are the anchors, uh, backlinks, mm -hmm. all that? Yes. So stuff. If you come. The from that background, did you generate traffic organically somehow? Yes, uh, show yeah. organic. But uh, let me uh, talk about it. Uh, the default uh, way of using React or Backbone JS, Angular JS, JS, and other frameworks to making a single page applications, they are uh, not compatible with search engines and they can't. Uh, Indexed by, indexed by search engines. If you use server-side rendering technology, uh, your page to render it on the server and you're sending uh, to the browser, and if you want to use this technology, uh, your search engines like Google, Bing, Yahoo, and the other one, and uh, social networks like Facebook and the others can index your codes and run your codes and index your page components. But when you're using Next.js, you can use uh, something meta tags like title, descriptions, and other meta tags, uh, canonical meta tags. Uh, you can have a top ranking of uh, SEO process. What would be a good project to start with? I think uh, you should work with a uh, global API. Like uh, you can make a simple website uh, with uh, Photos API free. Like uh, a website, uh, you can share your photos. Uh, I don't remember that. Uh, there is a uh, many of uh, free APIs and open source. You can use them and make your site. It's simple, and I think uh, it's a good for your first project. Nice, 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 nice. Good, good, good. Uh, yeah, I mean. The questions are not coming up that frequent right now, as it seemed to be. Uh, 
so we need to have to do something else <laughs> right do you understand that this is a <laughs> fake fake forest so like there is no i cannot touch it <laughs> There's no yes, it's, uh, or there. absolutely is aware that this is what is here. Let me I react the world. React react the world. Uh, I, I think uh, like, COVID nineteen changed the world. Definitely did. How did it change for you? What was what was the main? Did you where do you live right now? I think. Uh, in the eight recent months, uh, I will I stayed at home and working with other guys, other developers. I don't know. I think it was difficult, but we have to do this. Uh, like this event, uh, I think COVID nineteen changed the world. Like this triangle wall and other global. Uh, last night, uh, Apple events. Uh, started and that's uh, online global and there is no environment physical and physical environment i think really it's, uh, it's changed the world i don't know it's bad or good how did your how is your family overcome and this would you separated somehow if you're not allowed to in your country where you live, how is strict the quarantine regime right now? Uh, yes. That's <laughs> that's a perfect answer. Short, short, short answer. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's one of the best answers. React right? with therapists. <laughs> You're welcome. You know, there is, there is, there is React. Same. Yeah, okay, go ahead, sir. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 ask. No, no, go ahead, sir. You're good. Okay, thank you. React with TypeScript can be default in the next versions. Uh, no, it can uh, be difficult by default, but you can use TS config file and write uh, your TypeScript with your project in Next.js. Next.js uh, supports TypeScripts and the types of uh, plugins and modules. What were your first project and what... Uh, right now, uh, my team and I working uh, on a banking project uh, with React Native uh, and Next.js for the website. Uh, from Spain and Germany, uh, working with holding of PayPal and uh, MasterCard banking. Um, we're using React Native to developing Android on iOS application and uh, we're using React uh, SPA for admin panel and using Next.js to server start rendering our website. Good, good, good. First question by Lauren2195. What's the difference between static gen and hello CMS? Or um, I, I thought once again, reading this I don't question. prefer you using hello CMS, but uh, for personal blogs or personal medium, personal uh, blogs, uh, I suggested you to use uh, like Hugo or Gatsby for aesthetic generation, but help it seem as little adjustment. Uh, I don't want to use them, I don't know why, but aesthetic generation with Gatsby and Hugo and even Next.js, you can do this the best way. Okay, who's next? Who is in the queue? Who's next? Who's in the line? Who's next? Who's next? GS. What is your um, what was your technology that you put the most time in to master it to the level uh, that you mastered it in recent? Uh, before that, 
I'm using Backbone JS, Angular JS, Vue JS, but uh, in recent in recent projects, I me and uh, my team just using uh, React in front end coding, front end project, and using uh, Nest JS uh, to developing back end uh, or using Laravel in our PHP applications. Uh, does anyone use native scripts? Native scripts, you can write hybrid application, but I prefer you Flutter or React Native. Don't judge me, uh, but uh, I use them and I will. Uh, you can have best performance of using these. Oh, okay. The challenges oh. between native script react native and can you, can you show, yeah. Can I ask you for something else mm -hmm. that non technical stuff as I usually do? Can you show your scenery, your setup? Your living room, is it the kitchen, the living room, the bedroom? Where are you at right now? <laughs> so, so yeah, can you just turn it around? Do this. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. This is my office, Mary Oh, you're in the office right now. Uh, okay. Meeting office and okay. window, user guys, and the other things. Nice. How many people were there? And there is a kitchen over there just behind you? More than 10 people. More than uh, 10 people. Okay. Uh, in Hasdam Creative Solutions, uh, we're working on various projects in inside and outside of our country, and we're using and developing software, front end, back end, and uh, maintenance the servers. Okay, okay, okay. What else? What do you think? These people watching you right now, aspiring. Young lions, uh, <laughs> what they are hungry for. If we guessed, if we cracked it, if we knew what they're hungry for, and we kind of know because we did an online educative conference on one of the frameworks they're interested in, what else we could tell them? Uh, so they, you asked me about uh, what is changed in inside COVID-19 uh, situation, but how about you? What is the difference in your life? Sorry, uh, but uh, uh, yeah. I want to know. Let's go. Let's go, guys. How do you feel about this type of conversation? Because I'm really looking forward for a technical help with the question that you're interested in regarding the material that was presented. I could talk lifestyle for like years. And uh, yeah, just before I answer that question, I see the question from Alf Polo. What is the best way to include a static iOS framework in native script? What do you can say about it? What is the best way to include the static iOS framework in native script? Uh, I don't know. I don't have. Uh, working and with native scripts in production uh, but uh, you can port the native ios code inside your native scripts and your js bundles can run your ios code it's simple but you need to know uh, about uh, c and swift off paul could you tell us if you got it could you text I hope, us? I hope it was yeah. useful. Could you, could you text us if it was useful? Can I appeal to everyone who was asking me a lot of questions? Could you drop back in chat some feedback? How useful, how useful was that if you got everything? If, you're, if that information connected to your heart and your brain and now you're going to go and execute on that, if that helped you somehow, like for real, no lies. No. 
hesitations no doubts sorry i can't hear you yeah yeah i'm starting to off paul if you could reply back also warren 2195 yeah can you hear me now yes yes i can hear yeah i actually think there is everything fine with my internet connection because i had talks before and it didn't seem that i had a problem yeah i thought paul told us just that he got it i have some issues issues integrating third-party static frameworks to native script what is what other issues you have man yes what other issue what are other issues integrating third-party static frameworks um sorry but you need to know about c and swift because uh, if you want to develop an IO and iOS app, you should know that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Alfred. Yeah, can you tell by chance how long you've been in the industry? For how long already? Your work experience? How many years you've been here? Uh, I have been working more than uh, 12 years in IT and developing uh, with software developer and after that especially front-end developer. Uh, I have used frameworks like AngularJS, Backbone.js, VMJS yes. and ReactJS. But in my recent projects, my team and I using ReactJS for front-end developer. Do you remember and how it started? If you could share this experience with us, what was it in a, in, a, in college, in high school, in some gig that you started to do freelance? Can you repeat your question again? Yeah, do you I remember, didn't catch that. Yeah, do you remember how it all started? You always were inclined to be like in engineering mindset. You always wanted to build things. Just yes. Like computer. Um, when I was 14, uh, when I was 14, uh, my journey has begun by the trainee uh, in an IT company. Mm -hmm. Locally? And, uh, or you work? Yes, more? locally. Locally. Okay. Yes, locally. So you had. Uh, when I was a kid. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Uh, sorry, sorry. No, sorry. go ahead, sir. It's your turn. Uh, yeah. When I was a kid, uh, I thinking what would happen uh, if somebody lighted the lantern and uh, turned into my career. Right now, uh, I make a startup to helping kids and learning, learning, developing to the kids. Maybe it was helpful to learning, developing, developing uh, to kids. I think uh, learning to the kids. Uh, it's make a chance to then decide for the future. I like that. But how is that? How is that? How can is you, that? Yeah, can, can you repeat it one more time? Can I can I write it down? Learning <laughs> learning to the kids and um, learn so, to them how to write coding uh, when they're in the kid, they're, they're, uh, they're on the ch their children. Uh, I think uh, they have to make decisions for the futures. Okay, and you found that the code is, is the way to express? Yes. The way how you get how you get influence future, but that could be anything else. Like what if I'm too improvise? It could be so math, physics. Stuff. Yeah, anything related to hardcore sciences like math, physics, maybe. What specifically about deciding for the future? Like you mean to being on the edge? Just uh, you make a pass. Uh, you make a pass, and uh, you make a 
logical to his brains uh, and they can be decisions to the Got it. future. Yes. Got it. So you want them to be like more structured? With the way, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah with the way, if else, all that stuff. The structures, the logical sections, mathematical. Okay. Yeah, it seems like. I think you're right, Andrew. Yeah, I think math rules the world. What in comparison to math? I math, think math rule uh, change the votes. Uh, obviously, a hundred percent, sir. Agree with you. Uh, you know what's interesting when those um, industries interconnect and merges, like computational neuroscience, something like that, or neuroeconomy, I, I don't know, like something related to creative stuff. If we take the circle one, circle of creative, and then we take programming, and then we take the business application. It's very interesting how it all turns out if those people, for example, from different worlds connect together and they fuse some great results. Uh, yes, uh, I, yeah, what? yeah, yeah, so, uh, no, it was almost the topic of our conversation. I just laughed at <laughs> how we uh came to discussing different uh. Agile teams, basically, yeah. <laughs> I think uh, also send a question. Uh, actually, I created a custom plugin for the study framework and call it in my JS, but it wasn't and did I miss something? Uh, you should look uh, inside the main code, and uh, I can't say anything. I have, uh, I need to read the codes. Can you, can we ask him to pay, paste the code? Can we do like a live session maybe? If you could help this guy. How do you feel about it? Can you say uh, more detail about your question? Okay. Yeah, can, if he sends a, a, a GitHub re, a repo or sends the code, how it works in the development world. I think the GitHub repo and we go live through it. What do you feel about it? Is there something we can do right now? Because we still got time and it's still one on one and we need to come up with something creative. How you guys feel if any of you in the chat sent some piece of code that you're having problems with and Milad goes through it, checks it, evaluates it, gives some comments. And I understand that's a very complicated job. Like you cannot guess everything up front you need some time to dive deeper to understand what's happening but in general how does it sound is it sounds doable even mm, i have suggestions for uh, junior developers uh, i prefer them to read deep documents and uh, if they want to learn in js Learn books, learn MS, uh, RAM, uh, MDN documents, learn Udemy.js, uh, reading uh, eloquent JavaScripts. Uh, JavaScripts has good uh, money inside of that. And uh, just you need uh, to know a deep dive, a deep dive about it. Just read the documents and uh, increase your knowledge. You see the result uh, saying that you, uh, you can share the repo to both of us. Uh, <laughs> <both robots. laughs> you can share your email so I can uh, Also, you can reach me uh, at my email. Uh, I can share my email. And what is, yeah, I can. Can, can we do such entertainment? I'm so pumped about it. If we were, <laughs> if we could do it, I think that's going to be something out of the I frame. think there is no need, uh, there is no the best framework in this world uh, based on your project, but 
If you want to start front-end development, uh, you need to learn HTML, CSS, and you can use jQuery. And uh, if you increase your experience, then you can use AngularJS, ReactJS. But there is no the best framework in the world. Uh, Robin asks, I am new, but I begin to learn React. To learn React, uh, the first of all, you need to know uh, about JavaScript. You, uh, you have to know and increase your knowledge inside of your, inside your JavaScript. Uh, I think let's get started to, uh, with uh, reading eloquent JavaScript. And after that, you don't know JS. Milad, how do you feel, sir? I'll... Tired? It's morning. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's go for fishing. But I have energy. I have energy. Let's go, let's go for fishing as an efficient time, <laughs> isn't it? In, in Ukraine, people do that. 5 a.m. they wake up and they go do fishing. I don't know why such a thing. Because maybe they want to come back at 9 or at 8 and it's still going to be early, but you already got some fish caught already. Yes, good. Yeah. Thank you, Oprah. Yeah, and there is feedback from all three. Anyways, I try to figure this out. Thanks for the help, guys, and continue to listen. Thank you for being with us. Uh, we continue to talk. That's what we're going to do. Um, Thank you all. Yeah, but Mila, let me tell you that I'm, I think that we're going to talk for a couple more minutes before we go on break. And at 5.30, we're going to have a session of our CEO and founder of the vehicle, React Upon Time. Um, Intro session, just gonna talk with you, feel you guys how you mind in general about this event. Uh, and uh, update you a lot about different stuff that's gonna be happening soon because we have at least three events coming up, which I'm gonna announce slightly later after we finish with Milad, after we're done with Milad. So yes, sir, I suggest you thank you to have a couple of minutes talk and then we wrap it up. You okay with that? Yes. Sure. You were asking okay. me. Yeah. Uh, I'm asking you uh, what is your job in Geekle team? I don't know. Yeah, I'm actually a community manager for Node.js mm -hmm. track going to be happening in early December uh, the last yeah. node GS. yeah the last like one for Node.js was in uh, May and that was the first Node.js online conference that was a global summit technical summit two different tracks for senior and for juniors as usual and uh, information specifically based on uh, hardness and complication of the material but the next event that I'm organizing with the help of speakers just like you, and I'm so appreciative because uh, I haven't worked in this industry before and having guys just helping because they care about the community, they care about uh, giving the knowledge is mm. a lot of, and there's a QR calls right now, guys, you could look at it yourself, uh, November 13, cross platform development summit. November 19, Python Universe Repetition and now GSK Study Festival. The date is not uh, final yet, but that's going to be the approximately the first week of December. And what we came up with is to invite speakers to talk about their projects and how we categorize it is what we do. Uh, we categorize it in terms of success of the project. Like, is it was it successful? Did it fail or it went as planned and some interesting ideas were implemented? Uh, but 
you still want to talk about it uh, because this is going to be useful. So I'm working right now in audience speakers, doing a little bit of content on my LinkedIn. You can subscribe to me on my LinkedIn. Let's be friends. Let's connect. And uh, yeah, if you get me, if I'm clear enough, you could also give me some comments, give me some feedback because it's already like 5 a.m. And uh, I'm for I'm working for 18 hours today already. I didn't sleep. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, do you want? High five. Do you want to? Yes. High five. Yes, five. Foo. <laughs> Bam. Yeah, we got it. Do you want to be a developer? You know, uh, I love to create things, and I'm quite creative. I think because in in Russia, like I write blog, I'm, I'm doing blog on on Instagram, just text mostly. Just something that was an interest to me, and especially about the emotions I was having uh, during the, any event. Like a couple of days ago, I was at a yoga festival uh, in the forest area, I would say. So that was like a hippie uh, camp, and it was a yoga there. And it was the first time I was there. Uh, I'm doing yoga for five years, but I've never been at such events and uh i wrote a text about like my emotions about it yeah i also doing podcasts and it's also in russian and uh, mostly with people who immigrated with russian speaking people who immigrated to western europe or to asia anywhere and i'm talking to them about their emotions how they adapted to that ecosystem how they feel if i don't know how is it in your country, but in our country, sometimes people people are too worried about immigration in terms of they're not going to find friends, they're not going to feel the same when they need it, they... something else, something else. Definitely there are a lot of positive things. So I talk to them, they share their experience, where they work, how hard was it to find a job, uh, how comfortable it for them to live in that environment, to pay that amount of rent, to have that amount, save food for insurance and all of the stuff. Because it's always interesting when you open up conversation about different cultures. If you get me, Milad, if you get me, tell me because if something is not, if I need to stop talk it over again I would do it if you understand me if you're with me high five yes sir sure. high five high five sir. just uh, right now uh, I just want to play online FIFA pass with you <laughs> I don't know why I would love I just... to. but do you do you love FIFA or I would prefer Mortal Kombat Mortal Kombat Liu Kang <laughs> let's okay let's connect afterwards I just text you because I'm in that Slack chat. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm waiting for that. Yeah, and I didn't answer your question, your question because you said if I'm a, if I code. The thing is that I realized that I'm not an engineer in the minds. I love to create things, but like creative stuff and organizing events. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting, like organizing uh, different parties for birthdays. And even that, I enjoy doing it. Great. Yeah. And uh, I feel I'm more creative guy than an engineer guy, and I respect engineers a lot. For, yes, me too. For, yeah, for this, obviously, because you are one of them. Uh, and I respect engineers a lot. And uh, when I'm with you on the call, that's, that feeling I'm hearing is, it's like, wow, man, I learned so much from, from this call. From this conversation, learn so much that you could take into my life, could take and bring into my life. That's what I mean. Uh, and I tried to uh, do some programming, and uh, I went at Code Academy for JavaScript, and also in college. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was C++, but I sucked at it. I mean, I realized that I'm not naturally good at it, 
So why would well, I do? it's not that. It's just you need to train, train, and write. I understand. Coding. I understand. But if we go, if we look into the future, I don't see myself being a solution architect or being a guy who creates scalable systems, infrastructure, all that. Data data science is actually a very interesting thing, but. But other than that, I don't know. I like radio stuff. I like podcasts. I love copy that I'm writing. It's my pleasure. Yeah. There's some entertainment goes in chat. Guys in the chat, let's exchange Steam handles. Guys, guys in the chat, can you drop fire emojis? Because that's going to be my uh, last, I want to say. That's going to be my final moderating sesh because after that I will see your steps up and I'm gonna go to sleep so guys who's still alive and energetic can you drop some fire emojis for us for me and Mila because I didn't this for you I think there's you no think they're gonna do it more questions I'm thrilled. If they're gonna do it, I'm gonna be thrilled once again. Yeah. No, I'm not. I just need to speak Wait, louder. Speak I up. toggle mute and unmute. Sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah, I just need to speak up, maybe. Yes, yes. Yeah, Constantine no, Tarash, what, what you say? Um, uh, the, us the users <laughs> sent their social networks and yeah, 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 we got some. Chat. Can, you, can you see fire emojis from Matthias <laughs> to Santos? Thank you for fire. There's emoji from fire Ivan Escalante, sir. Thank you, Rata. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. <laughs> Muy bien. Yes, yes. <laughs> Constant into Russian. Thank Good you. Bro, thank you so much. It's so funny for me to pronounce because I see my people. Constantin Russian is a, is a guy from uh, from Eastern Europe, from Russia or Ukraine, and I how to read it uh, with the English accent. With the English accent is Constantin to Russian. Right? Many but, of emojis in comments. Yeah, Ben Fair, Ben. Ben, thank you very much. Gabriel, man. Gabriel, muy bien. You're the man, Gabriel. You're the man. <laughs> yeah. We had some fun for sure. Seb Solos drops some Instagram in for like for like for 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 hashtag me a lot. Hey, diary hashtag champ. Hashtag. <laughs> Thank you. In, in more emotional combat or FIFA. Hashtag A player ah, thank some... you uh, yeah no what it's a couple just a couple of minutes left uh before i give a mic to somebody else do the fire some deep send deep thanks man. to you and uh, thanks to you and the other teams inside the geeko uh, thanks for your attention uh I, it's my pleasure to be one of member in uh, React Global. Thank you. Oh, nice, Constantine. Look, look. Said. He's sending us cheer, sending out to our selves cheers from Montreal. Yes. So he immigrated, Constantine. He's going to be on my podcast there. Drop me a message, Instagram. You guys want to have our Instagram? Sure, sure. Uh, I send it to you. That's my Instagram. This is my Instagram. In private, can I share it public? Maybe somebody wants to follow you. Yes, sure. I send it to public. Mm -hmm. How can send comments in public? I don't know. Uh, do you see the chat? Yes, I will see the chat. Yeah. Can yeah, so just text it on right. YouTube. Anything I know why. I am Milad with double A. Oh, 
Hold on a second. I was texting. Thank you. Mm, I, yeah, I, I actually sent it so you guys can follow. For Asian cheese from Singapore. No, I was. It, what is your native language? Persian. Okay. Uh, which city are you coming from? Iran. What is the city? To take Tehran. 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 Yes, Tehran. Yes. Uh, they want to you your Twitter. Like person. My Twitter like account person? is I am Milad. Same. Okay, I have work, and I have person. I have it separated, because I'm on work I post some official stuff and something that's serious, and um, on personal Twitter I do some other other stuff. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm gonna give. You. Cheers from India. You can find me like. They want to your Twitter account. Just find me like this on the video. Keep updated. Add me on LinkedIn too. Post on LinkedIn. And my Twitter account is I am Milad yeah. Just like that uh, Instagram account. Uh, yeah, I can stay. Can you check it? A couple of my mess one message about from Giggle official Milad AG. I am Milad and Petrus AG Peta underscore digital. But that that was the personal one. Well, I think that's not a problem. Regards from Bolivia. Hola, amigo. Hola, Ruben. What else? Do you know any Spanish? You speak well? No, uh, no, no. Just no, a no. Just a random <laughs> phrase. So, you no, know, I don't have you know, experience in. You know Persian, you know English, you know React, you know JavaScript. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's different, but yes, I know. I don't know. It doesn't matter, but everything you see. Yeah. I think you need to sleep. Which one of me uh, or Pedro? <laughs> I agree. Helen? I think I, I, I think agree with you. Yes, it's absolutely snoring. <laughs> we were waiting for this message. <laughs> now we're going to go. There is no other thing that we can do right now. Is there anything else to do? But I have energy. But I have energy, Helen. Okay, I'm having the next speaker nearby me. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pedro. Nice to meet you. Yes. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, sir. Thank you a lot. See you. Goodbye, all. Goodbye. Follow. Goodbye. Follow me, lot, everyone. Uh, he shared his contact information. Also, we're going to have uh, our junior track videos at purchase for 15 bucks afterwards, where you can find all the links to the presentation of our speakers. And uh, we're going to have a quick break right now before the next station session. Yeah, that's work. And uh, I hope you guys jo enjoyed it a lot because we had great fun together. Thank you, guys and girls and ladies and gentlemen.
guys. Uh huh. Okay, great start. Hey guys, uh, Petra is finally free and he is eager to go to his sweet home, sweet bed. Yeah, as you already know, he is great here. He hasn't slept for 18 hours, so like we are proud of you. And by the way, I'm Anna and I'm happy to be your next and the last moderator for this conference. So I hope we'll have a lot of fun. And um, also, I'm happy, more than happy to announce you our long-awaited and main intrigue of this conference. The CEO of Giggle will interview two smart guys, Aman Jan from Facebook and Martin Chow from DraftKings. So we are waiting for our ad to start this interview. Mm -hmm. We are calling for him. Mm -hmm. So we are waiting for our speaker to come. So Ed, I'm more than happy to announce you here. And uh, please take your seat. Yeah, finally. Hey, Aman. Hey, Ed. How hey, are you? Good morning. Hey, Martin. Can you hear me too? Yep. How's my mic? Everything's fine. Everything's That's fine. I see you and hear you well. Wow, finally. And um, how do you feel? I I am absolutely happy to to have you here because you know we're gonna set up some tradition today. Uh, one of our talks is for the first time ever. Uh, we want to have about you know not technology, not coding features or something. We're gonna talk about future. We're gonna dream. We're gonna set up some vision about. Uh, the technology about the uh, the future of this domain of this uh, framework. So um, the stuff I'm gonna ask you is, of course, about uh, the past or some uh, retrospective, uh, and we'll talk about near this future, and of course we'll talk about the most interesting stuff uh, like. Uh, coding and JavaScript and uh, React itself uh, five years from now or 10 years from now, we'll try to imagine what, what, what's what's going to happen with, with this world and with all of us. <laughs> it's not that easy, but, you know, dreamers move the world. Um, but first, uh, I'm absolutely excited especially you guys here, because Aman is on the one side of the world and Martin on another side of the world, like on opposite ones. So we, we have like, you know, the, the balanced vision and I'm, I'm super happy to, to do that with you guys. So, uh, yeah, first uh, first question, if you, if you don't have something special to say before we start, uh, is uh, what's... Uh, what's what do you think was uh, really important change for the maybe one last year or maybe a little more in React? Who would like to start? And let's let's show begins. I let Martin talk about it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so I'm a consumer of React. So that's uh, the important difference in the perspective. Uh, as a consumer, I uh, the most important thing in the past one year with, uh, with regards to the library, well, so asynchronous rendering is going to be the, the one thing that I'm waiting the most. And it looks like we're getting closer. Right? 
So uh, when when uh, we had to pick, and when we did POCs many years ago about uh, in which direction we are going to go, uh, information about synchronous rendering, eventual asynchronous rendering in the future of the library was one of the things uh, that uh, uh, were actually um, key points. Uh, this, uh, this is one of the main reasons why we took it. So uh, seeing that uh, in the past one year, uh, we are getting uh, closer and closer with, uh, with the, the guys at uh, Facebook making more and more steps in that direction with the hooks, with the context API and so on. You know, uh, these are like some, in, some more imperative concepts are getting their way into the library. Um, the purest uh, people who like functional programming are not maybe not very happy with them, but these are like, uh, these are needed, especially when you're authoring code that needs to, uh, to work, uh, uh, synchronize runtime, to find another component runtime, to be able to inject stuff, to be able to run properly and so on. This is how you'll be able to actually decouple into different files, different components, like self-contained components. I'm not talking about build time. So um, maybe the most important change, context API, hooks and getting closer to a synchronous rendering with things like suspense, lazy, and so on. Yeah, I see, I see. Thank you, and Aman, what do you think? The feature of React, that's, that's a tough question, and uh, I don't think anybody knows the answer, except probably the React team at Facebook. So, um, Honestly, yeah, I'm not sure. I think uh, Martin's been using React a lot more than I have uh, lately. So yeah, I don't have really good answers at the moment about this particular question. I see, okay. But uh, what I see from you know my communications with uh, React developers is that, uh, you know, this, this, framework becomes more and more mature, more and more, you know, uh, useful for, 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 for doing the, the really great stuff and, and, uh, and yeah, more and more mature. That that's, that's what I want to say. Yeah. And, uh, let's imagine, uh, we talked today in 2021st. And uh, what do you think would be great to, to see happened in uh, React for the, the, last, the last year from now? I mean, uh, in, in, we talk about future, one year or something, I mean, nearest future uh, of React. What would you like, Aman, to, to have, um, um, you know, yeah. Hmm. Um, what would I like in in like a year in React? Um, I think the async async rendering is a big one. Um, I'm pretty happy with Relay and Redux as data stores. Um, those are pretty good. Um, if there were like better, better, perhaps like better tooling to measure performance of different components and diagnostics to figure out how different things can be optimized or what the different bottlenecks are. I think something like that would be really useful for React. Okay, thanks. And Martin? Well, here I'm with the man uh, because uh, profiling React applications is uh, quite the challenge. Yeah, yeah, you can do it in developer tools, yeah. And, what you're seeing there, you're seeing a lot of library code. And even if uh, you're using um, uh, like a dev bundle and whatever, it's just a bunch of functions that you don't know what they do, that you don't know why they take time. So this, uh, the performance thing, the synchronous rendering, these are uh, very good points. And I'm one of the people who hope that we will get something on them. But there's also something else that I, I would need. Um, in my view, Automation is very important for any business, especially for any big business. 
and improving uh, the testing experience of React is also going to be very, very helpful in uh, with, with in terms of adoption. Yeah, we have Jest, we have Enzyme, and it's okay, but it's not where it should be. It's not on, on par with uh, other frameworks like Angular. Yeah, I see. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, the, I, I always like when programmers or engineers start to, you know, think about the business, <laughs> think about the final consumers on uh, or, or final functions of, or, of what we guys do here. So um, mm, let's talk about the community. So community is, you know, uh, is the driver of, of all changes. What do you think about the community and about uh, how how the community changed in, in the last period? I'm not sure what you think about the uh, the changes are have been made or happened or uh, what do you think about the change? What are uh, upcoming? in the community. Aman, could you? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, I think this is like a really interesting question for both uh, Aman, for, for myself and Martin to answer because we're probably gonna have different answers. I've written most of my React code inside Facebook. And a lot of this, like a lot of the community that we have access to is like the Facebook engineers inside. And even like the UI components and libraries on top of React that we use are inbuilt custom made for Facebook. So for us, most of the times when you wanna use something new library or uh, have questions about certain like add-on that we've added on top of React code, we can't use Stack Overflow. We have to like go to the internal Stack Overflow inside Facebook and access that. So, which is obviously pretty good because like React, uh, Facebook is like one of the top contributors to React, but I think uh, Martin's probably going to have a different answer because, um, well, I'm guessing that he uses a lot of the external, like open source React libraries and UIs and all that stuff. So um, he's probably able to access the actual external community more than I do. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. So I would have a different answer, yeah, but uh, not so much. So uh, React as a, as a library is... Um, our framework or whatever we would like to call it, it's a quite interesting project and Stack Overflow cannot help you with it. Even its documentation cannot help you with it. <laughs> so uh, at times I found myself reading the source code to understand how to optimize something, which is, um, I think th this one area where the library is lacking. And there are many people who are like theorizing in the community, they're theorizing how this is working behind the scenes. But, the reality is that until you open the source code, you debug it or you read it, you will never know how it works. So what what I what I observe is that um, people very rarely do that. They very rarely open the source code and try to understand how it works behind the scenes. So most of the advice that you find in on the internet <laughs> is kind of useless. Uh, it's uh, they tested it; it worked uh, with the to-do list, and that's fine, <laughs> I guess. But when you're trying to to make a living with, by using this framework, you should be very careful. Also, um, in that regard, uh, something that I that I'm, I'm doing is I have a very very strict um, way of introducing libraries. So with React, um, we're using Mobix, and that's it. We, we are not adding any other library in that case. And we are, why we are using Mobix? Because Mobix does not scream React, React, React. Mobix has an adapter for React, right? So essentially, all my state management, it's external to React. I'm injecting it into React. So it's kind of a different approach. For me, as a client, I need to have like a certain level of independence from the library. So I'll be able to change it eventually. And I don't, not that I want to change it, but you know, uh, anything can happen in five years. Yeah, cool. Um, uh, yeah, um, if we talk about the, um, you know, actually, that's why we we, we do this giggle because um, 
when we've been starting this project, uh, I, I had a, a huge doubt. Does anybody need, you know, um, more content on the internet? Because, you know, people say everything is on YouTube, right? And uh, yeah, and I was absolutely uh, surprised that uh, lots of everything on YouTube, but uh, like lack of useful stuff. Uh, let's talk about generations. Let's talk about those 95% of our uh, of our community in Geekal who are on junior track. Uh, not only because it's free, but we, we do it for free uh, for guys because most of them uh, or some of them are you know facing problems with uh, you know making their bread on a table. Uh, not, not, uh, I don't think it's really a great idea to to charge a lot of money to for 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 this you know um, uh, for this knowledge. But uh, most of them are juniors. So what is the best path? for juniors you think today to obtain the you know most useful and you know uh, the the best way uh, useful knowledge and the best way to to grow what do you think aman i think this is uh this is like a good question not specific to react but specific to like anything that you want to do in programming and obviously I'm no expert, but I'm gonna talk about like what's worked for me in the past. Sure. Um, and I think what's worked for me is the best way to learn is by doing, making mistakes and always being curious. As Martin said, if you're curious, something's not working, like look inside the source code, look inside the library, try to understand the code. If you don't understand it, then post the question, something very specific somewhere or just like read as much as possible and like do stuff. I think that's usually the best way to learn. And um, obviously you can like find mentors, you can like find communities. I think those things are extremely important, but I think that happens automatically if you have that curious spirit inside you to like always like learn, know more, have good questions. Uh, I think automatically you get attracted to the right people and build that community of like friends and mentors to help you learn more. Yeah, and Martin, maybe you have some ideas about, you know, the, the, the best path for juniors. Well, there is no best path because all people are different. So for everybody, something slightly different is going to work. But a, a good way to start is find an internship or um, just start working in a place that that will help you grow. Like, we know that you don't know, right? Okay, apply for the job. Try your best. Show us your best side. In the past, uh, we we had some um, uh, in the previous company, at least uh, in SBTech, we we did something. Uh, if we if we got a nice, very nice guy, very nice attitude, perspective, uh, a lot of knowledge, even not very like deep, but a lot of it, we we even open junior positions, even if we didn't have one, just to to give a chance to future engineer. So companies want to develop you. So apply for the jobs. Don't wait for the right job, right? There is no such thing as the right job. There is no such thing as right now. Right now is now. Yeah, actually, it's yesterday, but the, the next slot is now. Yeah. I think it's a brilliant advice. Yeah, that's, I, I'm trying to all my life to do the, the best I uh, of I can right now for for people who I have with me right now, yeah. Uh, uh, Martin and Daman too, but uh, I, I guess uh, 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 Martin would be uh, the, the the best commentary. Um, when you see few juniors, how do you choose? Uh, who you would, you know, pay more attention, give him more of your time, uh, or who should this junior be, and or or what 
skills or what soft skills you are looking for i mean you as a senior you as a you know experienced developer and engineer in in, in juniors so it's very hard to notice a junior let's start by that so this uh, it's the way things work right so i'm an architect so i work mostly with senior developers Mm -hmm. So if a junior wants to be noticed, uh, they should ask questions and they should come ask me questions. Like if you think about it, uh, think about uh, an open space, right? You're walking by and you have a job to do, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go to the team lead or to the senior developer or with whom I have currently something to do. And I'm not just going to randomly pick people and ask him, what's your qualification? Uh, are you a junior? Should mm -hmm. I talk to you? What do you know? Uh, you're not doing that. Like, if you want to know something, about, uh, think about it. Uh, there is a lot of documentation in companies, so you can always read something. Go ask the architect stuff, ask the seniors guy stuff. Uh, try to try to get noticed, right? And also, a good way to be noticed is to do good pull requests, to to write good code. So this is also a way to be noticed. And uh, how do you distinguish between juniors? Well, they, they need to talk to you and you need to talk to them, obviously. But as I said, it's uh, in, um, in the environment, there are much more juniors than seniors. So it, it's uh, it, we're we not equal in terms of numbers. So it's very hard for one uh, senior figure to go and to check every single junior if it's not in their team if they're not like, um, I'm not directly managing them, right? So if I have to notice them, they will have to do some work. They will have to, they will have to send pull requests. Like, think about it. Uh, you can assign me a pull request. You can ask me to review your code. That's a very, very nice way to start. I will yeah. know who you are. I will see what you're doing. I will comment. I will help you grow. So this, this is one way to get noticed without much uh, soft skills involved, actually. If you think about it, a pull request is uh, some uh, commit in Git, and probably some Jira ticket. And I will open, I will review. If I have questions, I will actually contact you <laughs> to see what's going on. So this is quite a, quite a nice way to start the conversation. So if you want to, you know, uh, be notized or, or need more attention, uh, and not not wait for questions makes make the, uh, the ha, ha, make questions come to you yeah and aman what do you think about who, how do you pick juniors or beginners to 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 pay your attention here to them yeah uh, so i'm just thinking about like my experience so i've been working in like big companies at facebook it's really interesting where internally we don't know anybody else's level. So somebody could like really experienced, but on their profile, it'll still say software engineer. And somebody could be like just a new hire, it'll still say software engineer. And that's actually done on, on purpose at Facebook because it has a very, uh, Facebook, the company has this mentality of ultimately we're not judging anything based off of your past achievements. It's purely based off of your code. So they want the code to be front and foremost and everything else to be secondary. So if you are the best engineer in the world, but you write some bad code, uh, people should be okay to like, comment on your code saying this is not the right code. Uh, also vice versa, where you could be like super junior, but if you're writing good code, then people um, should be able to like appreciate that code without saying that you're too junior. So which is why people, um, they have, you know, the lack of levels so in this in this scenario i think it's like fair game so if you're like if you like work hard you'll get noticed and nobody's going to consider you as like junior or senior that's one answer but to answer your more your question more directly i think the way it's done at facebook is that if you want to grow so every six months uh there's a, a performance review where your managers review your performance and obviously that thing in, in, includes a bunch of things it includes the impact that you had, it includes uh, um, like how complex of code you wrote, but it also includes the people dimension, which is if you're senior, especially 
uh, they look at, did you help people around you grow? So usually in a team, there's like one like super senior person and then maybe two or three senior engineers and then the rest are junior engineers. Uh, especially if you're senior or super senior, it's your job to like make sure that you grow the people around you to get promoted and get to the next level. So that's sort of how it works. And then usually the manager is responsible to make sure that's happening. So the manager will ask this more senior engineer to make sure, uh, pair them up with like somebody on the team who's like more junior and uh, help both them, like uh, help the senior person grow the junior person. Well, thanks for sharing this experience. It, uh, it sounds really reasonable. Yeah. So, um, yeah, let's get back to 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 the technology. Let's try to dream about it. Let's try to to think what is in the future, what is coming up to us. Yeah, could you take a look or try to uh, to see what's going on in five years? or maybe 10 years, what do you think where the, the library moves, where we are going to? Uh, what do you think, Aman? Um, I think five, 10 years, there has to be better and easier ways to build UIs, I would say. I think obviously like function programming and React is like a huge step forward from the predecessors where we were like, you know, sending shooting events and doing like really low level stuff, which is obviously a step up from like jQuery, which is obviously a step up from like broad JavaScript. But I think like even now writing, uh, building UI is really like low level work. It's like, if you take an, an analogy, it's very similar to if you're building a house, you're putting one brick at a time that's sort of the level of granularity at which you're working when you're doing UI work. So I would expect like in five to 10 years, maybe not, I don't know. I don't, it's, it's hard to like predict ex exact like number of years because I think there's a saying that humans like underestimate the amount of work that will be done on the long time horizon, but overestimate the amount of work that will be done on a short time horizon. So it's like hard to predict, but I think in five to 10 years, there has to be like more higher level abstract ways of just like specifying the UI that you want and the behavior of that UI and then things should happen automatically. Perhaps using AI, perhaps using machine learning, combining that with the existing functional programming tools to like build something which makes it a lot easier to write UI. Well, thanks. Yeah, that's absolutely, um, you know, understandable and a pure idea because um, we cannot, you know, uh, <laughs> see clearly what's going on yeah because uh, i i hear um, really often the the idea that come on guys think about before you're going to to get uh, to engineering field because you know all this ai you know the machines will will write code soon you you will lose your job <laughs> so you know yeah uh, yeah but uh, but the part of truth is uh, yeah the the, the uh, coding has changed yeah martin could you share about this uh, question what do you think about the, the future i mean the far future mm -hmm. so the far future is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, in, it's in shadows and in fog so, but uh, i think that uh, artificial intelligence is kind of overestimated right now but something that, uh, it's a shady area, nobody can tell, right? But maybe tomorrow there will be a breakthrough and so we will all be jobless, which will be fine. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm kind of skeptical about that. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> something that uh, that is um, clearly visible is that the web browser is actually opening to, to other languages, which is a very, very important thing. Talking about WebAssembly here. so. This is allowing um, much, much different way of thinking when when you're structuring uh, an application. Uh, can you think just just for a second? Think about compiling um, Swift code to Wasm and running it in the browser. And now suddenly, um, 
my isomorphic application it has completely different meaning, right? My iOS code is running inside of the web browser. So what what happened now? That's that's completely completely different field. Something completely different is happening, and uh, this is opening the door to quite the interesting uh, Frankenstein type of solutions. So when you're running uh, Go, C++, uh, .NET, and something else uh, with JavaScript on top, of course. But uh, this is going to open the doors for more interesting software to come to the browser. I'm not talking about like uh, browser is the client just displaying the stuff and going back and forward to a server through a socket. And I'm talking about actually shipping the, the executable code to the browser and actually doing the job on the client machine which is going to save a lot of network traffic eventually. But, um, you know, different use cases go for different solutions. I'm, I'm really excited about uh, the possibilities behind Wasm. Yeah, I, I absolutely love your attitude, you know, uh, that you are not kind of religious fanatic of React or some, some specific technology, uh, and it's great. Yeah, Aman, maybe you can add something to 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 this question. I think uh, um, I think in the future, like programming, you know, if you see over time, you know, 20, 30 years ago, very youth. Did we lose Ed? I think we lost Ed. But uh -oh. you may continue speaking. <laughs> um, oh, Ed is back. We yeah, lost yeah, yeah, back in Ed. Um, yeah, what I was saying was, if you look at the the evolution of like programming, uh, thirty years ago, yeah, I don't know, like I think the computers were invented about forty years ago. Initially, there was like very very few programmers, um, and if you look at like per, like sort of like map that over time, the number of programmers has like increased a lot. Now there's like a lot more programmers, but there is still a huge shortage of programmers. Um, and if you like sort of like extend that you know curve more over time, I think what's going to happen is in 10, 15 years down the line, um, I think a lot more people will be writing code. So I feel, in fact, I feel like most people will be writing code. Coding will become something like writing. Like everybody writes. Like you write English, you write different languages, and that's just a way that you use to communicate with other people, other humans. Um, so programming is like essentially same as writing, but it's like you're writing to a computer. Uh, but now that your know, software is eating the world, it's becoming like so pervasive. It's going to become more and more important that humans are able to like talk to customers. And then on top of that, with um, the new abstractions that are being added, I think it'll just become a lot simpler for most people to be able to uh, to talk to customer uh, to computers. And I think that's what's going to happen. It's just going to become like writing. Cool, Mark. That's a that's a very nice point that you're making, but it also this this points me to to the way our industry is fragmented. If you think about it, uh, why we have shortage of pro programs? Well, we don't technically have shortage of programmers. We have shortage of uh, Java programmers here, uh, .NET programmers there, uh, not just programmers here, Python programmers over there, and so on. So and. Um, what you said about the natural language, it's something that I really like. Uh, abstraction and natural languages are going hand in hand. The reason why we understand each other is because we agreed what the words mean. <laughs> this is the highest level, that's the highest possible level of abstraction. I say a car and you immediately know what is a car. You don't know what are the properties of the car, but you know it probably has four wheels, a couple of doors, engine, and you put stuff in it. So. Uh, programming going in that direction means uh, consolidation of the languages. It means the language, not JavaScript, not C sharp, not whatever sharp, F sharp, uh, not Java, not Scala. It means the language. So in order for for us to actually move in that direction, it means that uh, we need to have something like a universal language, which is quite a nice idea. I like it. It means that. Uh, your mental models, you'll be able to apply them across different fields. That would be interesting because, you know, in English, we can discuss science, we can discuss medicine, we can discuss technology, or we can just talk about the weather. Uh, so th that's uh, that's quite an interesting viewpoint, Aman. It, I would be happy to live in that future. Yeah. yeah. So consolidation yeah. of languages to the language. Yeah. 
and uh, become, you know, uh, famous like writing for every every human uh, and, uh, ha having skills on this language, right? So that's what we determined. Yeah, Aman, you you wanted to add something. Oh. Yeah, I didn't want to. Yeah, I don't want to add that much. Uh, I like what Martin said. I think uh, he was like definitely building off of what I said. You're right, though. You know, if if what I was saying is supposed to happen, then there would also be a requirement of consolidation of language, which is not really happening. If you like plot the number of languages over time, it's like only increasing. And I don't know the rate of increase, but it's probably like increasing quite fast. So, so I think those two things are in opposition of each other. And some one of those must give for whatever whatever I was saying to be true. Well, everybody's writing JavaScript. Think about it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, so you believe that JavaScript is is the, you know, the hub, right? Uh, obviously, that was a joke, but it, it's kind of interesting. So, everybody's writing their language, like the main language, whatever Scala, and a bit of JavaScript on the side. So, everybody's writing JavaScript. It's a possible future. Why not? Yeah, yeah. Okay, why not? But uh, yeah, what do you think uh, need to be removed to to uh, you know to 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 do this this uh, uh, process like more smoothly or faster? To be removed from where? Uh, I, I mean uh, the uh, consolidation. No, from, I don't from, think from, from, from community. I mean, from from the you know from from mentality. So I'm I'm not sure if I understand the question. Um, Aman, maybe yeah, you I can, let's take it. Yeah, yeah, I can take that question. Um, I think what uh, Ed is trying to ask is like, obviously, it sounds like we think that there's a need for like consolidation of languages. Uh, what can be done, or like, what are some things that must be true for that consolidation to happen faster? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know the answer, but I'm just like brainstorming along with you. I think to answer that question, we'd have to figure out why uh, languages are increasing in the first place. Like, why is there a deconsolidation happening in the first place? Um, I think that's happening because programming is still pretty nascent. Nobody's figured out the right constructs to use or the right sort of frameworks or just like the right sort of like literals in a language which is why humans decide to use different set of constructs and um, literals in different use cases. Like, so when building UI, they use different uh, different constructs when they're writing, uh, when they're writing backend code, they're using different constructs, just because it hasn't matured to a level where they have a complete understanding of how things should work. Um, so I think it's like one of those like natural cycles where you can't really do much to like make it faster. It's just like things will like take their own shape where initially they will diverge, people will try different things, and then they will start seeing patterns of like, oh, these things can be consolidated into like this one thing in this way. Um, and it's sort of already happening, right? You know, like React Native is, a, is an example of something that you write code once and then sort of like you can run it on both iOS and Android. So that's sort of an ex example of a consolidation happening, obviously in a different way, but yeah, I don't think anything can be done to like make it faster, but it's just like a natural cycle that will happen once uh, as like humans try to understand programming and constructs better. Yeah, sorry for being not that clear, but yeah, yeah, that's that's what I mean. So if we take natural language as example, natural language has evolved for how much? A couple of thousand years. Uh, and the thing is that uh, we were looking at the same thing, like every country, every tribe, every city, they had their own variation of the language. But eventually language groups became apparent and people started sharing languages. And now we are uh, from three different countries discussing in the same language. And like everybody knows English, <laughs> you know, it's kind of the thing, uh, English and some other language. And uh, it's, uh, it's being uh, a slow and painful process where in the beginning, um, I remember the times in the 90s in Bulgaria. So there were no books in Bulgarian. So how, how do I learn programming? How do I 
What do I do? The internet is in English. <laughs> Programming is in English. Textbooks are in English. Uh, so that's it. You either learn English or you cannot learn to program. And also you need to start thinking in English. Why? Because all the, the keywords in the language are English and they have meaning and you need to understand it. So yeah, slow, painful process. It will probably take a similar amount of time to happen. Yeah, but the, the future will, will come anyway. <laughs> so yeah, we'll, we'll probably face it. Well, thank you very much. This is our first, you know, first try to, to to set up this process of of, of talking about uh, the future here at Giggle, a future of technology, or and now we talk about uh, React. Thank you very much. Maybe you have something to add to to, to this conversation or something. Maybe you have more ideas. If none, I see uh, people here are going to start the next step. Do, do you? Um, yeah, I can just like add a few words uh, to like, you know, cap things off from my side. Um, I would like to like give like a round of applause to like the Geekle team and like a huge thank you for like having me and organizing this amazing event. I think um, I, I, I met Ed like a week ago um, and we spoke, he told me about his story of like how he quickly pivoted from running like in-person, like small group meetups to this like global conference, like right after the pandemic happened. Um, I think that was like absolutely amazing. It's, uh, it's super cool to like dream that big of like running like a 24 hour, like consecutive continuous conference. And I think it was done in a very, very like cool and sophisticated way. So I had a great time, um, you know, talking and also like meeting a lot of the people in this conference. Um, yeah, so just like, thanks a lot and a huge round of applause to Ed and the rest of the team. Thank you very much. Thanks for, for being with us. Uh, uh, that, that, that's awesome. We, we hope on our future React events, we'll have more people from Facebook. It was really hard to find you. Uh, yeah, to, to talk, you know, from the first, first phase, you know. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. So on my side, I want to join Naman with, uh, what, with, with what he said. So that's feat that you've achieved. 24 hours, I've joined in a couple of sessions, meaning that I I got a similar amount of sleep as you guys, which is cool. It's yeah, like, yeah. Uh, it, it reminds me of uh, hackathons that we used to do when I was uh, a bit younger. So it's 24 hours of technology, very cool. Yeah. Um, I also wanna say that uh, this, uh, I, I really enjoyed this discussion with the man. So I think that there is uh, more need for such discussions, so such open discussions where like brainstorming, random ideas, it's a cool thing to have. Maybe that, that's the best part of the panels. So they, this is the thing that I like the most. So great job, guys. Thank you for having me. Good luck with uh, your next event. Thank you very much. You know, it's not about us. It's about community. The community made us to do this stuff. Uh, we just, you know, was yeah, just uh, opened our, our minds and uh, try was trying to, you know, do our best. Thank you very much. I've, I, I, I'm enjoying you guys. Thank you for doing this for community. Uh, I, I was sleeping uh, this night on on chairs here <laughs> to to wait for this panel, and I, 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 that's why I'm doing it myself. I want to know, I want to feel this feeling. What, what is in future? Because this is what the, the you know drives me the, the, the most. Thank you very much, and I appreciate to invite my colleague here to go to the next speaker. He will speak much more technical stuff here. So we will probably have some small break, right, to, to switch the, the, know, the gadgets or something. The speaker is uh, already waiting for... Yeah, the speaker is waiting, so yeah. let's uh, let him uh, do his job. Thank you very Bye, much. Guys. Thank you for... Bye, Martin. Thank you. Bye, Bye. Bye-bye.